is touching the truth. It was a regular autumn night for Alan, after finishing the latest chapter of One Piece he went out for a jog, purely fictional weebs don't do exercise. There were many things on his mind, like, when is the next chapter coming out, or, I wonder if eating ramen for dinner is considered healthy. Plus. The park was quite empty this time of day, the shopping district was quite far away from his house and the park was right in between the two, he only started jogging because it took 40 minutes to just walk to the store, this way he got exercise and the groceries at the same time. He lived alone, working as a freelancer and spending most of his free time reading novels and watching anime, he also played games, but the former two took priority over most of his other hobbies. He had very few friends and he was an orphan. He always felt that he didn't need much of a family, he was happy as he was now, he worked hard, had his own apartment and spent his free time doing what he loved most. While running he failed to notice the clouds getting stirred, through the music in his headphones and the sound of his own regulated breath he failed to notice the faint darkness covering the sky. Rain isn't unusual, but anyone paying attention to these clouds would run for cover, thunderstorms are not a pleasant thing to catch while away from home with little to no cover. The thing that brought his attention to the sky was the strong crackle, it shook the headphones off his head. Looking up he could see the biggest storm brewing in the clouds, he had nowhere to hide. Looking around he realized that he was closer to the shopping district than to his house, so he started sprinting towards it, hoping to find an open store. As he ran he started to feel the wind speed of the storm, the trees were bending down, bowing to the clouds, what was left of the leaves fell, coating the road in a thick yellowish carpet. It all was going too quickly, there was little time to react as a resounding CRACKK one of the bigger trees couldn't resist any longer. And, as luck would have it, it fell right upon Alan, he tried to jump out of the way, but he was too slow. It knocked him down, the size of the tree was too much for him to handle. So staying there reeling from the impact and screaming while being crushed by the massive tree, he started hearing more and more trees fall, some fell on top of the bigger tree, applying more and more pressure to his lower body, many fell around him, it was already a miracle none fell on top of his head. Many thoughts were going through his mind, he was panicking and quickly losing hope. Then he heard a lightning bolt, he didn't know which tree it hit, but he could smell something burning. Slowly the fire spread on the dried up branches of the trees crushing his body. As the fire reached him the only thing he could do was flail his hands around hoping to escape from it. But fate had other plans, he felt the fire, the trees surrounding him became akin to a bonfire, with him in the middle, it hadn't started raining yet, but it was already too late. Just like that, the fire slowly ate away at him. Screaming and praying didn't help him. Alan woke up screaming in his mind, but there was no voice to accompany his desire to scream out in terror, opening his eyes he could see that stars surrounded him, he couldn't see the end of them. The stars seemed to part ways in a direction, as if encouraging him to follow the road they made for him. This looks sketchy, why am I here? The last thing I remember is pain, I was trapped under those trees, I think I fell unconscious. Looking down revealed that he had no legs or arms, he was a blob of light, formless. Here he couldn't feel any pain, he couldn't feel anything in fact he could only float. Without waiting any longer he went in the direction the stars were pointing him, what else could he do? Stay there for eternity. He wanted to see what was happening. He must have walked for what seemed like years, maybe it was the anticipation. The hope for a new life. Curiosity for what happens in the afterlife. Regardless of what stirred his mind in the beginning, right now he was getting tired, not physically of course, but his mind needed rest. He had time to contemplate many things about himself and his surroundings. He had long since come to terms with his death, some parts of it he tried to forget. Like the fact that there weren't many people that would notice him missing, by the time his body is found it would be burned beyond recognition, his ID wasn't exactly fireproof either, so he assumed his body wouldn't even be recognized. Sometime during his journey in this endless expanse of stars, he started feeling things around him, perceiving things without gazing at them, as a One Piece fan he recognized the similarities between this and observation hockey. It was obviously not hockey by any stretch of the imagination. But as an otaku, there was no way he would call it anything else. He could reach far away, countless stars were in his perception, each represented a system. A majestic picture of infinite splendor, all for his figurative eyes to enjoy. He could feel the stars surrounding him dwindling in number. 
now he could feel a presence in front of him, he had come to the end of his journey. The presence was grand, compared to the stars that surrounded him it was too big to be completely covered with by his perception. After a while of standing still it spoke, communicating through thought. And why are you here, small one? No mortal soul can survive in this place. It had been a while since he had a conversation, after composing himself Alan responded in thought. I do not know, I just exist, maybe to enjoy the sights. After all, if a being so grand couldn't comprehend his mortality then how could he? And who may you be, God perhaps? He continued quizzically. In a sense, I am God, creation originated from me. However, I only observe, the only time I interfered was to begin the process of gathering energy to form what you humans called, the Big Bang, dot. It took Alan a while to respond to that, but he wasn't really one for religion anyway so he got over it quickly. So, what's going to happen to me? What happens after a human dies? Usually when one of your kind dies their memories are wiped and their soul is sent to reincarnate. For some reason, yours just wandered off here. Your soul, however, would retain its memories regardless of what happens next. Can't you send me in a world of my choosing? I've gazed upon many familiar ones on my way here. That's right, on the way here Alan saw many worlds similar to his own, but also many that he had thought were fictional. He guessed that the possibilities of the worlds being the same as in the anime slash manga were infinitesimal, however, in an infinite number of stars some were bound to be just as depicted. God pondered for a while. Then he suddenly spoke. This is the first time I've ever interacted with my creation, I will help you this time, after all, you are a curiosity, neither of us can explain your existence. I can send you to a world of your choosing, this is the first time something like this happened. Your soul is much too strong for an infant to carry. I could, however, transmigrate you into an already grown body. I figure a human the age of ten would work. Very well, choose the world and timeline you desire. After that Alan stood for a while, he decided against choosing one piece, that world was as beautiful as it was dangerous, a long-time fan of the show like him would know. Alan made up his mind eventually, choosing the world of my hero Academia, six years before Midoriya got into UA. He chose this world because he wanted a somewhat peaceful life. Adding to that was the fact that he found it to be interesting. He also wanted some excitement in his new life. God instantly found it, after all, you could assume his perception spreads everywhere in this place, it was the reason you were guided here. I see that the world you have chosen is somewhat reliant upon power, I will grant you one, choose wisely. Alan instantly decided upon the Pika Pika no Mi, he found it to be one of the strongest powers in one piece. He also found Kazara's personality to be similar to his own, both always stuck to doing the bare minimum if they could. I can grant you that power, I will integrate it into that world, just for you. Enjoy your time alive. Until we meet again, I will be observing you. And just like that, it all went dark. I woke up in an alleyway in the middle of the night, and instantly my mind was filled with the memories of a ten-year-old quirkless orphan also named Alan, his parents were here on a road trip and they tragically died in a car accident when the kid was five. In the memories of the old Alan, there were only his parents. And no one from his immediate family ever reached out to him, so I could only assume he didn't have any. That worked out for me, getting attached to someone would be quite hard, after all, this body may be young but my soul was certainly not, even before wandering endlessly between stars I was already twenty-seven. As for why I was in an alleyway, old Alan was left here to die after being stabbed by a random villain. The villain was probably just a random psycho, I should at least strive to avenge this body's former host, thankfully I remember his face in detail, as panicked as the child was during those moments I can analyze the memories easily. As for why a child would be wandering the streets this late, in short, he was a victim of bullying, the kids at the orphanage managed to lock him out for the night, by locking the main gate. The wall was too big for a child to climb, the old lady managing it probably didn't notice, it wasn't unusual, making sure every child was in his place is the job of our group supervisor, who is also a bully. The old Alan wasn't strong-willed as he was just a child. While other children can be cruel at least the old lady at the orphanage was kind, but she couldn't do much to stop the bullying, even if she noticed it. But that's enough looking into the past for now, as I started getting up I spread my observation hockey as far as I could around me, which was about 20 meters, I was being limited by my body. 
However, even this much was a lot, considering the fact that I was still 10 years old. I didn't need to worry about running out of willpower while using it, my soul could spread its perception extremely far away, taking in countless amounts of information at a time. Now 20 meters was my limit. The next thing I tried doing was turning into light, the concept of using powers didn't come naturally to me, after all, I come from a world where such things can only appear in fiction. But surprisingly all I needed to do was to will my body to turn into light. As I stared at it my clenched fist turns into a yellow glow. As I moved my hand, my eyes could barely keep up with it. For some reason, the light wasn't blinding me it was calming really. After experimenting for a while, turning different body parts into light and moving at high speeds, I banged my head on a few walls obviously, I managed to get accustomed to my speed. Just like Kizaru, the Pika Pika no Mi was too strong for my brain to follow which wasn't used to moving at such speeds. The speed and surplus of information were hard to keep up with, it was here that I realized one of the problems with this power. God had said he would integrate the power in this world, which meant that he turned the devil fruit into a quirk, which could be copied and or stolen by other quirks. So I needed to be cautious against those types of quirks. On another note, the quirk worked exactly as a Logia devil fruit would, while banging my head on walls earlier I didn't get injured at all. Meaning I don't need to worry about any conventional methods of attack, besides quirk suppressing bullets. Leaving the alleyway I started heading towards my temporary home, the orphanage. I doubt I would be able to find my killer anytime soon, I will familiarize myself with my own power before hunting him down. As I reach the orphanage I simply turn into light and go into a straight line above the brick wall, then right towards the ground, my landing kicked up a bit of dust, thankfully I wasn't injured at all, props of having a logia as a quirk. The door to the dorms was always unlocked, going towards my dorm room quietly and slipping into bed wasn't hard, observation hockey helped a bit, using it navigating in the dark was simple. As I reached my bed I slip into dreamland, my mind being just as tired as my little body. Time skip one year, five a year has passed since I came in this world, the first thing I did was going to the doctor and registering my quirk, I didn't really show all of its power, I may have left the fact that I couldn't really be damaged out of my official file, I also didn't mention that I could move at almost light speed. The name of the quirk was, Light, because I was feeling lazy that day, and it's described as an emitter quirk that allows me to release light from different parts of my body. Although it raised some queries, after a few questions my case was simply classified as a rare late awakening, it was just a clean-cut case so they didn't look further into it. One thing I failed to realize when waking up was that I was really tall for a ten-year-old, I was around one. Meters, that was probably one of the reasons for my bullying, it was unusual after all. I was tall and skinny, it was to be expected really, you can assume the old Alan wasn't really into weight training as a child, which left me looking like a small, skinnier version of Slender Man, with appropriately sized hands. I have been training my power and body for a while now. I started training to strengthen my body a few weeks after coming here, after realizing that having a weak body somewhat limited both my hockey and quirk. My stamina isn't endless. I can't use my powers too much without getting exhausted, in the beginning just turning parts of my body into light felt tiring, now I can do so easily. Creating strong explosions is still hard, I can only create small ones, even those can get tiring after a dozen or so beams. I just did a simple exercise routine, mainly because I was never into exercise to begin with, I just did the standard, running, push-ups, squats, and so on. This helped me get a bit bulkier, not much, still an 11-year-old after all. Being an orphan means I didn't have access to any gym equipment, therefore, I couldn't do much weight training besides lifting garbage at the Dagoba Municipal Beach Park, I didn't attempt to clean it up, that isn't my job. As I get more accustomed to my body my hockey slowly expands, I am now able to cover around 100 meters at all times. I use it subconsciously, it has become the norm, since I never run out of willpower due to my strength and soul. After finishing my workout at the beach it was already dark, as I walk to the orphanage I can't help but think of the bullies I met when I first came to this world, I just scared them a bit and now they don't come anywhere near me. I'm still an adult after all, can't go beating kids around. I just sent a small beam near them, I still couldn't cause huge explosions like Kizaru, I'm still working on that. The small beam still kicked up some dust and scared them away. As I was reaching the street corner I heard a scream from a nearby alleyway. Oh well, it was bound to happen at some point. It was still the MHA world, 
villains were common here. And walking around during the night is just asking for trouble. As I walked into the narrow alleyway I could see a salary man on the ground struggling while a four-armed villain was on top of him punching away. The villain clearly intending to continue until the victim stopped moving completely. Now, I couldn't really ignore this, if a murder happened on my route police will start patrolling the area more frequently, that would make my quirk training difficult. I simply raised my finger in the villain's direction and fired a beam of concentrated light into his back. It caused a small explosion, knocking him off his victim instantly. I was about to fire another one, but the man was already out cold apparently. The salaryman was dazed and confused, he couldn't really see my face, so I just turned into a beam of light and escaped in between the buildings, going above would attract more attention to this place. I didn't want to get arrested for using my quirk, but I still called the police at a nearby payphone and gave them the location of the villain. They would just pin this on a vigilante, it still brought less attention than murder. I really didn't feel like sticking around, so I went to my dorm room and slipped into dreamland. The next morning as I watched the news I could see the salary man from last night getting interviewed at the hospital, he tried to describe me as best as he could, but it was too dark so he couldn't give any facial features. The police called my actions dangerous and reckless, they took this as an isolated case and started building a file for vigilantism. As I was sitting on the couch in the free area of the orphanage I closed the TV and prepared to go out and train. Being considered a vigilante didn't bother me, I don't think they can get any information on me from last night's encounter. Going towards the park I started jogging, you would think that after my past lives experience with parks I wouldn't set foot in one ever again, but I didn't have anywhere else to go, I could use the cover of some trees to practice my quirk and I used the metal bars in the playground for pull-ups. After that I went to the beach to practice my light beams into the ocean, it was less destructive this way. I've been trying to replicate Yasukani no Magatama, an attack Kazaru used, crossing my arms in front of me and using both hands to fire a torrent of deadly light particles, I couldn't do it as well as him, obviously. I needed to get more proficient in using the devil fruit. Using my weak version of it already left me gasping for air. Other moves I tried to replicate are Ama no Murakumo, I couldn't solidify my light enough to turn it into a sharp blade, I could at most make it into a pointed stick, an Amaterasu, blinding my enemies with a beam of light, I needed to work on my aim for that one, observation hockey helped a lot. The only ability I can replicate without falling to my knees and gasping for air is Yada no Kagami, sending a beam of light forward, reflecting it off of surfaces and then transforming into the light to get to where I want, the movement looked almost instant. Finishing my quirk training I use Yada no Kagami to climb up a building and start running, from building to building, practicing parkour and observing the alleyways below me. After a while I smelled something burning, looking around I managed to catch smoke rising from an apartment building nearby. Without thinking much I dashed in that direction, reaching the building opposite to the one on fire. Looking down I could see people panicking and calling authorities to deal with the fire, I quickly decided to check the building using my hockey. Having died in a fire before I didn't want others to go through that. I could feel a person trapped in a bathroom inside an apartment. Using Yada no Kagami I dashed into the building navigating the beam of light to reach the bathroom door using my hockey. The inside was filled with smoke, I quickly ripped the sleeves of my tracksuit using one to cover my mouth and nose and preparing one for the person inside. Opening the door I could see a small girl, her eyes are large and round, their irises a warm brown, her hair is shoulder length and about the same color as her eyes, bobbed and curved inwards at the ends. This was, if I remember correctly, Achiko Urarika, a much younger version of her anyway. I couldn't really sit there for long, I could sense her fear even through the thick smoke filling the room. I quickly used the sleeve to cover her face and dashed out of the house through a window. I couldn't use Yada no Kagami so I grasped the side of the building, using Ama no Murakumo I dug into the building, although I couldn't sharpen it I could still use it as a pointed stick, piercing it into the building and letting it kill most of my momentum. When reaching the ground I gently placed Achiko down, I could see her parents in the distance, with bags in hand, they were most likely out buying groceries when this was happening. When they saw the fire they quickly dropped all their bags and dashed towards their daughter. I quickly turned into a beam of light and ran off, although getting to know a part of the main cast seemed nice, sticking around would be troublesome. As I reached a dumpster I quickly threw away my ripped tracksuit and got rid of my makeshift face mask. Heading home I was somewhat tired and extremely on edge, hoping I won't get recognized. 
POV narration, the only thing the people that ran out of the apartments could see was smoke. Most people were panicking, calling ambulances and firefighters, all of them were hoping for a hero to appear. Their prayers were answered when the most appropriate hero for this situation turned up almost instantly, Backdraft was most likely already in the area. He quickly started putting out the spreading fires. He caught with the corner of his eye, a flash of light, a beam heading into the building. It disappeared in a second, no one else seemed to have noticed it. Then he heard a window break, he saw a young man holding an even younger girl jumping through a window, he prepared to attempt to catch them on a stream of water, hoping he could soften their fall. Thankfully there was no need, as the young man materialized what seemed to be a sword of pure light and slowed down his own descent by thrusting it into the building. Backdraft quickly concentrated on the fires, hoping to suppress them. After a while, he managed to do so. But the young man was gone, the girl was in the hands of what he presumed were her parents, crying and coughing. He wanted to thank the young man, what he did couldn't really be considered illegal, just reckless, the most that could happen was a fine and a few days of voluntary work. He hoped the police wouldn't be too hard on the young man when they caught him. It has been two months since that incident, the police couldn't identify me but they managed to link this case to the one of the salaryman, a profile started to slowly appear for them. A young man with a quirk that allowed him to move at great speeds and control light. That didn't make me feel threatened, they are looking for a man, they can't possibly know I'm just a really tall 11-year-old child. After a few weeks, their investigation still went nowhere, meanwhile, I kept training, only using my quirk when no one could see me. Hiding like this is really hard, especially since in these modern times surveillance cameras are quite common, slipping into the back streets unseen is hard, but they provide good training for my observation hockey so I can't complain. After training my quirk for a while I finally managed to get the hang of it, I couldn't hit anything at the speed of light, unlike Kazaru I wasn't an absolute beast when it came to physical power. If I attempted to do so I would hurt myself more than my enemy. Thankfully devil fruits are easy to control with enough practice, and I don't need a short grandpa to tell me how to use my power. Currently, the strongest kick I could deliver was enough to snap a tree in half, but it hurt a lot. When I tested my limits I did so by slowly ramping up the speed of the kick until I almost broke my leg on a tree. My limits would change the stronger I became, so I wasn't too worried about it. I also needed to concentrate so my kick would be solid. In the past few weeks, I also took to another hobby. It lead me to carry some more practical tools on me, like a rope. In front of me was a masked man hanging upside down from a fire escape ladder, he just attempted to mug another civilian, I tied him upside down after knocking him out with a kick to the temple. I didn't really care much for the safety of villains, I detest them, always acting without any regard for their fellow humans. Some may have excuses but many are just scum. Like the one in front of me. The least they can do is provide me with battle experience. Even then I need to completely turn off my hockey while fighting them, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do anything. To hide my face I just use a pair of gold amber tinted sunglasses and a fake stubble. For my costume, I just wore a yellow suit and white shoes. Obviously taking inspiration from Kazaru himself. The police picked up on my activity, they gave me the nickname, Yellow Flash, for obvious reasons. At least they didn't call me Kazaru, it means yellow monkey. I only operate at night, I use my time wisely, I never waste more than two hours on hunting down villains, I still need rest, my body is still growing. Anyway, after checking for cameras with hockey I use Yara no Kagami to reach a payphone and tell the police of the subdued villain's location. My nights usually end here, but as I was going towards the orphanage I noticed a distinct smell of iron, it was most definitely blood. I turned my hockey to the maximum to see a man getting stabbed in the middle of the street. Without waiting I turned into a beam of light, reflecting my way behind the aggressor and used the blunt Ama no Murakumo to deliver a fast strike to his side. Sending the villain crashing through a wall. The villain was most likely severely injured just now, but I didn't have time to be concerned about him. I quickly searched the victim for a phone and called an ambulance and the police. After doing that I took a glance at the obviously deranged villain, he didn't bother to wear anything to cover his face. He looked familiar, so I stepped closer to him. I now recognized him as the one that murdered the old Alan. I decided to make sure he would get apprehended, I wasn't going to kill him, 
that wasn't a good way to deliver justice, plus with my hockey I felt him twitch, apparently he wasn't injured enough, when I was a few steps away from him, with my hands in my pockets, he pounced towards me. I look at him with disdain, did he take me for an idiot? Laughing maniacally he tried to stab me in my chest, I didn't bother reacting to him. He had a look of crazed elation when he saw his knife about to go through my chest, that look quickly changed into confusion when he couldn't feel much resistance as the knife went in my chest, I simply raised my leg and crushed his head down with my heel. I used the appropriate force of all of my strength to knock him out, the man clearly had some sort of strength slash endurance enhancement quirk, he was undoubtedly injured earlier but a normal man would have been put in the hospital. After making sure the villain wouldn't be getting up, I heard sirens and booked it. I definitely didn't want to deal with the police. Unbeknownst to me, a camera caught the whole exchange. As I reached home my hands started hurting more and more, I used a lot of force when hitting that villain with Ama no Murakumo, my grip strength was tested to its limits, I didn't realize at that time due to adrenaline. Thankfully it wasn't anything serious. However I most likely busted some of his organs with it, I'm quite sure that the only reason he could keep moving was because of adrenaline and insanity. I changed out of my suit and put it in a bag I had hidden in an alleyway near the orphanage. I reached the common area I turned on the TV, I didn't feel like sleeping and I wanted to see the news. On the news I could already see the title, Murder Stopped by a Local Vigilante, what I didn't expect however was to see footage of the fight, I had been careless, in my rush to save that man's life I failed to check my surroundings. Dread and regret slowly started filling me, I had been too careless, my face was in plain view, although covered by my glasses and fake beard it would still be obvious to anyone who knew me. The camera was at an angle, it didn't manage to catch the knife going through me, at least some of my abilities still remained unknown. Thankfully I didn't have any friends, the only person that knows my face well enough to make the connection is the old lady, but she didn't really watch the news. Regardless of that, I needed to find a new place to live as soon as I could. I started calming down, I needed rest after such a long day, I didn't want to ruin my schedule. After sleeping the night through I woke up and got dressed for my workout, I picked up my bag and went straight to the beach, I always keep my vigilante costume with me. Soon something I dislike will start, the summer holiday was almost over, soon enough I will have to go to school, it seemed like time wasted to me, but I couldn't ignore it, I still wanted to get an education and integrate into society. I had thought of becoming a hero but I am undecided, I still have time to decide my future. I don't like to rush things, I haven't been enjoying myself a lot lately, always training and beating villains. I should put some time aside to play some games and read manga, the past year I needed to get accustomed to my new power, now I can relax a bit. Although I said that, I will still make my training harder. I need to reach a point that I am satisfied with, I wanted to be in peak physical condition. POV narration, the chief of police Kenji Tsurigami was sitting at his desk looking at the reports about the recent vigilante that sprung up in Mizutafu. He was concerned that his recent spike in popularity might encourage others to do more reckless actions. From the camera footage, he had seen the vigilante, Yellow Flash, lived up to his name, he had thought the villains were just exaggerating when recounting their experience with him. Although he couldn't understand why the villain didn't move out of the way for that attack. He assumed he was wearing a protective vest underneath his suit. There was no other blood at the scene beside the victims and the villains. However now, with the surfacing of this short but somewhat eventful battle, all doubt was thrown out the window, his blinding speed displayed for the world to see. The yellow flash was quickly rising in popularity in the eyes of the general public and notoriety in the eyes of the heroes and police force. He needed to do something about this before it was too late. He decided to call one of his younger detectives Naomesa Tsukachi. He wanted to give him a chance to prove himself, after all, he was quite new to the police force in this area. Naomesa, I have something for you to look into. He immediately stated, not wanting to waste any more time than necessary. Yes, sir. Naomesa stated firmly. I trust you have been watching the news lately, I want you to find the identity of the vigilante titled, Yellow Flash. The chief waited for a moment, then continued. I will have the appropriate documents sent to you, you are to look for any similarities in quirk and appearance in our databases. What should I do after finding it, sir? Naomesa was quite confident in his skill, he knew that, as long as the man was registered, it was just a matter of time before he was found. His quirk was quite unique after all. When you discover his identity you will just give me a report. 
He paused, thinking a bit. After that, he ended the phone call and called someone to give Neo Mesa the required information to start his investigation. I will need to contact some heroes to apprehend him. He said to himself, while he trusted the capabilities of his subordinates he knew that catching this person was going to be tricky, even for most pro heroes. And so he sat there contemplating the best team for detaining such vigilante. Time skipped two years, last month I became 13 years old, and I couldn't help but think that my body's physiology was somehow affected by my devil fruit, I was unnaturally strong for a person without a strength-enhancing quirk. I was already two meters tall, towering over most grown adults, plus. During this time I gained more muscle, it wasn't noticeable due to my recent growth sprouts but I was by no means skinny. My training progressed a lot, it went from barely being able to do 10 push-ups in the beginning, to not even feeling 500. Nowadays I need to add weights to my body to feel any stress from the workout. Weights in the form of heavy trash from the beach. My height made me a lot more recognizable, it made me completely avoid populated areas in my civilian time. The only place I couldn't hide was at school, I stood out like a sore thumb. The one good thing that came out of school was that I got to see both Midoriya and Bakugu, granted we were in different classes, but we still interacted. We all went to Aldera Junior High, so we usually met in the courtyard. With Bakugu it's always something like, so what if you're tall? You're still just an extra. He usually tried to fight me, I just put both my fingers over to his eyes and use a weakened version of Amaterasu, I didn't want to blind him after all. I also never stick around for long, so by the time he recovers I'm usually long gone. With Midoriya it was usually just him muttering a hello, he isn't very sociable. I sometimes help him when he's getting bullied. After so many encounters with me, Bakugo knows that I can be annoying, so he just leaves with his crew when I get involved. The only time he tried to genuinely fight me I was just dodging and using Amaterasu. My vigilante work didn't stop, I was extra careful so there weren't any more mistakes like last time, I had basically turned my part of the city into a crime-free zone, well mostly. Some still acted regardless of my fame and notoriety. An excellent example of that were the daytime robbers in front of me. It was quite a sizable group, a band of 13 thugs, however only about 4 looked even somewhat experienced, the rest must have been recruited off the streets. I was observing them from a nearby rooftop. About 7 of them used guns, the others probably have offensive quirks. 5 people were holding the hostages together, they picked 10 people that seemed to have the most harmless quirks. I heard sirens blaring, quickly police cars surrounded the place, one policeman with his megaphone started initiating negotiation with the robbers. One of the robbers seemed to have a voice amplification quirk. They went back and forth for a while, I was waiting for a good time to assist. Meanwhile, a few heroes started appearing, the only ones I recognized were Death Arms and the somewhat new pro hero Kamui Woods. They seemed to also be waiting for an opportunity, obviously concerned for the hostages. The police brought their escape vehicles, they had asked for four vans, the police had little choice but to give in. Then I heard them saying the magic words. We will come out now, make way dash, as I heard that I got prepared. When all of them came out I realized that they decided to take some hostages with them, it mattered little to me. I jumped up floating above them, crossed my hands and used Yasakani no Magatama, I was not worried about hitting the hostages, with my observation hockey I could only miss if I wanted to. As the light flashed out of my hands, rays started raining down upon the villains, they couldn't even react before being pierced by them. I was aiming to incapacitate them, not kill. And just like that, I used Yada no Kagami to quickly escape the scene, it was crawling with law enforcement and heroes. Thankfully I was too fast for them to catch, they didn't have anyone in their group that could counter me. I quickly reached a backstreet and went in between the buildings, paths I knew too well, lacking in surveillance and activity. I quickly got changed and went on my way. POV Kamui Woods, being a new hero during a hostage situation is stressful, as I stood there and waited for the negotiation to end and the hostages to come out I couldn't help but grimace. We didn't have any other quirk that could subdue them quickly besides mine. My quirk arbor should hopefully be enough, I just need to catch them when they are distracted. Negotiations went as planned, all of the villains were coming out. Even though they were still holding hostages, that was to be expected. When all of them came out I was preparing to use lacquered chain prison, 
but the instant the last one came outside a yellow light flashed above us, most people looked up, the only thing they could see was the light, it was like staring at the sun. Rays of deadly lasers started raining down on the villains, I was instantly worried about the safety of the hostages, after a few seconds the assault ended, all of the villains were falling to the ground, but the hostages were still standing. Looking up, I could only catch a glimpse of a yellow costume. The police quickly acted and took the hostages away from the vicinity of the injured robbers. I heard the police talking about a vigilante in the past, it's the first time I've seen him work. Regardless of the legality of his activity, his ability was very impressive. After all, he already has more experience under his belt than me. Unfortunately, the police force and even most pro-heroes didn't share his view. They considered him a danger to others and himself. The news certainly didn't care how they painted the situation, it seems they only want the most interesting headline, not caring about lawful and societal norms. As such the headlines next morning were, Yellow Flash Strikes Again, and, as heroes and police stood aside the vigilante saved the day. Only a few reporters that were closer to the police force said anything positive about us. The rest just wanted to spring up controversy. This didn't bode well for anybody, it made the police and the heroes at the scene look incompetent, and at the same time, it made them hold animosity towards the vigilante, even if it wasn't his fault at all. I can only hope he doesn't get caught at this point. Lately, I started hating the media more and more. Most were under the thumb of all for one, otherwise, I can't comprehend why they would paint heroes in that image. The incident with the robbery from a week ago was just one of many. Stirring up controversy was a reason, sure, but they intentionally portrayed the heroes and police as incompetent. Almost as if they were trying to make the public lose hope in them. Too bad, most of the public considered me a hero, in their eyes my name was associated with theirs. Now I am running towards a commotion, I heard screams while walking to my usual training spot, so I quickly got into costume. When I reached the scene I could see a hero team trying to fight against a big, bulky villain. I immediately recognized the guy as muscular, the ones fighting him were a man and a woman with water-related quirks. I can only assume they are the water hose duo. I remember them being dead in the anime, can't remember much about circumstances, but I'm pretty sure muscular killed them. Before jumping in I quickly hit every camera nearby with a beam of light. The police already knew how I looked in costume, it was more of a formality really. I could see that the hero duo was already exhausted, they did their best. They held this hulking madman long enough for civilians to evacuate. Without wasting any more time I flashed to muscular side, using my heel to kick him through a building. He probably reached an alleyway behind it, but he was definitely coming back. He was as angered as he was hurt. He came out of the rubble screaming profanities and dashing at me. As he reached me his punch was already speeding towards me, muscles growing three times in size, making his arm look like a massive muscle balloon. As he punched towards my torso I jump up, stepping on his hand and formed a blunt ama no murakumo in my hand which I used to whack him over the head with, there was no reason to hold back. Leaving him dazed and reeling, I used him as a platform and jumped back kicking a ray of light towards him, which was threatening to pierce his stomach. He quickly used both his arms to try and block the attack, it was probably out of reflex, his eyes could barely follow it. The beam went through his arms and exploded in front of his stomach sending him hurtling backwards. As he stood there curled up on his knees, clutching his stomach, I slowly approached him with my hands in my pockets. When I reached him looking down I stepped on his head, bringing it to the ground. I'll fucking kill you dash, he started screaming from under my shoe. You villains sure are scary. I said with a sarcastic smile. Honestly, muscular, I was expecting a lot more from you. I guess you shouldn't expect anything from a raving madman. I could feel his anger, it was boiling. He seemed to be trying to get up. Sighing, I put more strength into my leg, crushing his head into the pavement. I stood there for a while, looking down to make sure he was out of the fight. Then a stream of water came towards me from my side. Looking at it, it seemed to be coming in slow motion, I simply stepped to my left and dodged it. Looking at the hero duo, they seemed strangely determined. Stop, yellow flash. You need to come with us to the station. It's still not too late for the police to forgive your crimes. Koda's father said hoping to convince me to surrender myself. In a sense he wasn't wrong, unlike other vigilantes, I never killed any villain, 
none even died from the injuries I've caused. Muscular was only unconscious, he was hurt, but his injuries weren't life-threatening at all, the holes in his hands were cauterized as the light went through, he was unlikely to die even if left alone. On the sidelines, I could see civilians and reporters taking pictures and filming the situation. I should take my leave now, take care, water hose. I left after saying that. Heroes were people that I could respect, they upheld justice. In his first life, he had seen people compare muscular with all might, and while his strength was decent his actual combat power was more than lacking. Overall, he felt that the only villain that could pose a threat to him was all for one himself. Right now both he and All Might should still be recovering from their bout. The latter appearing less and less in the public eye. I need to get in touch with some people. POV narration The recent incident with the yellow flash and muscular revealed quite a few things to Nao Mesa. He realized that the yellow flash was completely peaceful when it came to heroes. It was somewhat reassuring, many vigilantes tended to fight back when a hero attempted to arrest them, this one just left, going as far as to wish them well. Another thing that he noticed was that their local vigilante seemed taller, in the past he seemed to be of average height, the few villains that could catch a glimpse of him had reported him being taller than in his only video depiction at the time. He didn't take their claims seriously at first, even after testing them with his quirk he thought that they were most likely just dazed when they saw him. Now he knew that they were speaking the truth. He needed to look deeper into this, this case had eluded him for a long time, leaving a stain in his otherwise perfect career. The chief of police didn't hold it against him, he realized there was not much evidence to begin with, there were no adults or teenagers registered that had a similar quirk to the vigilante. The trail that had gone cold now sprung back to life, the new sighting gave him a strange feeling, almost as if the person wanted to be seen. It leads him to believe that the vigilante was hiding something, with his speed he could have gone out of there without being spotted by any civilian, let alone the press. Maybe he destroyed the cameras nearby for a reason? Was he trying to make it seem like he was covering his tracks? That sounded unlikely to the detective, but there was no way for him to know. Time skipped two years, it has been two years since my fight with muscular, my daily life progressed, as usual, I thankfully stopped growing any taller, it was about time anyway I was already as tall as all might in his muscle form. Standing at two. Meters was already a lot, my physical strength thankfully grew along with my body. Constant training brought my body to its peak, at least the peak he could achieve without any advanced equipment. There wasn't much I could do, even lifting a car and using it as a training weight didn't do it anymore. When I started training I wanted to become as strong as Kazaru, failing to realize just how long it would take, what it would require. My quirk definitely affected physical strength, otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten this strong in such a short span of time. I had realized in the past that my progress would be blocked at some point. I had just hoped it would come later in life. Now I was 15, I believed that the plot was about to start. It was just a matter of time, I wasn't going to interfere, I didn't need to save Bakugo as I already knew he would be fine. Today I added something new to my vigilante costume. It was a marine coat with shiny shoulder pads, it had the word, justice, boldly written on the back, I was wearing it as a cape. I wanted to add this for a long time. The reason I couldn't was that I had to save a lot of money and find someone that would create a custom-made outfit for an anonymous buyer. Now I stood around and watched a giant villain wrecking some buildings. Remembering this scene, I realized this was the Hero Mountain Lady's debut. Where she stole Kamui's spotlight. If that was true, then Midoriya was somewhere behind the crowds of people observing the situation. I guess I'll put on a little show, as I could see Mount Lady charging in about to grow in size, I jump on the villain's head and put my fingers towards his eyes. Using Amaterasu at full force, leaving the villain blinded, as he was clutching his eyes I jumped away just as Mount Lady drop kicked him. I could already see some wood extending towards me, it was obviously not an excited fan. I jumped around Kamui's lacquered chain prison. Then I felt Mount Lady's hand extending towards me, I jumped on it. Running up her shoulder, cape flailing around behind me I started getting bored. Jumping on another nearby building I said. Well, that was fun. See you guys another time. They tried to stop me, but I was just playing around with them. I flashed away just as their combined attacks were about to reach me. I think I gave the media a nice show, but the show was only meant for one person. Izuku should have seen the exchange, 
he left him a few clues in it. I decided to not show up at school, leave the pot stirring a bit. POV narration, Midoriya was writing down more information about the heroes in his notebook. He had seen the whole scene transpire. Their encounter with the vigilante made him a bit confused, yellow flash looked familiar to him. The most concerning thing was one of the attacks he used, it looked eerily similar to his friend Alan. Maybe his friend just liked the vigilante, styling one of his attacks after him. Yeah, that must be it. He, at first, subconsciously chose to ignore the apparent height similarity between the two, he didn't want to imagine his friend doing such dangerous stunts. Going to school he decided to talk to Alan, he needed to ask him some things. The more he thought about the vigilante the more he started to compare the yellow flash to Alan. There were too many similarities. When Izuku reached school he was a bit late to his first class, he waited an hour to go check on Alan, concentrating on what was being taught was hard. On his lunch break, he tried to find Alan. Upon reaching his classroom all he could see was Alan's empty seat, that made his unease even worse. After bringing out his courage Izuku decided to ask one of his classmates if he knew anything about Alan. The answer he got was even more concerning. Oh, Alan. He sometimes misses class. The teachers got used to it since he still has the highest grades in our class. Was the answer he got. Meaning he doesn't always go to school. What was he doing with his free time? In my free time I familiarized myself with a few people in the crime world, they were not really criminals themselves, just people that made a buck from them. I traveled to a few cities for them. One thing that made me excited was getting to meet Jiren, he was one of the best brokers in the underworld. He worked for anyone that paid him, so he was a lot more trustworthy than a random nobody. I actually managed to do some business with him, in the beginning, he helped me get in contact with the person that made my cape. Now I just bought burner phones and other gadgets from his sources. To him, it didn't matter much that I was a vigilante. I was just another customer. He was a connection that would prove useful later. I was low-key pretending to look into all for one's location, I already knew it of course. But I was trying to catch his attention, I was not afraid of him. It was under the pretense of meeting a legend. Child is sure, but that was the whole point of it. All for one should be able to find my identity too. Getting him interested in my quirk was necessary for my plan. Now, realizing that I couldn't use my favorite training spot anymore made me somewhat sad, Izuku was about to start cleaning up the place in a while. My friendship with him didn't really pan out, I was getting tired of his stuttering, while I helped him out with bullying, his self-esteem remained just as low. He started looking up to me as he did with Bakugo, it became hard to talk to him, especially when he started mumbling to himself. Don't get me wrong, I didn't hate him at all, I also knew he was going to get more confident when he gets a quirk. I was looking forward to befriending him eventually. Although knowing him he already considers us friends. Bakugo also didn't talk to me anymore, besides the occasional, extra, comment. I don't know why but I think he started seeing me as a rival. I never outwardly expressed any wish to join UA after graduation, but he probably assumed I would because of my seemingly powerful quirk. My life became a lot more boring, keeping up with schoolwork wasn't even an issue that needed discussion. I managed to talk the principal into getting me an excuse so I don't have to be present at all of my classes. My bargaining chip was winning the school some awards at a few contests. I had started working some part-time jobs, saving up money. Training daily was no longer necessary, there wasn't any more progress, I only did so occasionally to keep in shape. I also did more vigilante work at night, now with a white coat I was a lot easier to spot, but that was the whole point of it. It just screamed for attention. Getting seen by civilians always resulted in them taking photos of me, I allowed them, they served as a reminder to both the villains and the police that I was still around. In their eyes, I was growing bolder, more, careless. Just like that, they danced around my identity. It was only a matter of time before they found out, I have been observing the one they put on the case a detective called Naomesa Tsukachi. I think he appeared in the show, his quirk being akin to a lie detector. Seemed interesting enough. His view on vigilantes was always extremely harsh from what I can remember. The seeds of doubt I planted in Midoriya's mind were starting to show, he was giving me strange looks all the time now. He was most likely afraid to ask what was on his mind. I wasn't going to give him a push either. 
Neo Mesa seems really close to discovering my identity, he realized that I was not an adult at all, the difference in height was what gave it away, the only time someone grows like that was when they have a growth spurt in their younger years. Now all I needed to do was wait, wait and observe. POV narration, Neo Mesa was getting restless, his recent discoveries leaving him somewhat concerned. He was hoping his judgment was wrong, but he knew better, the proof was already in front of him. On his computer screen, one could see the file of a 15-year-old teenager, unnaturally tall, possessing a light manipulation quirk. His name was Alan White, an orphan that came here from America with his parents at a very young age. They were the victims of a car accident. All of the information in front of him started painting a rather tragic picture. The child had awakened his quirk late, at the age of 10 specifically. It was rare, but not unheard of. Everything matched, it started coming together, the image of a troubled child trying to help. It was scary to think that an 11-year-old child was hunting down criminals. He had hoped their society at least somewhat protected orphans. Even with his harsh view on vigilantes, he couldn't bring himself to hate this child. But he had a job to do. As soon as he calmed down he started writing his report. But now, in his eyes, he was no longer writing a report about a vigilante. He wasn't writing about the notorious, yellow flash, he was writing about the troubled young teen known as Alan. Neo Mesa took his report to the police chief as quickly as he could. When he entered the office he started. Sir, I managed to figure out the identity of the vigilante, yellow flash, dot. Kenji looked taken aback, he was not expecting such urgency in the detective's voice. Sure the case had taken a long time but he was not really in any hurry now. You need to take a look at this, with that the detective put a file on his desk, wasting no time he looked over it. He immediately realized why the detective seemed so on edge. As he read more into the report, about the vigilante's backstory he thought back to his first appearance. He was apparently around 11 at the time. He had always incapacitated his, victims. He also remembered the first time a hero had seen him, his face only covered with his own ripped up sleeve, just after he saved a girl about his own age from a burning apartment building. Using his sleeves as rags to stop them from inhaling too much smoke. He started getting the gist of the situation more and more. Him being an orphan lead the police chief to reconsider his judgment about the vigilante. He had apparently also graduated from middle school early, in fact, that was done a few days ago. Usually, people that went through what this child did rarely become successful and productive members of society. Some even became villains, this child took a different turn in life, it had somehow brought him there. In backstreets, fighting dangerous individuals with little training. He didn't know much about the child's past, only what was written on paper, but he could assume that he didn't begin training before gaining his quirk. With less than a year of training, he started fighting villains. In a sense, he was relieved that someone with such a powerful quirk wasn't evil. Even at such a young age, he had cleared the streets in his district. Very few villains had the courage to step in it, only the overconfident and the insane. After a while he even started patrolling the districts around him, he caught any type of criminal, from drug dealers to murderers. Due to him, half of Mutasafu almost became a crime-free zone. In a sense, his the word on his cape made sense. Looking at his achievements he deserved to wear it. This was quite difficult for him to wrap his head around it. But, regardless of the age of the vigilante, he needed to stop him from further endangering himself and others that followed his ways. Without waiting, he started calling agencies around the city, even those in nearby cities. Taking down Alan was not going to be an easy task. From the recollection of most heroes that met him, he was extremely fast, both in body and instinct. That was what he was known for, the wider public also knew this, his nickname itself surfaced due to the way he defeated villains, even the people he saved didn't see more than a golden flash. He was quick, precise and dangerous in a fight. Their mission was to capture him, it would be a task that required a lot of people and resources. He also needed to contact the only person he hoped could match the vigilante in speed. All Might. The symbol of peace, this was their only real hope in actually catching Alan. He gave that job to Neo Mesa, knowing the two had some sort of connection. Maybe the detective had more chances of convincing the NR, hero. Although he doubted All Might would turn down this request, it didn't matter where it came from. 
POV Tashinori Yagi, for sitting down at home I looked through some materials I needed to learn to become a good teacher. I had a lot to read, so I decided to start early. My phone rang while I was concentrated on the proper method to approach failure. Apparently, making the student feel bad was alright as long as it was not too excessive. I looked at the caller and immediately responded. Nao Mesa didn't call that often, and it was usually on very important matters. When I responded and asked what was going on I got this answer. We have found the identity of the vigilante, Yellow Flash. We need your help in apprehending him. I was not expecting that, I had known of this person before, even though I had just moved here I was still aware of his influence. I had seen his first appearance in the videos, I could barely follow it with my eyes. Very well, I'll help you. If they reached out to me then they must be desperate. There may have been ways to circumvent his speed if his quirk a simple speed amplification one. But from the looks of it, it had a lot to do with light. We'll send you his file. Tomorrow we will gather a group of heroes that will help with his capture. Nao Mesa paused a bit, thinking. This was unusual, he was usually very straightforward. Toshinori, keep in mind, this is a very special case. With that, he ended the call. I quickly turned on my laptop to look at his email. I no longer felt like studying. The second I opened the file I was sent I realized why Nao Mesa had said those words to him, he finally understood why his friend seemed somewhat distracted on the phone. The report he sent me, sent a shiver down my spine. The vigilante that had taken down the most dangerous villains in Mutasafu was a child. I knew that I couldn't have done anything about it, I knew the guilt I was feeling was illogical. But I had taken on a title, I was the symbol of peace. Clutching what remained of my stomach, the same word repeated in my mind, pathetic, a child had been doing my job, someone I had sworn to protect was putting his life at risk because of my ineptitude. His blue eyes shone, with great determination. He failed to save this person when it was necessary, the least he could do was make sure he could capture him unharmed. Tomorrow would be a busy day, but he didn't think he could fall asleep quickly. He stayed up late, looking more into the feats of the child named Alan. The only thing on the mind of Toshinori Yagi was helping that child. He could barely concentrate on training his successor, thankfully all he needed to do was observe. Even when Izuku got stuck under mounds of garbage it still took him a while to realize. Later today he needed to head to the police, meeting with the hero group that was being tasked with catching Alan. He decided to start concentrating on his task at hand, for now, even if he kept thinking about it there was nothing he could change. Just as he was about to finish the training for the day he could see a tall figure, jogging along the beach path. Blinking a bit he realized it was Alan, but if he acted now he might not be able to catch the jogging vigilante at all. It took him a bit to calm down, but he decided to sit still, but something happened which made that a lot harder. He stops and sees Midoriya training. Looking on he says. Hey Izuku, I see you decided to train. Why are you just dragging stuff though? Midoriya looked startled as he stumbled and fell, a truck tire pinned him to the ground for the second time today. Not for long this time, as Alan kicked it off quickly. I decided to start training last week. I'm preparing for the UA exam. Midoriya answered after calming himself. Oh, I thought you gave up on that, said Alan looking, surprised. They proceeded to make small talk about a few things, as Toshinori observed their exchange he started to realize that his successor was friends with the vigilante he needed to catch in the next few days. He started sweating a bit, he didn't think he would still be anxious about things this late in his life. Then Alan looked at him and said. Oh, you must be Izuku's personal trainer right? Thanks for helping him out here. Most people that heard he wanted to become a hero kinda gave up on him. Toshinori, as he heard the relaxed and polite young teen speak to him, he almost looked nervous. He barely muttered a thank you, guilt was already on his mind yesterday, now when he also saw just how well behaved the vigilante was in his free time he started feeling it again, for different reasons. He was going to capture the polite young man in front of him, even though he saved a lot of people, at this point, he had caught enough criminals to be counted in a top 10 pro hero list. He had seen that in an article, it put all of his solved cases since his appearance and compared it to some pro heroes that also appeared near that time. He didn't care for the validity of the information, just the fact that it was speculated was enough to give Toshinori some stuff to think about. He couldn't bear looking him in the eyes at this point, thankfully his next phrase saved him from further discomfort. 
Anyway, I have to go. Alan paused a bit. Midoriya I hope to see you at the UA exam. He said excitedly. Scratch that his sentence made it a lot worse. POV Alan as I was getting my rocks off picking on All Might, I could tell I was just making his discomfort worse word by word. I obviously took this path on purpose, I wanted to play around a bit, and maybe test All Might's reaction. I couldn't help but wonder why he was so shocked. I already speculated that he would take part of the team sent to catch me, it only made sense. He was probably the only person that could keep up with me. At least on paper. And by All Might's constipated reaction he probably already got the invitation. Meaning they already were forming the team to capture me. There was also something else I found amusing, talking to Midoriya in front of him was obviously deliberate, this was the first time we had talked in weeks. But All Might probably already considers us friends. Right on the money, knowing his character he probably feels really guilty. Regardless I need to put my game face on for tomorrow, I had a very long day ahead of me. They most likely were going to show up when I wasn't in costume. Meaning I wouldn't look all that stylish for the cameras, such a shame. There wasn't much I could do, if I were in costume all day they would realize that I knew about the attack. Right now I headed home to rest. Going to sleep as soon as I hit the pillow with my face, it was a skill I developed in my extensive training, I call it the Snorlax Positon. Waking up the next day was refreshing. At least it would have been if I was a morning person. But after staying in bed for an hour I finally decided to get up. They weren't going to attack me in the morning, I wasn't worried about that. Since I already graduated from Aldera, I didn't really have much to do. I want to join UA at the same time as Izuku and the rest of the Class 1A. Being captured was just one of many ways to go about it, they already don't consider me a criminal due to my age. Getting them to release me would just take a bit of talking. All Might clearly heard my desire to join UA, he would definitely bring it up later. It would be a lot more believable if he does it himself after all. The only sad thing was that I needed to wait till evening for the showdown, I still need to fight a bit. Simply giving up would make me lose all of my connections in the underworld. I still needed those, the informants were still very useful to me. And hey, at least I get to fight All Might. Now I just ate cereal and waited. Author's note, hey guys. I will post a bonus chapter later today. My test went well so I'm in a good mood. I think I'll manage to reach 15k words today. I hope you don't mind the pace of the story. This whole day was filled with anticipation, I could barely hold my cool while waiting patiently. But I knew they weren't going to come to my home. Which is an orphanage filled with children, at least not without evacuating everybody nearby. They probably prepared a team specifically for evacuation. I decided to give them an opportunity, they didn't know I was aware of their attack, but if they knew that I was actively helping their operation then they might not really consider me all that innocent anymore. They would most likely realize I had some ulterior motive. Regardless, I couldn't wait to see what they were going to throw at me. Curiosity was really eating away at me. The streets were much quieter lately, even the back streets were lacking in activity, both villains and civilians avoided them like the plague, it was the place I acted the most in. Most people too running to a nearby park only took a few minutes. Really I always gravitate towards parks for some reason. Not that I mind, a park is a nice place, it also made it easy for the heroes and police to evacuate the people in the area. In the evening the park was not really that populated. At least not the one I chose as the stage for our little showdown. The park was almost empty already, the further I walked the fewer people I saw. I could feel the police, slowly evacuating them, they were trying to do so quietly. They surrounded the park with squad cars. It was an attempt to cut off my escape routes. I could feel a group of people enter the park, there was about four of them. Heroes, All Might was not among them, he was most likely waiting to make an appearance. The heroes I could feel were somewhat recognizable. The ever-tired dry-eyed hero eraser head, also future homeroom teacher of class 1A, the promiscuous hero with a questionable side job as a teacher midnight, the fashionable best genist, not much to say about the guy, and the pro-hero that resembled a cowboy with aimed hack snipe. All four played some role in the story, they were respectable people, some with questionable tastes in fashion, looking at midnight mainly, but these were just the frontliners. I could feel a lot of heroes in the back, among the police force. 
They were helping keep up the barricade, making sure I wasn't going to escape. Some of the choices for frontliners were to be expected, all of them were wearing special gas masks. Aizawa was among the few people I considered a threat. Midnight would also prove troublesome, her quirk somnambulist was interesting, they were probably planning to use her aroma on a larger scale. Snipe was also probably going to provide cover fire. Best genist was among the top five heroes out there, he could restrain me for a bit. I needed to pay attention to their formation. From where I stood I counted quite a few heroes, I was not really bothered by their numbers. If I actually wanted to escape there was nothing here to stop me. They were approaching slowly, I had already stopped and sat down on a nearby bench, waiting for them to make the first move. I think they will first try to speak to me. Looking forward to that. By the time they reached me I was almost falling asleep, not from midnight's quirk, but boredom. They really took their time, I must have sat on that bench for at least ten minutes. Now they surrounded me, I was still relaxing on the bench. Just as Aizawa was about to speak up I said. Such a fine day right, sir. What would you kind heroes want from me? I said cheerfully and full of energy. He looked a bit taken aback by my random comment, after composing himself he said seriously. We already know of your identity as the Yellow Flash, would you come with us to the station? Midnight said, she was being quite hopeful, too bad I needed to put up a fight, this will be my last as a vigilante. Now, why would I do that? My reply was slow and somewhat lazy sounding, losing its cheerful undertone from my previous sentence. It seemed to somewhat annoy them. Villains must be really slacking today if all of you had enough time to come here. I feel honored really. I was still speaking slowly, not really letting my anticipation show. Right now I could feel All Might rushing towards us. I thought he would join later into the fight, but this worked too. He probably got impatient, wanting to convince me peacefully. He stopped right in front of me and looked strangely solemn. Just as he appeared I started hearing several news helicopters. For some reason, I think Aizawa was looking at him like he was looking at an idiot. Objectively he wasn't wrong. It seemed my little show was going to attract quite a big audience. I can only hope it would attract the intended audience. With both the symbol of peace here and the most famous vigilante in the city, every major news channel wanted a scoop of the situation. As I stood up All Might started talking. Please let us help you, Alan. His voice was always loud in this form honestly. Smiling I said, why, but I'm doing just fine kind sir. My tone was just as lazy as before, but this time it had a wary undertone, I was prepared for action. All Might looked somewhat sad. Midnight was the first to act ripping a bit of her costume off and trying to spread her aroma around us, since all of the heroes, including the newly arrived All Might, wore protective gear against her quirk. The best counter I had to her was knocking her out early in the fight. Meanwhile, just as Aizawa was about to activate his quirk, I flashed right in front of him and used Amaterasu, even with his goggles on this still took him out of the fight. Truthfully speaking he was the only threat in this group. As long as he couldn't use his quirk then I couldn't be damaged, at least not accidentally. After making sure he was out, I quickly dashed towards midnight. Just as I was about to hit her my trajectory was intersected by all might and a bullet. Although Snipe couldn't keep up with me he could still predict my movements. All Might was clearly not expecting such a quick response, it took him a second to compose himself and intercept me. He was just as fast as I thought, he could keep up with me as long as I didn't go at full speed. I saw him trying to tackle me, he probably didn't want to actually hurt me. I found that quite disrespectful, did he think I could be subdued so easily? Using my full speed I appeared behind midnight and knocked her out, without her, I could breathe freely. Suddenly my own clothes started fighting against me, I didn't want to fight naked, so I simply resisted it. The clothes only held me in place for a second. Snipe and All Might took this opportunity, the first shot about three bullets in quick succession, while the latter tried to take me down from my blind spot. Just as they were about to hit me I flashed away and kicked Best Genist unconscious. With him gone there was nobody to hold me in place for extended periods. The remaining heroes were getting restless, and the public was probably the same. I had just defeated the number 4 hero while having the number 1 hero right on my back. Looking at the symbol of peace I quickly flashed a light in his eyes, stunning him momentarily, using that gap I got rid of the last hero besides him. 
Although Snipe tried to stop me with a few well-placed shots, he didn't manage to even graze me. He was mainly relying on instinct, needless to say, his reaction speed was very high. Sadly it didn't save him from being knocked down. Looking back at the symbol, this had turned around, from a group fight into a 1v1. The team they had chosen was made to suppress me, they wanted to capture me quickly, it was a decent combination, Eraser does his thing, Genist holds me in place, Midnight puts me to sleep. Snipe was only here for support. If I didn't react quickly the fight would have been over just like that. Taking down the enemies in order of importance was the only way to go in my situation. Thankfully, they underestimated my reaction speed quite a bit. Now I stood in front of a shocked symbol of peace, I had just defeated four pro heroes in less than 15 seconds, it was obvious that I could defend myself by now. Looking into his eyes I could see that he was still thinking of ways to end this without hurting me. You know, if you don't fight seriously you won't really be able to capture me, I spoke slowly, in a clear tone this time. This sentence must have sealed the deal, it brought him back to reality a bit, I may be a young teen, but I still possessed a powerful quirk and had quite a bit of combat experience. If he didn't take me seriously I would just escape. He already witnessed my speed in person, he realized the police blockade wouldn't hold me back for even a second. His expression looked grave, somewhat forced. I can take a few hits, don't worry about that all might, my tone took a cheerful turn. He started looking determined again, very well young man, I will fight you seriously, using his greatest speed he rushed at me, being somewhat elevated from his jump, he prepared to punch me in a downward motion, I managed to jump over his attempt, kicking him in the arm and sending him flying through some trees. With the speed advantage I had, I could easily outrun the hero, but I wanted to see in person, just how strong the symbol of peace was. He recovered quickly, in this fight he definitely had more strength and stamina. He was a straightforward fighter, he rushed me again. This time in a different manner, he was punching repeatedly, trying to stop me in my tracks. I decided to give him a chance, conjuring up a shield of light, I tried to block his barrage of powerful strikes. The shield worked in the same way Ama no Murakumo did, by solidifying light. The shield managed to take about three punches in total, it sent me flying backwards. The wind pressure from his fists managed to break most of the surrounding trees. The unconscious heroes were pushed away. The scene was quite magnificent, as much as I didn't like the sound of snapping trees, I could appreciate the amount of power behind his fists. I was getting excited. While I was not injured I certainly looked like I took some damage. Taking his strikes head on might not be the most healthy solution, but I needed to show some of my strength. I quickly crossed my arms in front of me, using Yasukani no Magatama towards the hero. I wasn't trying to pierce him with the assault, I made all the lights that were about to hit him explode, purposefully avoiding his old injury in any other lethal spot. The concentrated explosions sent him flying backwards, he was almost flying over the entire park. Using Yada no Kagami I reflected it from the few remaining trees to reach him midair. He reacted quickly when I had fully appeared in his path, his punch was already near my head. I let him hit me, his punch not holding much power, due to its lacking momentum, it was still enough to push me down, the momentum that I gained to rotate in the air and drive a heel upwards into his face. I purposefully let him touch me, I didn't want to make this fight look too one-sided. His punch left me dazed and hurtling towards the ground, while All Might got elevated even further, he was eye level with the news helicopters. He recovered quickly. As I hit the ground he was already about to land with a superhero landing nearby. I was already up when he landed. The fall didn't injure me in the slightest, I quickly kicked a beam of light in his direction, he managed to duck, the beam went right over his head and exploded, blowing the hero in my direction. I quickly rushed at him, he also didn't waste any time, using the momentum he gained from the explosion to greet me with a punch. I decided to block it again, an action which sent me flying right over the park. Landing right near a group of policemen and heroes. I quickly flew back into the fray, not wanting to be done in just yet. We exchanged a lot of blows, by now my bones were starting to ache, All Might also had some blood on his lips. As me and All Might continued fighting with great fervor, Eraser had managed to recover his vision briefly. He was positioned behind me, still on the ground. I continued fighting All Might, exchanging blows, blocking and dodging occasionally. I pretended not to notice Aizawa. The fight needed to end sooner or later. 
Otherwise, we ran the risk of All Might reaching his limit. Eraserhead waited for an opportunity to deactivate my quirk, signaling All Might. Apparently, he had gotten the message, stopping his attack letting Aizawa erase my quirk momentarily, using that opening to tackle me. There was a lot of tension in the air, our fight already went on for a bit, both me and All Might were getting somewhat tired, repeated use of my quirk left me winded, that coupled with me blocking some of his attacks left me nearly exhausted. While my physical strength was decent, it was nothing compared to that of the symbol of peace, I could sense that Midnight was awake too. I didn't bother holding my breath anymore, the fight was already over. This way of exiting the vigilante scene was really flashy. With the commotion I stirred up the League of Villains was bound to have noticed. Sure they didn't name themselves that yet, I really only cared about all for one. The quirk, not the person, I needed to make sure it didn't get transferred over to Shigaraki. As long as all for one got interested in my quirk the opportunity to take him down will eventually appear. With him gone, Kyudai Garaki would be next. Shigaraki wasn't that big of a threat compared to the latter two. He only became one after gaining all for one. Now I needed to go through a few interrogations, but that would come later. Now I just relaxed, taking in the midnight's aroma, I left myself drift to sleep. Author note again, the MC's intentions will be explained during interrogation. Hope you enjoyed and yeah I'm adding these here to make the word count better. Some of the things I wrote in these two chapters seem bloated already. I'll reach 15k words with the bonus chapter. I'll write longer chapters from now on, hopefully. By the way, Logias aren't a mutation. Oda, creator of One Piece, said, the Logia type, which allows its user to freely change his original physical form, which is why the wiki also describes them as such, Midoriya was not having a great week. One of his only friends graduated early from school and Bakugo was still mad at him for trying to save him from that sludge villain. The only good thing to happen lately was All Might accepting him as a successor and training him. Which resulted in him being too tired to deal with anything else. Meeting Alan yesterday during his training was a pleasant surprise. It showed Izuku that Alan, even with all of his secrecy, still considered Izuku a friend. Today he was back home early, All Might said he had something to do in the evening. As he was seated on his couch taking a break he decided to turn on his TV and watch some news. Maybe some heroes he liked would make an appearance. As he looked at the news the anchor suddenly stopped talking and looked somewhat startled, she started speaking quickly. We have received last-minute information on the identity of the famous vigilante Yellow Flash Dash, on the screen of his TV appeared a photo of Alan's ID. Seeing Alan's photo didn't surprise him as much as he thought it would. He had already subconsciously realized that his friend was a vigilante. What he felt now wasn't betrayal or fear, he was feeling was worried about his friend's safety. A 15-year-old who recently graduated from a local middle school. Even the anchor was looked quite surprised by the information she was reading out loud. We will be transferring to a live broadcast of a police and hero team trying to catch the aforementioned young vigilante. Suddenly, Izuku perked up, seemingly shocked at what he was hearing. Since his appearance no hero even got close to the vigilante, now they were attempting to capture him. Thinking back, he remembered what All Might told him. He looked extremely serious while doing so. This made Izuku realize that the symbol of peace was going to participate in this. He couldn't help but feel even more worried as the news anchor transferred the view to a helicopter. It seems that the symbol of peace has also taken action. He could hear a reporter comment on the situation. His voice was promptly ignored, most people paying too much attention to what was happening to actually hear him. Now at home everyone could see the vigilante, he was not even wearing his costume, but they could tell. He was the one surrounded by a group of pro heroes. Midoriya could recognize most of them, Midnight, Best Genist, Snipe, the only one he couldn't recognize the one with a scarf, but All Might was there. He could see them talking, the news helicopter not being able to catch the sound of their conversation due to its engine. They were probably trying to dissuade Alan, hoping to end today without any conflict. It seemed to not work so well. The fight started abruptly, Alan was moving too quickly for the viewers at home to keep up with. In a very short span of time, he had taken down all of the heroes besides All Might. Midoriya was surprised, he had seen the Alan fight before, against Kakin mainly. But this was on another level. He already knew how strong pro heroes were, 
he had written hundreds of pages about their strengths, to see four go down so quickly was shocking. The next few minutes of the fight were even more shocking, Alan was fighting toe to toe against All Might, a figure invincible in the eyes of most of the public. Most of the people knew of Alan's reputation, they expected him to be strong. But to match the symbol of peace was something else. Their fight shocked many. One such person was Bakugo, as he stared wide-eyed at the television, his old hag had called him downstairs, saying a friend of his was on the news. Seeing his rival fighting All Might was not what he was expecting. Alan was never exactly friend with him, but there was always a sense of mutual respect somewhere in their interactions even if they butted heads whenever they met. He had considered Alan an equal, and his presence had subconsciously humbled him. He was still arrogant to most, but he was no longer meaning it when calling others extras. His mother knew about Alan because they had met before at a school gathering. Since there was no legal guardian there for Alan he needed to be present personally in case something important was announced. Overall Bakugo considered to this day that he and Alan would compete even in UA. His view of that disappeared, seeing Alan fight against All Might, Bakugo now knew that Alan was holding back while fighting him. Looking at the title of the broadcast he saw, Famous Vigilante Yellow Flash is confronted by the symbol of peace. Alan was a vigilante. Bakugo felt like exploding, smoke coming out of his palms. His mother was looking quite shaken, to her Alan was just a really tall and polite boy. Now he was looking at him, battling pro heroes. It wasn't a nice sight. Especially when he was blown away during the fight. Even Bakugo himself couldn't help but squint at some of the blows Alan was blocking, the fight had completely destroyed most of the surroundings, it was clear to him now. Alan was clearly on another level compared to him. But Bakugo isn't a pushover, no he wouldn't let the gap between him and Alan widen any further. He was going to start training a lot after that day. Midoriya also had a similar idea, he was supposed to become the successor of All Might, he needed to catch up with his friend. Both of them had different reasons, but they now had a similar purpose, a target. Something personal to drive them to become stronger. Besides the desire to become number one. Needless to say, most of the public was shocked by this display of power, they didn't think any less of the symbol of peace, most considered Yellow Flash a hero anyway. The fact that he was so young meant that he had time to become a licensed hero. Seeing Yellow Flash defeated did little to the public when it came to dissuading his rising fame. Even as he was put to sleep and apprehended by the police. Most news sites didn't really dare to call this for what it was. The fall of the vigilante Yellow Flash, and with him gone the streets of Musutafu were going to become restless again. The heroes now needed to fill in the gap they had created. When I woke up I was in a grey room, locked to a table, both my hands and feet were cuffed in heavy restraints. I could only describe them as a completely useless effort, they had no sea stone in this world, therefore they had no actual way of detaining a Logia user. The room was really bland, really who uses grey for their walls. Trying to escape out of my bindings was unnecessary. They were most likely monitoring this cell. As expected, a few minutes after I woke up the door to my poorly decorated cell was opened. In walked the heroes that captured me along with the chief of police and the detective that found my identity. All Might wasn't there, at least not in hero form. He was skinny Might now. Without even letting them speak I started. Hey, guys, big coincidence that we'd meet here huh? Some looked startled, some amused. Naomesa still looked especially concerned, I guess I'll have to lighten the mood a bit. We will be taking you to an interrogation room. The chief of police recovered quickly to my unusual greeting. Yeah, I kind of figured that out. Quick thing, you guys really need to fire your interior decorator. This room isn't really up to standard. My lazy and slow joke seemed to somewhat annoy the chief of police, Aizawa was also not really amused. The only decent reaction I got was from Midnight and Snipe, a small chuckle. They quickly stopped as Eraser stared daggers at them. Tashinori just sweat dropped. The chief coughed a bit and continued. Okay. We will unstrap you from the table. They unstrapped me, and under my big restraints were smaller restraints, geez they really went all out on the security. I got up from the table, my action seemed sudden to them, I could feel some people tense up, midnight preparing to rip a bit of her suit open. Calm down. I won't try to escape, by the way, I hope you guys weren't hurt last night, 
I got really into fighting All Might hope it didn't affect you too much. I was taking on a cordial tone, truthfully I didn't pay much attention to them besides Aizawa and Midnight. Well, I was crushed under a tree during your fight. But it wasn't really your fault. Snipe was being friendly here. It was totally my fault. All Might did most of the collateral damage anyways. Aizawa said grumpily. He probably was a bit salty that I targeted his weakness. Tashinori also looked a bit guilty at Aizawa's jab. I was taken to a small room with a table in the corner, I was seated and facing the door while the detective was right in front of me. In the room a woman was waiting, I could remember her being Naomesa's sister, Makoto. She had a lie detector quirk if I think, I wasn't really planning on lying anyways. Naomesa still looked somewhat tense, even with all of my attempts to lighten the mood. The others left the room, leaving me, Naomesa and his sister alone, they were likely watching the interrogation on a screen. Makoto put her hand on my shoulder before we started the interrogation. Staring into my brown, somewhat shady-looking eyes, Naomesa started asking the usual arbitrary questions about my name, age, the validity of my identity. Which I responded truthfully. Whenever an answer was given Makoto would just nod if it was genuine. I tested her reaction to lies by claiming I was the Prime Minister of Zimbabwe. She just gave me a look and didn't even bother disproving it. After a few jokes and a few answered questions, Naomesa started asking more about my past. What was the reason that made you became a vigilante? His tone was the same as the other questions, but this one obviously held more importance. It's actually quite simple. One night, when I was ten, I was attacked by a villain. He looked surprised by the lazy tone I had taken. There isn't really much to say, the attack made me hate villains in general. The same day I also awakened a quirk, which is nice. My tone was even as if I was completely disconnected from the story I was telling. I had started training my body and my quirk as soon as I had found out about it. It was clear from the look in his eyes, the detective didn't like what he was hearing. Having a child attacked by a villain was bad enough, having said child become a vigilante and fighting more and more villains with minimal training was not a pleasant concept to him or anyone listening. Makoto also looked somewhat shocked by the way I was recounting these events. She still nodded to her brother after regaining her composure. There were quite a few things on the detective's mind, I waited a bit for the next question. To what extent were you injured during the attack? They probably noticed that I didn't have anything about an attack in my medical record. Mainly because when I woke up the wound was already a scar. I was stabbed somewhere around the abdominal region, the villain was probably thinking I would bleed out. He, once again, looked like he was sweating a bit. The fact that I didn't go to the hospital sounded a bit more tragic than necessary. The next question was still related to the injury, how did you recover from said injury? There is nothing to suggest you went to the hospital with it. He was referring to the fact that I reported my quirk soon after it was awakened. Well, when I woke up I was already healed, might be due to my quirk, it has a minor healing factor. I said, in a matter-of-fact tone. My quirk enhanced my physique to the point where some wounds would heal very quickly. But that was after training, technically I didn't lie at all in my sentence. What happened to the villain that attacked you? This question was a bit obvious, he naturally wanted to know what happened to the psycho that attacked a young child. Oh, I caught him a year later, in fact, it was my first appearance on camera. There were quite a few more questions about the situation. This was a bit surprising to hear for the detective, he was probably thinking that I had done something worse to the villain that attacked me. He could tell I wasn't lying, during this whole exchange I was cooperative and talkative. I knew I needed to wait a bit. During your time as a vigilante, you didn't severely harm anybody. Naomesa was probably hoping I would give a reason for that. And express my view on lethal action against villains. I believe that the law is the one that should punish villains, I was just helping them get judged faster. In a sense, this was also true, I never considered myself as the judge, jury, and executioner. I only caught villains, I never cared what happened to them afterwards. The interrogation went on, he kept asking for details about my circumstances, the orphanage, childhood. I answered all of them with honesty, I had no reason to lie anyway. Before the interrogation ended Naomesa added. With your situation, we cannot really give you much time in any detention center. He paused to think for a second. 
For now, we will do some psychological evaluations to check if there are any hidden issues from your experiences. After that, I was taken to a different cell. This one had a bed, a desk and a potted plant. It even had a toilet and a mirror. The chief of police most likely didn't want to hear me complain about the decor again. Now I had to wait, again. They needed to check if I was safe to be put on trial, there would still be a trial after all. Vigilantism was still a crime. But they needed to take my age and my mental state into account. It has been about three weeks since my interrogation, my psychological tests have come out clean. I was just as sane as everyone else. The only thing to come out was that my maturity was a bit more than that of a regular 15-year-old. My trial will be later this week, it will be a public trial, even cameras will be allowed. Now sitting in my cell, I could feel three people approaching it. When the door opened, I was greeted by a rat bear dog. Who knows? He was Nizu. Behind him were Tashinori and Aizawa. I greeted them with a great smile on my face. Oh, good day. I'm happy that you decided to visit me at my humble residence. I could see the veins on Aizawa's forehead. Apparently, my sarcasm was not that well hidden. Nizu, however, found my greeting to be somewhat amusing. He did his usual shtick. Am I a mouse? A dog? A bear? My real identity is Dash, he made a comedic pause, I looked like the anticipation was going to kill me. My eyes were wide and my mind was ready for the truth. The principle of UA. I suddenly looked dead inside. Don't even know what I was expecting. At this rate, he'll remain a dilemma forever. Aizawa also looked dead inside, but I think that's just his default skin. Tashinori looked skinny as usual. Nizu quickly continued. Truth is, we are actually here to talk about your future. That's what I was expecting to hear. Wouldn't that be the subject of tomorrow's trial? I asked with curiosity, I already knew what he was insinuating. In such a high-profile case the verdict is given before the trial even starts. Meaning he already knows what it was and could interfere with it. Tomorrow's trial will not need to happen if you agree to my proposition. I am here to extend an offer to you. I want you to work at UA. You'll also get a provisional hero license. Was he always this excited when speaking? I was expecting a provisional license, but I was thinking that he would extend an offer to join the school in the next year or something. I guess Nizu isn't that easy to predict. Seeing as my reaction wasn't too bad, he continued. On paper it would be something like a house arrest, you would be in an environment filled with pro-heroes. In our system, you would also gain a chance to get a hero license. Sounds good, but how do you plan on convincing the court? I was curious about his strategy here, there were a few approaches he could take. That's not something you should worry about. I don't even need to do anything, no judge would give you a harsh sentence. The public outrage would be too much to handle. He was making a good point, even with a light sentence a lot of people would be displeased, my fame was still useful in the end. His approach was to propose an unusual punishment, one in which I had a chance to become a licensed hero and clean my record. The work I'd do at UA would most likely be classified as a form of community labor. So, do you accept? You don't really have much time to choose, we are on a tight schedule. Even asking that was a formality, not much choice here. It's between that and getting a light sentence from a random judge. Sure, sounds fun. Nizu totally expected my answer. He didn't even bother pretending to be surprised. Okay, just so you know, you will also be enrolled in our general studies department next year. We still want you to get an education. Nizu said this in an excited tone. After that, they left, probably to talk to his connections. This was what I was expecting in the first place, joining as a student was to be expected. They probably enrolled me in general studies because I already had experience as a vigilante. I already knew how to be a hero, I only needed to take an exam and get an actual hero license at the appropriate age. Now I only needed to wait, with this deal done I didn't need to worry about fixing my hair for the trial, looking into the mirror I could see that my usually short black hair was growing longer, I needed to get a haircut as soon as possible. My droopy brown eyes were also looking tired, at least I didn't lose the ever-present goofy-slash-lazy smile on my lips. I needed some rest, my days were only going to get busier. 
After getting some leniency I needed to check on Jiren, I had told him to check the market and tell me if a strange drug appeared in the next few months. I also needed to check on my district. It had been a no-crime zone for a few years, I would hope that even with my absence it wouldn't go to shit. POV narrator but his hope was fruitless, as soon as the news of his capture reached the public criminal activity already spiked. There was no other reason for it, without the yellow flash present the villains got a lot bolder. The yellow flash had used his speed to patrol the entire city several times every night, with him around attempting anything was a stupid endeavor. Now all they needed to worry about was regular heroes, none of them was competent enough to cover as much ground as the vigilante. Even if they tried hard a lot of crimes still happened. They weren't as fast as him, they didn't put as much fear into villains like him. Their fear didn't stem from his heroic actions, it appeared from the ease with which he wiped out entire villainous organizations. His very name was enough to send shivers down a villain's spine. The lazy attitude he had while he was observed taking down villains, they already knew he was on par with All Might. It was no longer a surprise, his age didn't matter much to them either, although it was a bit depressing for some of the more hardened villains to hear that they had been fearing a child. The situation was getting chaotic, to the point where even All Might needed to step in more often. At this point, most of the public hoped the Yellow Flash would return. After our little talk, Nizu didn't waste much time. The very next day I was already being transported to UA. I have already seen this place from the outside. But I still can't help thinking that it's unnecessarily big. I was no longer cuffed, although they did put a small ankle bracelet on my leg to be able to locate me. Not that I couldn't get rid of it. It was some assurance for the authorities. It most likely also had a heartbeat sensor. The one in charge of me was the ever-energetic Aizawa. I swear this man looks more and more tired with each day that passes. I decided to strike up some conversation the only way I knew, by being annoying. So, what's with the bags under your eyes? Been doing groceries lately? He absolutely ignored the loss part, he calmly responded. With your absence, the streets have been getting busier at night. He was an underground hero now that I think about it, he usually acted at night. Damn, the years I was active must have been like a holiday for him. I was hoping villains wouldn't go apes hit without me keeping them in check. I lazily said. I wasn't really bothered by this, I knew I could get back to my patrols after getting my hands on a provisional license. Well, your presence was a lot more important in suppressing them than we first thought. They are going back to normal anyway, crime rates won't be zero but they still won't be like now. He was right, me being gone just gave them a massive boost in confidence, the novelty of it will soon be gone, and with heroes working overtime the situation was slowly getting under control. We kept chatting a bit, mainly me asking questions and him responding. After a while, I could see the wall of UA. Aizawa guided me through the campus and into the school buildings, giving me a quick tour before taking me to the principal's office. Most of what he showed me was just on the way, the rest he just mentioned in passing. As we got to the door I could hear some mumbling inside the room. I could sense Nizu and Tashinori being inside. Nizu on a boosted seat and Tashinori on a couch. There were quite a few things on my mind. I wanted to find out what I was going to be doing around here. Nizu didn't specify anything and I really didn't want to be a janitor. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. I mean, if I had no choice I would do it, but I wasn't gonna be happy about it. Aizawa opened the door and dragged me into the room, probably not wanting to waste any more time on his escort mission. I brought him, I need to go prepare for my next class now. After saying that he just left. Bringing me out of my stupor, Nizu greets me energetically. Hello, young Alan. I'm very glad to welcome you to UA. I hope Aizawa told you about some of the facilities around. He mentioned some stuff, there's just one thing I wasn't clarified of. I said, taking a pause, hoping Nizu would just catch on. He just looked at me expectantly. As if he didn't know what I meant. Sighing I continued, what exactly is my job here? He instantly replied, proving once more that he just wanted to see me struggle. Basically, you will be a combat instructor slash sparring partner for the hero course. He was really lively while talking. First you will start as a sparring partner, you will do some courses on the side about teaching. Like Tashinori on the couch there. He said while pointing to Skinny Might. 
Toshinori was really being awkward around me. I needed to break the ice. Taking on my usual lazy tone. I started speaking. Hey aren't you the guy that's been training Midoriya? He immediately perked up, responding quickly. Oh yes, I thought you had forgotten about that. How's his progress been going? We kept going like that for a while. We talked a bit about his successor, he slowly became more relaxed during the conversation, Nizu just let us talk for a few minutes, he had probably noticed Tashinori's behavior too, he was highly intelligent after all. He was probably expecting me to do something like this. Now that my conversation with Tashinori was over Nizu started again. We should talk about your provisional license. The government wanted me to test you thoroughly, but I don't think that is too necessary. Next week you will get a test, it will only have morality questions, a practical test is unneeded in this particular situation. Nizu had probably hoped to give me this license without any further formalities, but it seems that his hands were being forced in this situation. Well, I doubt the test will be an issue. Will I be allowed to go back on the streets after gaining the license? This was what had been bugging me for a while. I needed to know if I could still have my nightly routine. Well, that would be a bit more complicated. Nizu didn't look all that pleased while speaking about this. Tashinori also didn't look too comfortable at the mention of this. The court decided that even with a provisional license you still need to be supervised by either a police officer or a pro hero at all times, even while wearing that ankle bracelet. He took on a neutral tone this time. I was already expecting something to this level, but needing to have someone around me at all times would slow down my patrolling speed by a large margin. Is there no solution to this, like wearing a live camera or something to that end? I still need to be able to cover the entire city if I want to be efficient. Nizu looked interested in my proposal, I could try to speak about this subject to them in the following week. But don't get your hopes up. You might need to have a supervisor around you for a while anyway. Well, at least I didn't get outright rejected. As long as my name is back on the streets then crime would lower by default. It is a temporary solution, but it will have to do. All right, this talk has been interesting principal sir. I said cheerfully. This talk had been a lot more interesting than I thought it would be. I learned enough to almost completely understand my situation. Things were moving along in the rate that I would hope for. I will have someone lead you to your dorm room. I recommend getting further familiarized with the campus and its infrastructure. After that, we said our goodbyes and I went on my way to my dorm. Guided by no other than Aizawa, I could tell by the sound of his gritting teeth that he wasn't all that pleased with being my guide, he probably just wanted to sleep right now, like always. I eventually reached my room, Aizawa finally being released from his duty, returning to prepare for his next class, which I already know means that he's going to sleep. I quickly followed his ways, testing my new bed. And getting some rest. The next day I had already been called to Jim Gamma, my sparring partner duties were starting much sooner than I expected. When reaching the massive building I could only sigh. I'll have to be fighting trainees. I can only hope there are some fun ones in this class, otherwise, this will be such a boring job. Opening the massive door I could see about 40 students gathered there. Present Mike, Aizawa and Gang Orca were present. Aizawa introduced me to the students. Your sparring partner today will be Alan here, some of you might know him already. He was quite famous as a vigilante, used to go by, yellow flash, dot. I decided to just wave at them. Looking closer at the crowd I could see three familiar faces, just as I had hoped. The big three were present in this group. The student group should be formed from classes 2A and 2B gathered here. They looked a bit confused at my introduction, I could hear some surprised murmurs among them. I guess some didn't know me. How did they miss the news in the last four years? Most should have heard of me at this point. There weren't many questions left for them, most already knew of me, they didn't look down on me because of my age. At first I want to see how you all fare fighting in a big group. Both classes will take turns to battle against Alan here. The group that survives for the least amount of time will do twice as much training today. Aizawa really liked turning things into competitions. Nah, it might just be necessary to create stronger heroes. The first group was 2A, this group had both Nijair Hado and Tamaki Amajiki. Don't remember much about their teammates, and the only thing I know about the quirks of the two either. Oh well, I'm sure I'll remember mid-fight. 
As soon as Aizawa gave me the go, I quickly started releasing light towards them. I used it to blind them momentarily. While they were shielding their eyes I quickly solidified my light into tentacles and managed to wrap around 13 people with them. I had created this move specifically for fighting big groups, the only downside is that I need to touch the light to keep it solid. I had more lethal attacks in this manner but they were not really good in a spar. Using my tentacles I knocked out all the ones that I caught by hitting them with each other. I proceeded to use the downed students as ammunition to throw them at the remaining few. Both Nijire and Tamaki managed to avoid getting caught and hit with their colleagues. With them, the remaining group was about five. What despicable methods Dash, Mirio said on the side. His voice was really loud. Nijire quickly used her quirk to send a huge wave of energy my way. I avoided it with ease, meanwhile, Tamaki tried to block my path by throwing one of the remaining students at me using his tentacles. The random student probably had a strength amplification quirk. He used the momentum Tamaki gave him to attempt a dropkick on me. While in the air I grabbed his leg and turned his momentum against him, swinging him around and throwing him into a wall, in a continuous motion. As I turned around Tamaki was already trying to wrap his tentacles around me. I'm sure I've seen this in a manga before. I said slowly. I moved backwards out of his attack range and kicked a light beam forward, exploding it near him and knocking him out. There were only three students left, they quickly huddled together, realizing that they had no chance to win, they tried to buy as much time as possible. That didn't work out so well, I appeared right in between them and knocked them out almost instantly, Nijire tried to react but she didn't even have time to raise her hand. Overall, I don't think Nijire can fly yet, even if she could, she couldn't have left her classmates' backs undefended. Tamaki was pretty strong. The rest were also good. But since I don't know their names I can't tell much about them. Present Mike seemed to be taking some notes on their performance while Orca was guiding the injured to the infirmary. I'm sure Recovery Girl will be quite mad, at least their injuries are not serious at all. I was obviously going easy on them. Overall, the fight lasted for about a minute. Good time if you ask me. The next group fight ended about the same, Mirio managed to dodge some attacks, letting them pass through him, sure they weren't going anywhere near my top speed, but that doesn't mean he's any less impressive. My quirk has a lot more offensive ability than his. Now that I think about it, isn't my quirk also better than his in ignoring attacks? I mean, mine doesn't leave me naked. But I can't really go through the ground, so he has that over me. I guess. Overall, the first group lasted about 3 seconds more than the last. Meaning Togata now had to do double the training, he didn't look that mad about it though. For now, my job was done. Aizawa said I could go. Although I wanted to get to know the big three, I knew I would get the opportunity when we would do 1v1s. Or smaller group fights. Now I went back to my room, I had a lot of free time. Nizu already sent me some theory about teaching, I needed to get around to reading that. I couldn't wait to gain my license, I would need to contact Jiren. Can't really go there in person, I'll have to call him when I get a burner phone. I'm hoping all for one take some form of action too, but I know he won't. Unless I attack him, he won't personally take action. He also has no nomus at this point. I guess I'll wait for his appearance next year. For now, I started reading the stuff Nizu sent me. POV Nijire 17 today our teacher said we'd be doing a joint training session with our neighboring class. I was happy about that, we didn't know what the exercise would consist of. We certainly weren't expecting to do a group fight against Japan's most famous vigilante. Not everyone knew about his fight with All Might, but I had seen the news about his capture live. I had seen him fight All Might and the other pros. He was about our age, maybe a year younger. But he had enough strength to face off against the NR, pro hero. As Aizawa explained the rules, I could hear some people saying this was going to be easy. They clearly hadn't seen the fight between him and All Might. Maybe they only heard he got captured by him. But as the fight started the same people that were confident were defeated almost instantly. My attacks were too slow to even hit him. Every wave I shot his way was just outright ignored or dodged. His attacks were too fast for us, but after remembering the footage of his fight against All Might, he is clearly holding back. In the end, even Tamaki got taken down in one hit. Now only me and my other two classmates. 
I couldn't fly up and leave them open from one side. The same instant I thought that I could see him with the corner of my eye. I didn't even have time to raise my hand before he knocked us all out. I woke up in the infirmary. None of my classmates was actually injured. I decided that I wanted to learn more about this Allen person. POVMC, a week passed quickly. Today was the day of my exam, meaning by tomorrow I'd be back on the streets, this time legally. There were quite a few things on my mind right now. Today I also need to help with a Jim Gamma again. I had asked for permission to use some of their training equipment, Nizu obviously accepted, but only outside work hours. So recently I restarted my daily training. I couldn't train for the same amount of time as before. I still had some stuff to study from Nizu, I also had to help the teachers around campus. Honestly, Nizu called me a sparring partner slash combat instructor, but I think the correct term for my actual position would be unpaid intern. None of the teachers ever asked me to bring them coffee thankfully, I would have blown it in their faces. The most I do is deliver files. 13 needed help with her rescue class yesterday, it was with the first years. I saw the interior of USJ, it was a lot more impressive looking in person. I didn't pay much attention to much else in there. 13 just wanted me there for a quick demonstration. She told me to rescue someone from the mountain slide zone. We just walked into the perimeter of the zone and the demonstration started. I just used my speed and perception to quickly reach the rescued party. It was a dummy, they only used actual people for tests apparently. I just grabbed it and flashed away back to the entrance of the zone. It took about four seconds in total. The students were somewhat surprised. I think this is class 1B. Can't really recognize any of them. But I still said. If this were an actual person, I wouldn't be able to speed up that much. You should always be mindful of the person you carry. I still remind them to be mindful of the cargo during an escort mission. Basic gaming etiquette. Overall, I was having fun, the heroes were an interesting bunch of characters. Their attitudes were amusing to me. I loved making fun of Aizawa, Hizashi was a cool guy all around, 13 was a nice to talk to and polite and midnight was a bit weird. I didn't get to talk much with the rest of the teachers and staff. But I have time, I will be working here for a few years. Now I am heading to Jim Gamma, I think I'm meeting the second years again. This time present Mike called me for it. When I entered the gym there was only class 2A. The teachers with them were Ectoplasm, Cementos and Mike, obviously. I waved at them and greeted. Hello everybody, hope you didn't wait long for me. I was just fashionably late, I developed the habit of not always being on time in the last week. It helped me relax a bit on the way to work. Well, glad you finally showed up. Hizashi was always loud in his speech, might be due to his quirk. I could see that most students got used to his loud self. Today we will be doing special move training. The students looked excited at the prospect of special moves, they had probably done this before so there wasn't any need for an introduction to the subject. Hizashi came near me to talk. Your work for today will be to supervise and give tips to the students. I nodded. He continued in a loud friendly tone. So, how has your first week here been? I heard you really shined in the rescue demonstration. It's been fun staying here. Say how come Aizawa isn't around here? Hizashi seemed surprised by my question. Well, since he expelled his entire class this year he has some free time compared to the rest of us. But not by much, he now takes care of class 2B along with their homeroom teacher until next year. That made sense. Well, I'll go around and see if I can help the students with any tips. Hizashi just nodded and wished me good luck. I ran around the class for a while, helping where was possible, they were all second-year students, most already knew their quirks well enough. I could see Nijire flying around and hitting one of Ectoplasm's clones with her energy waves. I was curious about her quirk, I could only remember it had great stamina consumption. I flew closer to her platform and asked. Hey, what's your name? I couldn't just act like I already know her. She looked excited, oh, my name is Nijire Hado, you must be Alan. I think she got a bit distracted from the exercise. We talked for a bit, mainly about our quirks, I told her more about mine, she seemed genuinely curious about its abilities and limitations. 
Usually, someone asking so fervently about your strengths and weaknesses doesn't mean well. But I can remember her being a curious person. Well, I've taken enough of your time. I'll leave you to your training. Saying that I left her platform, I could already feel that I had taken a lot of time away from her training. We can talk later at lunch sometime. She screamed in my direction. Couldn't see her face, I was already on the ground. She probably wants to know more about my quirk. I avoided giving her many details in our previous conversation. After that, there wasn't much for me to do. I had an exam to take now. When I reached the classroom Nizu messaged me about I could just sense Aizawa there. Probably irritated about something, like always. Well, fair enough, since I appeared he had less and less free time. He expelled his class so now he's the go-to guy for errands in Nizu's eyes. Probably his way of punishing such major actions. Though I can tell Nizu believes in his employee's judgment. If Aizawa didn't consider someone hero worthy then that might not be. He's only taking some frustration out on the poor sleep-deprived hero because he probably had gotten some flack from the parents. He always ends up having to take care of me, whether it's being a chauffeur or a tour guide. Now he needed to give me the test Nizu had prepared for me. Entering the room, I lazily and jokingly greeted him. Hey sleepbag how are you doing? He didn't even bother responding to my well thought out greeting. He just looked me in the eye and got right to the point. The test is on one of the front row seats, good luck. Saying so he strapped himself in his yellow sleeping bag and started resting his eyes. There were cameras in the room so a supervisor was really just another formality. Minus one hour later, one okay. Nizu is a sadistic person. The first page only had a children's crossword puzzle. I chuckled a bit at that, I thought the whole test would be a joke. The very next page was filled with problems that I had problems with, even with my previous life's college education. They were from all subjects, from math to morality. I think I hate the principal now. Now at the end of the allocated time, I go to hand in my paper. I wasn't even done answering most of the questions. And Aizawa tells me. Oh, by the way, Nizu said to announce you that only the first page is necessary for passing. Even though his face was halfway covered by his scarf I could tell by his tone. He was absolutely smug about it. I could tell from his eyes that he was really proud of his actions. I take back my previous statement, Nizu is alright, Aizawa is sadistic. He purposefully waited till the end, just to watch me struggle. In retrospect, I should have been kinder to him. But it's too late for that I will get my revenge eraser. After the test, I went to Nizu's office. Knocking on the door like a civilized person. He told me to come in. After a quick greeting, I got straight to the point. Nizu, I want to ask about the license. When will I get it? You most likely need to wait until tomorrow. If I just give it to you directly people will question the validity of the test you were given. Fair enough. At least I don't have to wait much longer. But the next piece of news he told me about was quite decent. I managed to talk about your camera idea to the court in charge of your case. They agreed to it, rather reluctantly I might add. He was a bit happy when he spoke. You will receive a small bracelet, it has a 360 camera installed inside it. He started explaining more about the procedure. You will also don't need to worry about contacting the police to take a villain you have incapacitated. Since you will be monitored you can just concentrate on your work. That was at least somewhat reassuring. Now I didn't have to worry about someone slowing me down. But Nizu continued. The bracelet will arrive next month. It's currently being made on I Island. The police wanted a camera that could keep up with you and that could still take some damage, well, I had hoped they had something in stock, but I guess I will have to be assigned a supervisor. I think they might want me back on the streets to scare the villains back into hiding. The heroes have been doing a decent job at suppressing the rising tide. But my presence could do so more efficiently. Well, do you have any idea who will be my partner for the next month? I was a bit curious about this. Well, as of now, the government has decided to put the number 17 hero on the clipboard, the rabbit hero, Mirko will be your supervisor. This will be bad, from what I remember she absolutely hates teaming up with others. Now I can only guess that she is being forced into this because otherwise, I can't see her accepting something like this. Well, that's interesting. 
Thanks for the help principle. I didn't want to talk about the test. It was already bad enough that Aizawa screwed with me. I thanked Nizu for his efforts. And made my way out of his office. I remember her being fast, but I still think she will slow me down a bit. I didn't have much choice now. Becoming a licensed hero was going to take a while. But I couldn't have remained a vigilante. Since my first sighting on camera, I knew my identity was going to be discovered. I didn't want to become a runaway vigilante, that would be a lot more annoying than getting arrested. It would mean that, no matter how much I helped the public, both the police and the heroes would constantly try and catch me. With my strength getting caught would be impossible. But I didn't want to deal with the authorities at every step of the day. I also want to have a future. I still want to go to high school and maybe college later. I can keep being a hero as a side gig. But I eventually want to get an actual job. Being a hero might be considered a profession in this world, but I don't want to spend my time fighting weak villains for the rest of my life. I needed something to do besides reading manga and heroing. My future looks good right now. The authorities will stop bothering me after a year or two. I will finish high school here then I'll be completely free to do whatever. The day would pass quickly if I just waited and slept it out, but I didn't want to waste a perfectly fine day. I had some adjustments made to my hero costume. Adding some utility belts and other tools. I asked the support division for help on that one. Power loader, I'll just call him Majima, anyway he was nice enough to not ask for anything in return. While at it I asked for a weighted vest for training, asking about the possibility of an adjustable set of weighted clothes. We do have the high density weights. Attaching them to clothes might take a while, I'd have to find a sturdy enough material to be able to resist the increasing weight. He started mumbling a bit in the last part, he was most likely just speaking to himself. I waited a bit for him to finish. After a few minutes, he just looked at me and said. Oh, you're still here. At this point, you could see a vein burst on my forehead. Why were inventors always very eccentric? Yeah, you still didn't tell me if it's possible to make the clothes. I said, calming myself a bit. Well, I can make a set of clothes with inner pockets for a special type of weight. You should be able to adjust it by adding weights and taking them off. Majima was still thinking about the possibilities of this idea. For now you can use some of the bracelets the teachers use in tests. They should be good enough for training. Say and so he gave four weights, I think I remember them now. Small metal bracelet with black rectangles surrounding the sides, each weight added about a quarter of the user's body weight. Majima proceeded to show me how to put them on and how they worked. Well, that's that. How much will the weighted clothes cost exactly? I still want to know if I can pull enough money to buy them when they're done. Equipment for the staff is free of charge, but I'd appreciate you coming to me when you get any other interesting idea. Well, at least that's covered. I still needed a source of income. Well, back to Nizu's office. I quickly said goodbye to Majima, I left wearing the weights, I could feel them somewhat, sapping at my stamina slowly, for now, I could ignore it. When I reached Nizu's office for the second time today, I knocked politely on the door. Entering I could see him looking over some files, I greeted him with some cheerfulness. Hello, Principal Sir. I forgot to ask something the last time we talked. Well, ask away. Nizu said looking at me, he was signing files at an impressive speed at the same time. I wanted to know if I would get paid for catching villains. I know the work I do around UA is classified as penal labor or whatever. But my hero activities shouldn't be affected by that right? Well, in regards to your payment, like most heroes, you will get a monthly salary to form the government. The amount usually depends on your activity, Nizu was still signing papers while explaining these things to me. I can't help but think I'm bothering him somehow. Thank you for clarifying that. I wasn't really getting paid as a vigilante so I don't really know how this stuff works. Saying that I left his office, leaving him to his work. Nizu was probably doing something important. The second I left the room I could sense him brushing his fur. I guess maintaining his fur still counts as important work for him. After that, I went to a gym inside the school grounds, I wanted to train a lot today, the weighted bracelets really gave me a boost in confidence, they made me feel like I was progressing, I didn't think I would ever miss the burning sensation in my arms after a day-long workout. 
now I was heading to get something to eat, lunch rush should still be at the canteen, that guy is a god. I don't care what the billboards say, he's my number one hero. I ate quite a bit the first time I went to that canteen, the food was just too good. I almost ate myself into a coma. I had never tasted food that good in both my lives. Since my first experience there, the canteen had become my favorite place. Now I was sitting at a random table, this place was mostly empty. It was already evening, most students were already in their dorms or at home. As I stood I could hear an excited voice. I could sense none other than the big three all entering the canteen at the same time. The voice was obviously Nijair, not many people could be that loud without a voice-related quirk. Togata instantly noticed me, I was quite a bit taller than the other students after all. After they got their food they made their way to my table. Before they sat down Nijair said. Hey Alan, glad to meet you here. She's always a ball of excitement. Mirio was also somewhat mirroring her in that aspect, Tamaki was as shy as I remember him, just waving took a lot out of him. It's great to meet you guys, I talked to Nijair before, but I never had the chance to meet her friends. I said with a cordial smile. How come the three of you are still at school? I lived here so this was normal for me, but I had never seen them at the canteen at this hour before. We decided to train a bit longer today. After you trounced us in the last group exercise, all of our classmates have been working harder. It seems my presence was also a motivating factor for young heroes. Nizu really got the bigger hand in our deal. Not that I mind, I was getting bored in that shitty cell. Realizing they were still standing while talking to me I invited them to sit down. They were most likely waiting for me to do so. So, do you guys need any help with training? I'm not an expert but I've trained myself quite a bit. I wanted to know how quickly they could progress. Seeing them as second years was quite nice, it gave me more time to observe their progress. I wanted to see just how far their quirks could go. I could use some tips. I want to somehow speed up my energy waves. Right now I need to get close to an enemy for them to be effective. Nijair was the only one to ask for help. Since my quirk is part emitter part transformation I could give her a few tips. We can meet in our free time and train a bit. I usually spend a training anyway. Wouldn't mind having a partner for a while. I proposed, she seemed somewhat excited at the prospect, she accepted quickly. Sounds great. I still have some questions about your quirk dash, the conversation continued. We ate and talked for a while, even after finishing our meal we still continued sitting there. Eventually, we noticed that the sun was no longer in the sky, we got up. It's been nice, I seem to have held you three here for a while. I said with a lazy smile on my face. We should do this more often, maybe we can even train as a group. Mirio was really enjoying the conversation. Yeah. Tamaki still didn't talk much, but I know he'll warm up to me eventually. Let's meet up again tomorrow. Nijair just had a lot more energy than us mortals, she didn't know tiredness. Just like that, we parted ways, I think we spent about three hours in the canteen. Thankfully Lunch Rush still had cleaning to do. He hadn't kicked us out yet. Really a great hero. With happy thoughts I headed to my bedroom and used my ultimate skill, the second my head touched my pillow I was out. Not even bothering to take my weights off. The first thing I did after waking up was taking a quick shower, I needed to grab my costume from my jima, I also needed to grab my actual license from Nizu. After that, I would still need to work for a bit at UA. I'll be free to go outside in the evening. Well, I'll have Mirko tagging along. From what I remember she's pretty fast, I might not be able to cover the entire city, but at least half of it will be possible. I don't have much to do in UA right now, it's not like the hero course has training sessions every day. Although most students decide to train after hours, at least going by Mirio's word. After doing everything that was required for me at school I was prepared to go out. Nizu said I'd have to call a police dispatcher and inform him if I wanted to go out. Although they would know from the tracking ankle bracelet they put on me. I called the number Nizu gave me and they told me to wait in front of the gates at UA. They were probably going to send Rumi to pick me up and start the patrol. I waited there for a while, dressed in my costume, I should have expected her to be late, it's not like she loves the idea of having to supervise me. 
it technically meant that she now had a teammate, a concept she always detested. After a while I managed to see her, it's been an hour since the dispatcher told me to wait here. She looked rightfully pissed off, she didn't even bother greeting me or anything. She just started grumbling. I can't believe they made me babysit you dash, her anger was directed at me, even though this wasn't really my fault. Well, nice to meet you. Or not. I wasn't going to be kind to her for no reason. Let's go. Don't get in my way and don't slow me down. Her comment ticked me off. I should be the one saying that. Just by being late here you already slowed me down. I wasn't going to be bossed around by her. I was a trained fighter and I had experience dealing with villains, probably as much as her if not more. At this point, she shouldn't have been a hero for more than two years. She should be 24 now, assuming she went to college, she most likely became a hero at or 22 the latest. Meaning I was technically her senior in this. She was really pissed off about my comment, I just ignored her reaction and started the patrol. It quickly turned into a race however. She simply didn't want me to run in front of her, she kept speeding up until she passed me, which in turn made me speed up more, thinking we could patrol the streets faster. With my perception I could feel quite a bit of villain activity in the district, I decided to put a stop to as many as possible. I completely ignored Mirko's presence, dealing with the villains smoothly. She genuinely took this patrol as a challenge, trying to take down as many villains as possible. I contacted the dispatcher and told them to send all the heroes in the nearby district somewhere else, I could take care of things here just fine, having more manpower in other districts would be better. They didn't want to listen to me at first, but then I reminded them that I had cleared much more than this by myself in the past. I hadn't seen this many villains around since my first patrols as a vigilante. It was a bit concerning for me, the second I take a break, villains start running rampant as if I don't exist anymore. Why are there so many of them? Do they respawn or something? My first patrol as a hero was eventful. I still needed to contact the dispatcher for every caught villain, I can't wait for that stupid camera to come. It's honestly as much of a bother as I remembered it to be. During this whole time, I didn't exchange a word with my temporary partner. She also didn't try to strike up any conversation. We didn't get a good first impression of each other, before meeting her I still thought she would be agreeable, but now I think of her as an annoyance. I don't know her opinion on me, but from the few glances she gave my way it's probably the same. From time to time I could sense her smile, I don't really know her reason for smiling but she certainly didn't want me to see it. Regardless, by the end of our patrol, Mirko was exhausted, keeping up with my speed while fighting that many villains was a heavy task, I don't think many would be capable of that, maybe All Might could if he was still in his prime. Other than him, I remember Hawks having a lot of mobility, I don't think he has as much stamina as Mirko though. I think this was a productive night, there won't be as many villains on the streets next time. The media already picked up on my return, they were bound to make a few articles. Right now, I called my dispatcher and told them I was returning to UA, I didn't bother saying my goodbyes to Mirko. She just looked my way, still very tired. I was already on my way till something ticked. I took a pause, looking back at the rabbit hero. She couldn't even stand up anymore. She fainted there, in her effort to keep up with me she completely disregarded her own well-being. I couldn't just leave her here, I decided to take her to a hospital, recovery lady wouldn't be able to help, I doubt Mirko had any stamina left. Running with her on my back wasn't that hard, I created a few light ropes to hold her in place. I couldn't use my fastest speed, but I still reached the hospital in less than a minute. Entering the hospital I called to the front desk for help and they brought a stretcher. I needed to call my dispatcher again. He probably noticed I had taken a different route to UA, I didn't need him to panic about me trying to run off. I didn't return to UA that night, I was a bit concerned at the state of my temporary partner. I didn't like her, but knowing her current state was my fault made me feel a bit guilty. I talked to the hospital staff and they agreed to let me spend more time there. I spent that night on a hospital chair near her bed. POV Rumi Yusajiyama, I remember thinking this was going to be boring, I had only heard about this person in the past, he's supposed to be some big shot vigilante, but he is just a 15 year old brat. So what if he's a bit taller than other kids his age? I thought the police was joking around when telling me to be cautious. Now I know why they were so serious, he extremely fast, keeping up with him is very hard. 
but I don't want to show any weakness. He angered me really badly when saying I was holding him back. But, no matter how much I tried I always ended up behind him. It didn't make me feel discouraged, it only made me want to work harder. Every time I sped up a bit he would become even faster. As if he was scaling his level to my own. The very notion of me holding him back made me rage, it made me go even faster. The pace at which he defeated villains was impossible for me to replicate, even when trying my best I couldn't even reach half of his number. Most villains didn't even have time to blink, he only showcased his true speed when taking them down. Subconsciously, a smile made its way to my lips. I didn't let him see it, if I saw him even beginning to turn I suppressed it. I couldn't let him see I was enjoying this. I could feel myself get stronger, every time he sped up I felt motivated to break through my limits. By the end, I couldn't even move a muscle. I could feel my heart beating out of my chest. Even with my heightened tolerance, I could feel every muscle in my body burning in pain. Before I could utter any word I fell to the ground. I saw was him going back towards you eh, I think he didn't notice me falling to the ground. I knew this was serious, I was clinging with all of my willpower just to stay conscious. If I fainted I was afraid I wouldn't wake up. But in my state, I couldn't even scream for help, let alone press my emergency signal. I saw him rushing back here, probably noticing something wrong. He acted quickly, strapping my unmoving body to his back and rushing me to a hospital. The second I hit the stretcher I knew I was going to be fine, his face was the last thing on my mind. It was filled with concern, something I didn't think I would see from anyone besides my family. It gave me a warm feeling. With these happy thoughts, I drifted away. When I woke up Mirko was still sleeping, I was getting thirsty and hungry. I decided to go out and grab some water. I hadn't drunk anything since yesterday afternoon, I also brought a bottle back and put it on the nightstand near her head. The doctor said physical exhaustion combined with lack of hydration made the situation a lot worse than it was supposed to be. Right now she was being kept hydrated through an infusion. I think she would sleep through most of this day, at least that was the estimation the doctors gave. I can't stay here much longer, I need to get back to UA. Or I can just call Nizu, tell him of my circumstances and get a day off. I'm leaning more towards the second option, taking a day off sounds really nice. Nizu can't really refuse since that would make him look like a bad person. Blackmail works wonders, I also needed to get some things done. I was being tracked, so there wasn't any need to worry about the police getting anxious. I decided to go get some food, I still ended up calling the dispatcher to inform him of my actions. Don't want to make the whole police force send their people to me because I felt like eating pizza. But the pizza wasn't the only thing I was buying. I also bought a burner phone. I still needed to contact Jiren later. I also made sure to buy it with cash from a shady place. The shadier they are the less likely they are to keep records of this stuff. The shop also happens to be in the alleyways towards my favorite pizza place. Of course, I chose that place for this reason explicitly. Getting information about Trigger is a lot more important than a pizza. I think Trigger will appear on the black market in the next few months, all I needed to do was to follow one of the thugs that deal these drugs to their base. Since I can't remember much about the location of Shai Hasaikai, I can only get creative. I don't want to wait a long time to take them down and rescue Eri. I couldn't wait for the League of Villains to make their first appearance, I was really hoping for it to happen faster, but I guess my presence didn't make all for one hurry his plans at all. Getting that crazy doctor out of hiding would be much easier after taking down his boss. I have a course of action for that. It could only be done after the attack on USJ unfortunately. So, back to waiting. At this point, even training is a formality. I was already stronger than All Might by a large margin. By this world standards, I was at the peak. Right now Overhaul and his crew aren't a threat to me, I was more concerned about how I was going to raid them. Currently, Mirko is out of commission. She will be for about a week. She would normally need months to recover from her current state. But healing quirks made her recovery much faster. I needed to talk to Nizu about this, I just started hunting villains again. I didn't want to take a break already. But I probably will need to, Mirko was one of the few people that could reach a satisfactory speed in my eyes. If they sent a slower hero to replace her I would just take a break. 
but even when she recovers, I'll need to convince her to join me in raiding a highly dangerous villain group. Knowing her, she would most likely accept, but she would still inform the police, which would make them form a squad, something that would slow down my operation by a lot. Well, I'll deal with the problems as they come. Right now, still in my hero costume, I was walking down the streets. I didn't take the back streets when heading back to the hospital. I could feel a lot of gazes sent my way. I already knew I was a bit famous. But this made me feel a bit awkward, maybe this is why famous people wear masks. I managed to ignore the stairs, making my way back to the hospital with a pizza box in hand. Refraining from saying, pizza time at the front desk. I walked back to Mirko's room. This was going to be a boring and relaxing day. Even with my weights on. POV Rumi Yusajiyama, the first thing I saw when waking up was an unfamiliar ceiling. Slowly the memories of came back to me. I had passed out in the hospital. I have never been exhausted to that extent. Right now I can't even feel a muscle. Looking around, I could see a bottle of water on my nightstand to my right. I couldn't move my body, so I could only look at it for now. Even looking is hard, I can only move my neck a bit. I stayed there for a while, at this point I think I can talk. Just as I was about to scream a bit I heard a door open. I couldn't move my head enough to see who was coming in. I however instantly recognize his voice. Oh, you woke up already. You've been out for a day already. It was just as lazy sounding as ever, it calmed me down a bit. I didn't like feeling this vulnerable. Before I responded he entered my field of view. He was carrying a pizza box. The sight of him was somewhat relaxing, but what surprised me the most was the fact that he was still dressed in his hero costume. That could only mean he had spent the night here. That warm feeling from last night came back. How come you're here? I couldn't hide the smile on my face while saying this. Well, I took a day off to look after you. Not really needed since you're in a hospital. He also gave a kind smile while saying that. Honestly, I didn't hear much of the second part, I was stuck on the fact that he took a day off to check up on me. He also didn't mention that he spent the night here. I feel myself turning red at this. Could this mean he didn't want me to worry about him? He just forgot about it. Seeing me like that made him panic. Hey, are you getting a fever? His concern only made it worse. Hold on, I'll give you some water. Saying that he lifted my head gently, opened the water bottle on the nightstand and brought it to my lips. The doctor did say your mouth might get dry at some point. Since you can't move I'll help you out for now. I would usually be angry at someone for doing this kind of thing, but I couldn't help to feel safe right now. My condition made me vulnerable, but his presence gave me a lot of confidence. After drinking some water I said. Thank you. It was short and quiet. But I'm sure he heard it. He smiled brightly and simply said. You're welcome. He proceeded to feed me a slice of pizza too. After a while, he told me to go back to sleep. The doctors would check on my condition later. Once again I fell asleep with a smile. Leaving Mirko's room I couldn't help but think her behavior was a bit weird. Even if she is a bit moved at me helping her, she is the complete opposite of yesterday. I guess she'll return to normal after she recovers. Right now, I was heading back to UA. Since she's awake there's no need for me to stick around for long. I would just visit her occasionally, now I wanted to train with the big three, I had promised I would at some point. I started heading to my dorm first. I needed a shower after two days of activity. Calling Jiren would also be nice, but it's not that urgent right now, the drug shouldn't be circulating yet. After my shower I headed to Gym Gamma, Mirio said that's where most of the students train in their free time, either in groups or alone. Upon entering I couldn't help but notice there were quite a few students present. If I didn't know any better I would think I had just walked into their class. But classes were over for a while now. Seems Mirio wasn't joking when he said that most students practice here. In the room, I could see at least 50 people. Meaning there were students from both the second and third year here. Between them, I could see three people training together. Obviously the big three, what other groups would I really care about enough to notice? I don't know if they are actually officially called that yet, regardless, they are still at the top of the student body. 
heading in their direction I could feel some gazes on me, maybe some students wanting a rematch from last time. The gazes stopped eventually, probably returning to their own training. Reaching the group, Mirio was the first one to notice my presence. Alan, great to see you here. He said with a wide smile. Well, you did say we should train together at some point. I didn't sound as excited, but I was still in a good mood. Suddenly I could hear a voice from above. Oh. Alan, you came. It obviously belonged to Nijire. I could honestly hear the smile on her face. She was currently floating around, probably attempting to increase her speed and mobility. I just waved at her, with a smile of my own. Tamaki was just quietly saying hi. I responded by flashing to his side and patting him on the back. An action that seemed to do a lot more harm than good, he got so startled that he jumped away from me. I'm glad we have a chance to train together. Mirio was the one speaking now, completely ignoring what just happened, Nijire was still floating around. Tamaki was also doing his own thing. It's nice being here. Last time we talked we didn't really decide on an hour to train. Figured I could just show up anytime. My smile couldn't be as wide as his, it simply wasn't biologically possible. During our small talk, Nijire came down to the earth. She's still an airhead but at least her feet were on the ground. Alan, let's spar again. Well, sparring was a good form of training. Mirio also looked excited at the prospect, Tamaki started looking serious. He was only shy in social situations, just like Nijire was an airhead anywhere besides in a fight. Okay, you three will form a team and fight me. I will not use the speed part of my quirk. It's a bit disappointing to hear you say that. Mirio said while scratching the back of his head. Without adding much else to the conditions of the fight we all took some distance. Since I was restricting myself to this extent I could only use my quirk as an offense and defense. Mirio started the countdown. Okay, three, two, one. Start. He immediately took his stance, Nijire immediately flying into the air. Tamaki just waited for me to make the first move. Now, my movement speed wasn't going to be used in this fight, but my attacks were still much faster than theirs. As soon as I heard Mirio give us the go, I sent a ray of light into the ground through my leg. It traveled through the ground until it was underneath them. The second Mirio blinked I made the light exit the ground, solidified into spikes. I had made the point blunt, so as to not actually pierce them. Mirio managed to react in time, letting the attack pass through him, Tamaki managed to jump back, avoiding a few spikes. I rose more under him, their speed was too much for him already. He tried to block one by turning his hand into a shell, but the spike cracked his shell and knocked him out. Nijire was a bit slow to react, she sent quite a few waves towards me. Making me move from my current spot and losing contact with the light I had sent into the ground, dispersing it. Her waves were still dodgeable, I quickly made a bow out of light, creating an arrow on the palm of my hand and taking aim. Mirio quickly came out of the ground, completely naked, and tried to punch me in the face. I quickly ducked and turned the bow into a staff, a close quarters fight might be what he was looking for, he was phasing through most of my attacks, I was blocking and dodging. Nijire was sending waves, blocking my escape paths. I could easily just take the attacks, I was still a Logia, but it would honestly feel like cheating. While swinging my staff Mirio made a mistake, he dodged backwards, I quickly extended the length of my staff and whacked him over the head with it. Seeing him fall to the ground was satisfying, most likely because it was a good fight. Now the only one left was Nijire. Since she was flying she was keeping her distance from me, usually, she would get close for her waves to be less dodgeable, but now she was probably hoping to tire me out. Not a bad plan, the continuous dodging coupled with my weights would eventually become exhausting, these were, as Shigaraki called class 1A, the golden eggs of their generation. I quickly reformed my bow while dodging, aiming would be hard if I just kept dodging her waves, so I formed a sphere of light around me. I could already block punches from all might, Nijire's waves wouldn't be that bad in comparison. The second one of her attacks passed me, I created a small gap into the sphere, shooting my arrow towards her. The second the arrow left my grasp it turned into a ray of light. The bow was mostly a cosmetic honestly. I didn't even know how to use one properly. She was dodging around, but I wasn't trying to hit her directly, 
that barrow, went about one meter above her. The second it reached her it exploded, not an extremely big explosion, just enough force to knock her out of the air. It worked wonders, the explosion sent her flying towards the ground. I quickly flashed at her and caught her, the fight was already over, no reason to let her hit the ground. I placed all three of them on the ground, neither was that badly injured. I gave them about 10 to 15 minutes to wake up. The first one to wake up was Tamaki, he was also the first one to be taken out, he looked a bit ashamed. Don't feel too bad, my attacks were a bit difficult. But you still reacted in time, if you had something stronger to block it you would have made it out. I was never good at comforting people. But he seemed to appreciate the attempt, disregarding how bad it was. Muttering a small thank you. Having a rare smile was on his face. Both Nijair and Miriel woke up at the same time. They both were a bit shaken, getting hit in the head was most likely the cause. Maybe we should still take them to recovery lady. Tamaki made a logical suggestion. Yeah, that sounds about right. I was afraid of what was to come. I left for the infirmary, Tamaki carried Mirio and I carried Nijair. After placing them on the beds I turned around and saw a furious recovery lady. I had hoped to avoid this beating, but here it is. I made my head solid as it received the cane from the old hero. It was my fault. I am sore dash, I was trying to speak as the beating continued. It didn't matter how strong I became, I still fell victim to her rage. Tamaki looked on in horror, as she was defeating me. Mirio and Nijair just found it amusing. I eventually managed to escape, saying my goodbyes to them and leaving, albeit with a few bumps on my head. I quickly reached my room and drifted off to a much needed sleep. I'd have time to worry about things later. It's already been a week since my first patrol, looking back, I spent most of this time training slash sparring with the big three in visiting Rumi. Figured I might as well, the authorities didn't really try to stop me. My outings have turned from asking for permission to go out to just saying that I'm going out. I still wear the tracking bracelet though. The main reason they leave me this much leverage is because of my presence in the media. The second I returned to the streets the police made sure every news station and journalist knew about it. They proceeded to spread this information on every screen possible. That coupled with the growing presence of All Might in Mizutafu made the city almost crime-free, again. Nothing is perfect, the usual detractors will always be there, but most of the city was safe. This kind of influence was already too much, if they didn't give me any liberties after my work then the public might be outraged. Since this was a very public case, most people know about my stay at UA. They also know that I'm working here, sometimes I could sense a few reporters at the gate, probably hoping to catch a photo of me leaving UA. News about me were already quite hot. Imagine the swarm that will come when they learn about All Might working here. Regardless, patrolling the streets here wouldn't be much fun or productive, there weren't many villains left to catch in this place. Therefore, I started to plan on patrolling other cities. Most people wouldn't really be out late at night, it was a world filled with villains most knew better than that, there shouldn't be anything other than thugs on the streets. One place I had in mind was the Kamino district. But I think I should hold off on that one for now. All for one had Kurojiri in that annoying warp, I didn't want him to escape. I also wanted to see how my presence affected the storyline. After talking with the police for a bit they agreed. They would inform Rumi about this change and prepare a method of transportation, train most likely. Now I am once again at my favorite place, the canteen. After eating I plan to go out on patrol, it will be much slower this time. I don't really want a repeat of last time. I haven't seen my sparring partners around this place, only that one time, I guess they're still training. Our timetables don't collide often, we only meet occasionally for training, about three times this past week. After quickly finishing my meal and thanking Lunch Rush for it, I left towards the entrance. I was still a bit early, about half an hour to be exact, but I wasn't against waiting for a while. What I wasn't expecting to see was Rumi, she was already waiting at the gates. I wasn't expecting her to come late again. But my expectations of seeing her early were much lower. It reminds me of her weird acting during the first days of her hospital stay. I wasn't going to ask much about it. I don't know what is going on inside her head. I flashed behind her and tapped her shoulder and greeted her. Hey. Hello Rumi, have you been here long? 
I had stopped calling her Mirko in conversations, it just seemed weird for me to do. Since she didn't call me by my hero name either. She was startled a bit by my sudden appearance. But she recovered almost instantly. Hello Alan, I just arrived here myself, figured I'd be a bit early today. Especially since I was really late last time. At least she was acting more confident than in the hospital. Were you informed about the location change? I hope I don't have to fill her in about this. Yeah, let's start heading towards the train station. We're still early so there's no need to rush. She said that while waving some train tickets in front of me. We slowly made our way to the train station, the train we were supposed to get on was in two hours, we had ample time. We didn't even bother running. It was more like a jog on rooftops. When we reached the station we just sat down for a while. We still needed to wait for an hour and a bit. So, how are you feeling lately? I couldn't just ignore her this time, she seemed to be quite nice this time around. Oh, I'm fine. It wasn't that big of a deal anyway. I was mostly recovered three days after waking up. They kept me there for tests mostly. I already knew most of that, I did visit her the entire week. We made some small talk for a while. But most of the time was spent in silence until she had this idea. Hey, we should start training together. I didn't really know what I was expecting. She had this wide smile on her face. She wasn't really asking, this was more of a proposition than a question. I couldn't help but smile while seeing her like that. Sure, I still have quite a lot of free time on my hands. I wasn't going to train with the big three all the time anyway. Rumi was also stronger, she would prove to be a better workout than them. Seeing me accept her proposal made her quite excited, she was likely excited to fight someone strong. At least I think so, she's quite a complicated person. We didn't talk much after that, she seemed to be in her own world for a while. I also had my own thoughts, like what to do when I was bored. I still had a lot of stuff I could do. But one thing on my mind lately was recreating one piece in this world. It is the only story I have any confidence in writing. I'm still worried about the ending, but I think I can make some stuff up. It won't be the same quality. I wanted to become a mangaka for a while now. Not the greatest profession, but I want to see how a story about piracy would be received in this climate. In this world, most stories were about heroes and villains. Mostly because people without strength fantasized about being heroes. I'll probably start writing it later, the drawing doesn't have to be perfect. The patrol itself wasn't anything new. The only different thing about it was that I didn't know the streets that well. Today was much slower, it was quite relaxing even. There weren't that many villains in this city. There were even less after news about our patrol started circulating. During this time Rumi and I exchanged few words. She is probably looking forward to our training. Her opinion on teams didn't change one bit, she still preferred to do her own thing. But at least she didn't see me as a nuisance anymore. The night ended without any events, quite boring in my opinion. Saying my goodbyes to Rumi and heading home. Going to sleep remains the highlight of my day. Time skipped three months, tomorrow is a big day for me, I heard the canteen was serving a new type of lasagna. Lunch Rush just came back from a short holiday to Italy, where he learned a few new recipes. I have missed him greatly during this time, my days seemed so bleak without his amazing food. In the past few weeks, some interesting things happened. I started training with Rumi, we now spend most of our free time training. At first, we just wanted to train once or twice a week, but then the big three, my only other friends at this point, had some exams and couldn't train with me anymore. Rumi and I mostly trained in a forest. The one closest to the city. Don't really remember if it had any name. I also contacted Jiren for the first time in a while. The drug still didn't make an appearance, Jiren himself is a bit skeptical about whether or not such a drug exists in the first place, but he's getting paid. I think it will appear pretty soon. I had quite a bit of money now, who knew the government is so generous to heroes. Might just be because I have a lot of cases per month. Right now, I still haven't decided if I should publish one piece, I had made a few chapters, the art is dog's hit, but the story is good, mostly because it isn't really mine. If I wasn't such an autistic fanboy in my previous life I wouldn't even bother trying to copy a story this long. 
thankfully I have read it about 68 times in my past life. I have also received the live feed bracelet a while back. But I still patrol with Rumi quite often, as much as she hates that word, we are a team now. Recently my quirk has been getting stronger and stronger, growing alongside my physical body. Majima had finished the weighted training clothes, at first, they weren't that great, couldn't hold much weight, clung too tight to the body, but he keeps making more and more adjustments to them. In the beginning, they were putting quite the strain on my body, now I wear them every day. I ordered about five pairs, to avoid wearing dirty clothes. I even asked for a version I could wear under my hero costume. Majima was really pleased with his product, he started advertising these as training equipment to the students and teachers. One pair is free if you want more you need to buy them. I think Mirio also wears his pair all the time, it took off with most male students, in fact, very few girls actually used it, they had more baggage than the guys, it made the training clothes stuffy. I believe Majima is still working on a female-friendly version. I'll probably buy one for Rumi. During our training, she just wears regular gym clothes. She also took to wearing high-density weight bracelets, I bought a set for her after my first salary as a hero. She has already gotten accustomed to them. Lately, Rumi has been showing quite a bit of progress, not as much as me, but still a lot. I believe that the only thing holding her back is the lack of action. We didn't have an encounter with any dangerous villain for a long time. The only redeemable one was a guy with a mantis quirk, and he was just quick enough to prove troublesome for Rumi. I obviously let her handle him, no point in hogging all the fun. During tough fights, she enjoys the adrenaline, however, her smile widens the most when fighting me. Thinking back, she really hates when I'm distracted in our spars, maybe I should pay more attention to her. Raising my hand and solidifying some light on my palm, I caught a downward kick coming from above my head. I could somewhat feel it, it wasn't painful, more like a small vibration going up and down my arm. Looking above I could see an angry bunny with a thirst for blood. Pay attention. She was usually loud during fights. But that didn't mean I hated it, her loudness can be quite nice from time to time. Especially when I'm deep in thought. Sorry, I'm still thinking about food dash, I said with a lazy smile. I was purposefully trying to make her angry. HMPF dash, furrowing her brows, she rotated in the air and drove a heel towards my face. Letting go of her other leg I quickly moved to the right. She always had this serious face on during training, whenever she got mad at my laziness or lack of attention she would get even more motivated for some reason. Since I liked seeing her like that, losing determination, I decide to anger her as often as I can. Using her greatest speed, she rushed me again, this time she kept herself on the ground, most likely to gain a proper foothold. She performed a roundhouse kick, I met hers with one of my own, covering my leg in highly solidified light. I developed this during our spars, I call it poor man's armament. It forms a shield around my skin and absorbs a lot of the impact. We were locked in that stalemate for a bit, as long as I don't use a lot of speed from my quirk me and Rumi have about the same power output. After all, speed is power, now I believe I could kick at speeds close to that of light, aided by my poor man's armament of course. She was the one to give in first, pulling her leg back and stumbling a bit, falling to the ground and laying for a bit. You really have a lot of energy. She was exhausted. We have been going at it for three hours now, I was also a bit winded, but that might be the weights talking. We should take a break, let's start heading back, I only extended her a hand and got her up, she didn't need to be coddled, she wasn't really that squishy. It's already getting late dash, as I was saying that she was falling to the ground, again. This time I caught her. She had that damned smile on her face, not adrenaline filled this time, just mischievous. I guess I'm too tired today. Carry me. Again, she wasn't asking, it has become a tradition at this point. If she's too exhausted I have to carry her back to her apartment. Where she proceeds to walk just fine into her house. Sometimes I feel she's just pretending to be tired. Seriously? Oh well. Saying that I put her on my back, she put her arms around my neck and straddled my back, now, from her grip I can tell she has quite a bit of strength left, but I'm sure that's just my imagination. The veins popping on my forehead were just as imaginary. But I would put up with her, for all the complaining I did, I still found her quite nice. Her energy, 
her confidence even her smile that I keep mentioning, it can all be quite intoxicating. There wasn't anything romantic going on between us, most likely because of the age gap. I wasn't really bothered much by it, I was a lot older mentally anyway. But it was probably conflicting for her, I was still 15, 16 in a few months. I will just go with the flow in this case, even if I have to wait for a while. At least I didn't look like a teen, anyone looking at me would say I'm between 20 to 25, and from the psychological evaluations I did a while back, I was also a lot more mature than most teenagers, they said my mental age was around 33. I headed back to her apartment and dropped her off, and like usual, she walked just fine from her doorstep onwards. I proceeded to say my goodbyes and head back to UA. I had a lot of sleeping to do. Patrolling daily simply wasn't necessary anymore, going to other cities was also too time-consuming, I only did it with Rumi. POV Rumi Yusajiyama, as soon as Alan closed the door I went and sat on my couch. Our interactions might not seem strained, but I can't help but feel sad about it from time to time. It's clear enough that he likes me, but I can't really bring myself to talk about it. He can probably feel my hesitation, I try to hide it a lot. But he is quite perceptive. He has never acted like a brat, nor does he look like one. Legally it should be fine, but I still feel unease. Our training has been progressing nicely, I have been feeling less and less tired every day until he bought me those weights, the first present he ever gave me. Now I wear them everywhere, besides on patrols. Even after he was told he no longer needed a supervisor, he still kept calling me on patrols in the cities around Mizutafu. I obviously accept it. I always hated teams, but we don't really act like a team, we are partners sure, but we always compete. We don't really work together at all during missions. He wins most competitions, I only win when he is training rather than competing. When doing so he slows himself down to his opponent's speed and fights them on a more even field. Seeing him like that always gets me excited, he is lazy in everything but training. Otherwise, he would have never reached his current strength. I always look forward to training with him, the adrenaline rush I usually get in life-threatening situations is not that great in comparison. Although I know Alan won't harm me I still get excited, every step that I take might lead to my loss, one moment he is moving slowly the next my eyes can't even follow him. Having him carry me was just a type of punishment I came up with, it's a bit selfish for me, but I think he doesn't mind it. If he did he would have said something. I can't help but feel that I'm leading him on due to my indecisiveness, this isn't like me at all. But we have time. We've only been partners for a few months. POV Alan After waking up I decided to call Jiren, there are quite a few things I need from him now. I think he already started working with the League. I started working with him because I know his character, unlike most people in his profession he has standards, a true professional you might say. He may be a shrewd businessman, but he wasn't scum. Now, I and Jiren aren't really friends, more like acquaintances, but we are also business partners, to some extent. As a vigilante, I didn't have a lot of money. So I ended up clearing some villain groups that made trouble for him. It was the usual drug dealer that wanted a piece of his turf and stuff of that nature. He thanked me with information, we made that deal so we don't owe each other any favors. Owing favors in the underworld is a lot worse than owing money to a loan shark. If you aren't careful you will be exploited, usually, information isn't that expensive. But for me catching villains is extremely easy. It's a lot easier than retail work. But Jiren would feel that he owes me if he didn't give me more. So he started paying me to deal with some of them. His payments were where most of my funds came from as a vigilante since my other part-time jobs were shit. I usually only agreed because I want to keep our relationship steady. I wasn't worried about this information ever going public. He wouldn't disclose any information about his clients or business partners, and out of respect, I also never even bothered asking about his other clients. I remember him being extremely professional, even when he was tortured he kept quiet about his contacts. Now I called him to ask about Trigger again. Trigger was an annoying topic for him, he didn't really believe me one bit. Probably thinking I was wasting his time. But he still checked it seriously, if he didn't then he would feel that he owed me. I called him and we started talking a bit. Hearing Jiren talk about random problematic villains was just great. He was likely hoping for me to drop by Kamino district and take care of them. So anyway I checked on this drug trigger again. 
he finally got to the point. I haven't managed to find anything by that name, but I heard some rumors about a quirk-enhancing drug. He took a pause, giving me some time to process this, Trigger was coming soon, I was getting excited. It matches the description you gave. I don't know its name but it will hit the market soon. He was probably a bit surprised about my knowledge of the drug, but he worked long enough in this business to know not to ask those questions. I see, keep me informed on it, please. If you could arrange a deal with them it would also be helpful. This was what Jiren was best at, with his network finding out more about the Shai Hasaikai wouldn't be impossible. But it would put him in needless danger, it would likely paint a target on his back. If he was just interested in the drug, then it wasn't that incriminating, overhaul wouldn't come after him. All he needed to do was act like he was a customer interested in his product. I'll see what I can do. I will contact you soon. Saying that he hung up. My cooperation with Jiren was profitable for both of us, right now he should be considering how involved he should get with my request. Since he doesn't owe me anything he can always turn down the more difficult parts. Regardless, the second trigger hit the market I would find a way. I'm 100% rating their compound. Even if I have to do it by myself. I'm reluctant to ask Rumi for help, she will most likely notify the police. And that would waste even more time, but it's not like I can hide it. I'm still wearing the tracking bracelet. I will worry about all of that later. Now, I must head to the canteen. The only place where I can feel at home besides my bedroom. I will be the first one to taste that lasagna, I don't care how many people I must step on. It's already been three weeks since Jiren told me about the appearance of the drug, after that it proceeded to get banned all over the world, and last week it was banned in Japan. I'll never understand how banning a drug would affect people that already buy most of their stuff from alternate sources. But Trigger was already dangerous even without villains using it. It makes your quirk stronger but it weakens your sense of reason. I don't even know how this drug managed to get approved in the first place. They usually test them before releasing them to the public. But that isn't my problem. Jiren managed to score a meeting with a distributor to talk about prices and supply. He isn't all that interested, but he's decided to do me a solid. In exchange for taking down another group that's bothering him, of course. I was obviously present to watch, from a distance of course. I traveled all the way to Tokyo for this meeting, telling my dispatcher that I was going on a holiday. Jiren was also a bit annoyed that he needed to travel a bit, but playing poker on the train with him was fun. But he got over the travel time quickly, he does this kind of stuff for a living. When he reached the building that the meeting was planned in, I could already feel some people inside. They are most likely just some thugs overhaul sent to give more details about the deal. Now all I needed to do was to follow the thug, but I couldn't use my quirk too much since it's bright and not that good for stealth. I followed them quietly to the entrance of the labyrinth. Then I flew towards their main compound using my perception to follow the underground tunnels. I managed to follow them right back to their compound, the thugs he sent weren't exactly trained enough to notice that they were being followed. Now, I've decided to talk about this matter with Rumi, after about four months of working and training together it would feel inadequate if I kept this type of thing from her. But I don't think she is unable to protect herself, bringing her along should be fine. Taking out my phone and calling her. At this point, I had her number on speed dial. She took a while to pick up the phone. After a quick greeting and a few questions. Hey, Rumi. I'm about to go on a raid to a Yakuza compound, you wanna join? I got straight to the point, I was already in front of their compound after all. I have something planned already. Why, do you need any help? Well, that's sad. I don't remember her talking about anything planned during our training two days ago. I was actually excited to fight alongside her. I had already planned how we would distribute the villains and how we were going to attack from different sides. No, it's fine. Have a fun day. My response probably feels a bit off, but this is the first time she ever refused to meet up with me. I hung up after saying that. Maybe I should call her out on a date from time to time. I never call her on unrelated stuff, taking a break would be nice. Well, that makes things more boring than they have to be. But I still need to save Aerie. At this point, a straightforward approach would work best, since my quirk isn't suited for an infiltration. I will just fly in their compound. They don't seem to have aerial defenses. 
At least I can't remember if they did. So I turned into a ray of light and crashed through the roof of their main building. The first people that came to check the disturbance were Kendo Rappa and a few dozen thugs. I didn't really remember all of the members of Shai Hasaikai. But I remember this guy having a nice quirk. Not that it matters, I don't have time for games. I quickly took him out with a well-placed laser beam. It went through his stomach and exploded in the middle of the thugs behind him. I remember him being durable, so I quickly kicked him through the compound and out its gate. I don't think he will be moving any time soon, or ever, but he's a villain so I don't care. Out of the few dozen thugs, only about six remained, most were hit face on with the explosion, we were in an enclosed hallway after all. I wasted no time in knocking them down. I quickly traveled using my senses. I needed to cut off their escape routes. This place had a lot of tunnels underneath, forming a labyrinth. I moved at my fastest speed and found their meeting room. Here were the rest of the eight bullets along with Mimic. I could feel chronostasis and overhaul in the basement. I quickly used Yasukani no Magatama, it pierced through the unsuspecting villains and took out all of them. Some lost a limb, some were paralyzed. I don't really care what happens to them at this point. I rushed underground, using a light tendril to dig into the ground at great speed. When reaching Overhaul and his right-hand man I broke into the wall and traveled through the tendril into his room. I slowed down this time. The raid was practically over, it had taken 2 minutes and 14 seconds. With these two in front of me, there was no escape for them, Shai Hasaikai was over. They recognized me instantly, my name wasn't exactly a joking matter for villains. Overhaul was panicking a bit, but he managed to calm down. Chronostasis was just as surprised, but he recovered much quicker and said. How did you get in here? As if that wasn't obvious. Well, after being greeted so politely in your little base I decided to visit the leader and have some tea with him. I said, kindly. I was going to play around with them a bit. Give them some hope. I think I could hear Overhaul mutter something about useless subordinates. I think we can come to an understanding yellow flash. Oh, it seems Chisaki was trying really hard. I almost pity him. I absolutely ignored his rant about how this quirk is plagued and quirks are a sickness or some shit. I was really getting bored just looking at him rabble on about how great the world used to be and how quirks are asterisk pet his wife or whatever. So are you going to join us? He seems to think his rant was really convincing, he extended a hand. I contemplated a bit. Was he an idiot? I remember him being one of the smarter characters in the plot. I left him with his hand extended. I took on a thinking posture, I looked as serious as I could. Then, with a spark in my eyes and a friendly smile on my face. I severed his hand and kicked him into a wall. We were underground so the entire structure shook. Chronostasis quickly took out a handgun and tried to shoot me. It should be quirk cancelling bullets. I remember thinking they could be an issue. But with my speed, I can't really be hit by them. I can't remember much about them however, which is why I won't let one touch me carelessly. I flashed in front of him and he tried to impale me with his hair, but I kicked him into the ceiling. He remained suspended there. With the upper half of his body stuck in the ceiling four overhaul miraculously wasn't instantly knocked out. He managed to stop his stump from bleeding while chronostasis kept me entertained. Looking at me with hatred he said. Why? He tried placing his hand on the wall beside him, but a spike made out of solid light impaled his palm and pushed it away. The spike proceeded to grow more spikes that managed to impale his arm and torso in six different places. You really are hopeless. I said with the same lazy look on my face. I knocked him out and continued to walk towards the cells. I only have Ari to save now. When opening the door to her cell I could see her just sitting on her bed. Dressed in that awful gown with her arms and legs covered in bandages. Seeing her like that made my heart churn. She trembled as I opened the door. She should be about five years old. Meaning she has been here for only a year at most. Since she was only abandoned after awakening her quirk. I approach her slowly, she seems to not want to look up in my direction. Hey, are you feeling well? I took on the kindest tone I could manage. Not recognizing my voice she quickly looked up, her eyes widening in what I can only describe as shock. And fear, I really dislike seeing that. 
W who are you? Her voice quivered. At this point, she probably already knows all of her captors, my face should be new to her. With the most reassuring smile that I could manage on my face, I said, I am Alan, I work as a hero. I came here for you. My smile calmed her, only briefly. She regained the same scared look when she heard the last part. P please don't. T they will make you D disappear too. Well, seeing her in person makes me want to go back and slice Overhaul's other arm off. But he's already down, that wouldn't be very hero-like. Don't worry about me, everything is being taken care of. I flashed a smile that seemed to calm her down a bit. What is your name, little girl? I bent down and patted her head, she recoiled at first but calmed down after a few seconds. And my name is Aerie. She paused a bit, I kept patting her head for a bit, then I retracted my hand. She seemed a bit sad for a second, but she recovered quickly. You are a very polite girl. Saying that I extended a palm towards her. Slowly to not scare her, she still looked hesitant. But she still put her little hand in mine. I gently pulled her up. Holding her to my chest she quickly wrapped her arms and legs around me. She just made a quiet protest and looked at me curiously. It's fine, we should probably leave this place. She looked excited at the prospect, but she was still scared. Don't worry, I'll protect you. I hugged her closer to me while saying that. I started walking back into the corridor. My dynamic entry might have ruined some of the lights in this place. Aerie seemed a bit afraid, her hold on me tightening a little. I did promise I'd protect her. That includes her happiness. Using my free hand I softly poked her cheek. When she looked up she saw my face, the same reassuring smile plastered onto it, then she looked around. The corridor was being filled with small lights. It looked like we were walking through a sky filled with stars. I could see Aerie's eyes widen as they gazed upon the light show I made for her. I could see the wonder and happiness in them, I continued walking, traversing the lights, sometimes walking through them, other times making them avoid me. I brought one closer to Aerie as she reached out with her small hand and grasped it. She had one of the biggest smiles I've ever seen on her face. The panic and fear from before were lost, all that was left was childlike joy and curiosity. The smile on her face was the cutest thing I had ever seen, it probably did more damage to me than the entirety of Shai Hasaikai. It felt as if an arrow went through me. I vow to protect this smile. But I won't leave it at that, she needs to see that her oppressor was not going to harm her or anybody else ever again. With that thought in mind, I soldiered on determined to completely erase her fear of this place from her mind. The lights dancing around us were turning this dim place that once kept her into a beautiful painting. Gaining different colors and playing around us, as if they were conscious and alive. Looking back, we hadn't covered much distance, I had walked extremely slow, letting Eri experience this at a good pace. But we already were in front of the room I left the villains in. My free hand was already on the doorknob. Before entering I said, Ari, remember. You don't have anything to fear when I am with you. I said that with a lot of energy, hoping that some of my confidence would rub off on her. She just nodded, she was a bit anxious, but all of my efforts were showing. She still had that smile on her face. When she saw what was inside the room she panicked, clutching me tightly and burying her face in my chest, I could feel her small horn touching my ribs. The sight might be brutal for a five-year-old, but she has already seen people die, she had already seen savagery and brutality that one of such innocents shouldn't have. He can't hurt you anymore. I made sure of that. I said slowly. Trembling she finally managed to see the state of her captors, one was buried in the ceiling while the other was missing an arm and unconscious. She looked around the room scanning it and trying to understand what had happened. Then she finally looked up, she saw my face, I had a smile filled with kindness and care. Before I realized it, her eyes filled up with tears. She clung tightly to me, I could hear a stifled, thank you. I responded by hugging her, now I just needed to call the police to pick up Overhaul's group, but they most likely noticed the explosions happening here. They should have sent some people here already, let's leave this place. Saying that I continued my way through the tunnels, using my perception to navigate my way to an exit. When I walked into the courtyard of the compound I could already feel that the place was surrounded. Above my head, I could see a news helicopter. 
They had moved fast, but it may just be because I took my time with Aerie. I guess a bit of publicity isn't that harmful. I think that taking action against a group of drug dealers and manufacturers isn't that big of an issue. Even if they just started producing and distributing. Most of my issues are in regards to the way this could be interpreted. I was going on a holiday but ended up violently taking down a dangerous villain group. That excuse might not fly that well under the radar. Regardless, they won't really interrogate me or anything, I'm still a hero with a provisional license. Even if I'm technically still serving a sentence for vigilantism. All this time I haven't let go of Ari. I should think of a way to keep her near me. I can't really adopt her, not only am I underaged I'm also a person with a criminal record and don't really have a house. I need to think of something for her since she can't really control her quirk she is better off living at UA. With my current salary, I can hire some teachers to homeschool her. Although knowing Nizu he'd take care of that himself. He's probably the smartest person in this world. At least I think so, he probably understands that the government doesn't have many options when it comes to holding me down. Right now their biggest concern is that I don't become a villain or something. Thankfully I made sure to show an extreme distaste towards villains in the past. Deals with Jiren aside, I do actually hate most villains. I'll worry more about that later. My interactions with Jiren would also lessen after this. As I walked slowly I could see Eri looking somewhat scared, more and more thugs started to appear around us. There were around 80 of them. I think they don't realize that their boss is gone. Some pulled out their guns while some decided to encircle and rush at me. I simply raised my free hand, sending a small orb of light into the sky above us, making sure to avoid the helicopter. When it reached a certain height it grew to colossal proportions creating a shockwave that managed to part the clouds around it. It certainly caught the villains off guard, some even dropped their guns. Looking up they saw a second source of light in the sky. It looked like the sun came closer to earth, it was not radiating any heat, but just its size was enough to put fear in them. Eri also looked up at the sky in wonder. Her eyes singing with curiosity and awe. Heavenly discharge. I said slowly and lazily, my voice reverberating throughout the field. Heroes need to name their finishers. I made it up on the spot of course. Only Eri and the villains heard me, anyway. At least I think so, not that it matters. Then they heard me snap my fingers, a rain of light rays falling around me in Eri. An overly complicated attack sure, but it looked cool for the people at home. It looked like the sun was raining destructive rays on us. The light burned through the people around me, sending them to the ground writhing in pain. The attacks were too fast for these thugs to even react to, let alone dodge. When some of the rays reached the ground they exploded, taking out all of the villains at once. This attack was only usable because I had my perception focused on the villains, otherwise, it would be too fatal for hero work. I dispersed the light in the sky, giving the viewers a bit of a show. After that, I just slowly walked over the downed villains. Getting to the police cars I heard one speak through the megaphone. Yellow Flash, what's the situation here? They obviously know who I am. Not that many people can display this amount of power. I made my way to them to speak normally. They also seemed okay with that even though they were a bit tense. My attack amazed them, but that doesn't mean they were not in a stressful situation still. This place hosted a group of villains that distributed and developed different drugs. They were quite new, I'll give a report later. They just looked at me for a bit, then the one I assumed to be in charge asked the most obvious question they could. Was the child you're carrying a prisoner here? They probably needed her testimony for some of the stuff that happened here. Yes, I'll be taking her to a hospital and bringing her over to the station later for the report. He seemed pleased enough with that. You guys should hurry up and take some of the injured villains to the hospital, there is a huge underground labyrinth where you should find their leader. He nodded and started moving his people to capture the downed villains. I gave them a few more directions and information about the injuries of some of the villains. When talking to the policeman I could hear a lot of flashes around me. Camera crews made it here already. I think I did enough for now. It's about time to depart. Holding Airy tightly I asked. Have you flown before? It was a rhetorical question of course. She still shook her head cutely. Hold on tight and remember. There is nothing to fear. 
saying that I jumped and made my way to the station, creating a wind barrier made out of light for Airy. She screamed a bit at first but calmed down after a bit. Where are we going? She was clinging tightly to me. Flying can be a bit terrifying for first-timers. Looking at her, I simply said. Home Airy, we are going home. With that, she closed her eyes and dozed off. POV Rumi Yusajiyama, I didn't actually have any plans for today. I feel a bit sad lying to Alan, but I don't know why I was a bit disappointed when he called me for a raid. He usually doesn't call me in the middle of the day. It's always the morning or the evening. For some reason, I thought he wanted to do something else. I think he sounded a bit sad. But I don't want to just spend time with him when we're working and training. I think I will talk to him about it. Turning on my TV I could see some news on a raid. I didn't realize he would do it so quickly. I could see a figure from the awkward angle of the helicopter. A tall man in a yellow suit and marine cape. He had yellowish skin, short black hair with somewhat thick lips and droopy eyes that could be seen even under his sunglasses. He was obviously Alan, but the stranger part was what he was holding. It seemed to be a small girl, covered in bandages and wearing a dirty gown. I unknowingly started clenching my fist at the sight of her. She clung tightly to Alan, her size was almost comical in comparison to him. It made the two look like father and daughter. I noticed a large group of villains closing in on Alan. I was worried for about one second. Alan was not in danger at all, I should know better than to doubt his ability at this point. But it was more like an instinct. The next scene made me smile, seeing him raise his hand. He was also sporting a lazy smile. The panicked cameraman managed to catch the expansion of that small orb. I haven't seen this move before, but just from its size, I can tell he's angry. That smile of his was not always honest. He should be blowing off some steam. This is the first time I heard him name an attack. The name sounded a bit overbearing, but looking at the scope of the attack, it was fitting. He was obviously showing off, really was he trying to create a cult of fangirls or something? Regardless, the second the light started falling on the villains the camera only managed to catch the end of the exchange. Giving the people at home an image of the fallen villains and the entire courtyard riddled with holes and craters. The light dispersing slowly in a harmless and beautiful scene. It almost looked like fireworks. This should give people some perspective. Maybe a feeling of safety, there was another pillar of strength that society could lean on for support. I could only feel regret, I could have been beside him now, instead of sitting on my couch and watching TV. With a sigh, I turned off the TV. He will probably get in a lot of trouble too. He most likely gave serious injuries to a lot of villains just with that attack. But he'll manage, he always does. POV All Might Dash, weren't expecting that were you? After a long day of training my disciple and studying so that I can be a better teacher, I usually relax for the rest of the time. Today I gave young Midoriya a break, he still needs one from time to time. I also managed to get some free time, having already studied most of what Nizu gave me. Right now I have the television in the background while looking up some new things for my pupil. His progress is steady, I must raise the intensity of his training gradually, to do that I need more research. From my TV I suddenly heard. Breaking news, explosions have been heard from a compound in the vicinity of Tokyo. One person was sent flying through the gate and the police have surrounded the gate. Hearing all that made me whip my head to the television. We will switch the view to our reporter, who has an aerial view from our helicopter. I could see the big compound and the police surrounding it, I hope this isn't something too bad. I won't be able to make it in time all the way over there. Then I could see a person I recognized. It was young Alan, he is always up to something, isn't he? He had become a touchy subject for me, I don't really understand him well, but I managed to overcome my guilt after a while. But, I could tell he wasn't fighting seriously when he was captured. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Back then I was getting tired and expending my time, he seemed to notice the smoke coming out of me. He stopped for long enough to allow Aizawa to use his ability on him. It still boggles me to this day. Why he did something like that, I know he wanted to become a hero. I started believing that he was just testing himself. Seeing him surrounded by villains wasn't concerning to me at all. Maybe the number was a bit much, but I am sure he will manage. 
It is more dangerous now that he has a child in his arms. After seeing young Alan on a day-to-day -day basis, I realize that strength isn't even something he's concerned about, he trains a lot. But he doesn't use a lot of his strength in anything but that. He would much rather spend his free time after training sleeping or eating. He was by no means ever going to become a role model, at least I hope he doesn't. His attitude also lessened my anxiety by a lot, he was always nonchalant, lacking any trauma and or mental scars from his experiences. His attitude could be somewhat refreshing. His next move was a bit much for me. The size of that light orb alone was twice as big as the USJ. If he had used that in our fight he would have won instantly, taking out both the police and every hero that was present there. That type of power was something that I wasn't capable of even at my peak. The speed and reach of the attack being monstrous even in my eyes. It was reassuring, however, knowing that such power is on our side. I now know that my era is coming to an end, at least I don't have to hurry the training of my pupil. The next generation looks a lot more promising than the last. The people are in good hands. POV narration dash, don't want to confuse PPL anymore, while Tashinori was left feeling content and reassured, from the Bakugo household, you could hear a lot of swearing and screaming. While, a bit later, Izuku was also clenching his fist, looking at a repeat of the incident on his phone. Both he and Bakugo were training extremely hard to catch up to Alan. But the gap was only becoming wider and more evident. It made both of them even more determined than before. Izuku calling All Might to train on his free day and Bakugo grabbing his stuff and going to a court gym. It was a bit pricey, but it was the best place for aspiring heroes to train before attempting to enter a hero school. The same situation was happening in other places, when Mirio saw that he could barely contain his excitement, rushing to the field and training with renewed vigor. Tamaki was not as excited, but he was solemn, he didn't want his friends getting ahead of him. Nijire was about the same in excitement, maybe more. She had a wide smile when she saw her friends training and deciding to join them instantly. All three of them started ignoring what they needed to study for tests. Two caught up in their excitement. They will be crying later though. The incident had already gone viral, making the Yellow Flash one of the most searched up names for the next few weeks. It was now one of the most viewed videos on HROTube, there, I did it. POV MC Dash, back on track, after flying for a while, I made it to the walls of UA, Eri had already opened her eyes by now. Staring at them in wonder. This is your home. She asked in a sweet and excited voice. Her first time seeing UA was cute to witness. Well, I do live here. But it's also where I work. She looked just as happy, probably not really getting it. I'll be taking you to a very good doctor. She can heal you up very nicely. The smile on my face was coming out naturally at this point. Her smile was also just as wide, if not wider. I hope Recovery Girl won't mind the extra work. Although, knowing her, she might just completely ignore me and take Aerie for herself. Regardless, I reached the infirmary and brought Aerie to a bed, and just as expected. Recovery Girl didn't even treat me like Air. I didn't exist in her eyes at all, she was gushing over how cute Aerie was and how could anyone ever do anything bad to something that cute. Recovery Girl's harmless appearance made her the perfect person to take care of Aerie. Looking at them, I simply said. Aerie, I will go out for a bit. Don't worry I'll be nearby. I put on a reassuring smile while looking at Aerie. I still needed to talk to Nizu, and probably get an earful from him. For the whole violent takedown of a villain group deal. I also needed to write up a report for the police station. With the spectacle, I just put on I doubt I'd get much more than a fine as punishment. The takedown itself would pay me more than they would fine me. Nodding her head, Aerie said. N, I'll wait here. Meanwhile, Recovery Girl just gave me the stink eye and said. What? You were still here. Shu, while waving me off. She really hated that after me coming to UA her workload increased. She liked taking that out on me. But I wasn't just going to ignore her jab. Ah, uh, old people dash, I didn't even get to finish that before receiving the cane. Ari just giggled at the scene. With a wry smile, I left the room. Wondering how my life choices led me to this place. When reaching Nizu's office I could already feel him in there, combing his fur like usual. 
I think he spends more time on that than on school issues. With his brain, most paperwork gets done instantly anyway. Knocking on the door, I put on the best smile I could, it was practiced in my last life as a corporate rat. I wasn't always a freelancer, after all, I once tried to climb the corporate ladder and live the capitalist dream. Finally, my skills will be put to good use. After hearing him tell me to come and open the door and said. Good day, sir. Isn't today just beautiful? He just stared at me, with an amused look on his face. I hope he doesn't find my situation amusing, his sense of humor can be a bit sadistic. Oh, young Alan. Take a seat, I believe we have a few things to discuss. He said with a shit-eating grin on his face while pointing to a nearby couch. The discussion was quite annoying. It thankfully didn't take that long, it basically resulted in him reminding me that my situation is still a special case and that I should pay a bit of attention to my actions. He also seemed pleased by my display of strength. It would make the government a lot more reluctant to punish me if the public considered me one of their most powerful protectors. Then we got to the part that actually interests me. What will happen to Ari? About the little girl you've brought here. We don't know much about her situation, it would be great if you could clear a few things for me. Basically, she has a very powerful quirk that she can't really control and she was being exploited because of it. She doesn't have anywhere to go. I said, with a bit of a frown on my face. I think the best thing we could do is to keep her here. Where she can learn to control her power and get a proper education. I turned that frown into a confident smile instantly. I understand where you are coming from, Alan. But, a child as young as she still needs parental love. Wouldn't the best option be to find a family willing to adopt her? Nizu's concern was well-founded, he was speaking to an orphan right now. One that had turned to a very dangerous profession from a young age. I want to take care of her. I think she also wouldn't mind. But legally dash, Nizu interrupted me, with an amused smile on his face. You don't really need to worry about legality. There are many loopholes we can take advantage of in that field. I guess he always does this type of stuff. He continued with the same amount of energy. I believe the best course of action is to ask her about her opinion. Although she is young she should still have a say in all of this. We were obviously going to ask her. But regardless of whether she ends up with me or with a loving family, it's still for the best if she studies here. At the end of the day, I think it's better to give her some control. After being locked away against her will having control over her own fate might be a bit therapeutic. Now, when it comes to your options for adoption. You can't really adopt her in your name. I think you are well aware of that already. Nizu really didn't like to sugarcoat things. I was going to say something, but he interrupted my thoughts. However, if you could get someone you trust to adopt her you could still raise her. Great, human connections, my weakness. I will think of someone principle. I think Rumi could help me in this case, since she has a clean record and all. I just hope it won't be too much to ask of her. After that, I said my goodbye and took my leave, leaving Nizu to make some phone calls. The only thing left to do was to talk to Eri. But not before using my fastest speed to rush all the clothing stores in the area. I was not going to let her wear that rag for more than necessary. Surprisingly, a lot of people recognized me and some shops even gave me discounts. I was speed buying an entire wardrobe for my little Airy. Now, I wasn't planning on spending all of my savings here, but I can't really help it. I now have more bags in my hands than it should be humanly possible, I even used my light to create a cart to haul all the shoeboxes and bags filled with clothes. Most people took pictures of me. I think my shopping spree in the children's clothing aisle made people look at me weirdly. But their looks don't bother me, for my mission is sacred. Returning to UA with all that baggage wasn't that quick. I could speed up and cover more distance and all, but I needed some time to think. What if Rumi didn't want to help me? Who would I go to then? Would Tashinori accept? Worries of this kind were really annoying. But I don't care what happens, Eri must stay by my side. I already swore to protect her, nothing was going to stop me from doing so. Now I could just hope I didn't take too long on her clothes. Making my way to the infirmary and leaving the clothes at the door. I could hear her laughing. As soon as I entered the room I saw the big three there, they were playing with Ari. 
they really were good at calming the people around them. Well, everyone besides Recovery Girl who was looking at them with unadulterated hatred. I think I can piece together what happened here. They went overboard with their training and got injured, came here and interrupted Recovery Girl's time with Aerie and gave her more work. If they weren't injured already they would have gotten injured by coming here. Aerie was the first to notice my presence. Gaining a big smile and rushing and hugging me. Alan. She jumped and I also grabbed her. Bringing her to my chest once more. Mirio just looked on with a smile and said. Alan. That raid was impressive. Nijire also looked excited when seeing me. We should totally train together more. Recovery Girl quickly reacted by saying. If you do, don't you dare come to me to get fixed up. Glaring at us and making Tamaki almost whimper. I'm glad you guys are getting along with Eri. We continued talking for a bit, unfortunately, they didn't stay long. Eager to return to their training, much to the distaste of our resident youthful nurse. Now it was the time for my conversation with Eri. After the three aspiring heroes left there was only me, Recovery Girl and Eri in the infirmary. Eri didn't really leave my arms since she got there. I guess I can't complain, she is very light anyway, get it? Looking at Eri I started talking to get her attention. There are a few things we have to do now. She looked my way expectantly and somewhat curious. We need to ask you about your decision, whether you wish for me to keep taking care of you or if you wish to be adopted by a loving family. I didn't really want to force her into choosing me, even if she chooses to get adopted I would still help her and protect her. I would also make sure to help her master her quirk. Aizawa would probably be her teacher, ha, yeah, more work for him. She looked a bit surprised at this. Her large eyes widening just a little bit more. I want to stay with Big Brother. I guess hearing her call me that isn't bad. Although it dealt some damage to my feeble heart. Thank you, Eri. Unknowingly, my face gained a huge smile. While she seemed happy that she had the choice. I still had quite a few things to do, besides writing that blasted report for the police station. I also need to bring Aerie there once she's recovered. They just need the testimony of a victim. It shouldn't take long, she just needs to say a few things and someone will just write them down. I just hope they won't have to make her relive those things. But, for now, that solves the adoption issue, now I just need to somehow convince Rumi to become a mother for me. I also should ask her out on something besides training and patrolling. It would be sad if all we did was train since it's quite clear we both like each other. Now that I think about it, adopting a child with Rumi might be skipping some stages of our relationship. Oh well, I'm sure there won't be any problem here. I'll talk to her tomorrow, now I need to write that report and get Aerie to wear something nice. Aerie, I bought you some clothes. Her face lit up in excitement. I guess she didn't get to choose much about her wardrobe while in the care of Shai Hasaikai. Want to come and choose a few you like? She nodded quickly. I walked with her in hand to the door and brought all of the bags in the infirmary. Recovery girl just looked at us with a small smile, I'm guessing it was mostly directed at Aerie, but she wasn't going to make a fuss about this as long as I cleaned up after myself. Putting everything down including Aerie, I told her. You can look and choose anything you like from here. I just bought them on my way here. I said with a smile while on one knee. Aerie looked up at me and thanked me again, this time her large eyes had a few tears in them. I instantly started panicking internally. What to do when your child cries for the first time? I looked at Recovery Girl, she just nodded, probably thinking I was going to do something. My mind was racing and the only thing I could come up with was to pick her up and create a small string of light. Making it dance around us, forming figures and shapes while wriggling flying around her. She was still sobbing, but the light managed to distract her a bit. Thankfully, her tears weren't sad ones, she had a small smile on her face. She just hugged me tightly, well as tightly as she could, with our difference in size it was hard for her to get a good hold on me. I could hear her whispering a soft thank you and crying. It turned the panic in my heart into happiness, a smile reshaping itself onto my face. I stayed like that for a few minutes, the light played around us for a while before entering my sleeve and vanishing. I was patting her back while she cried, as she slowly separated from me I just said. You're welcome. With that, she also started smiling brightly looking down at the clothes surrounding her. 
and starting to search some of the bags for things she might like. Recovery Girl will help her put them on when she decides which she likes most. I let her do that by herself, she had quite a bit to choose from so I guess it should take a while. I left the room after a while. I still need to go start writing on that report. Reaching my room was easy, I always leave my window open so that I don't have to climb up any stairs. It helps a lot, I can just reflect myself into my bed and fall asleep. But this time I went to the desk to start writing. Well, I took a shower and got changed first. I'm trying to postpone talking to Rumi about adoption for as long as possible. Writing this report is one method to do it. I can also go and inform Nizu of Ari's choice, even though he was most likely already informed by Recovery Girl. By the time I finished writing the report the sun was already starting to go down. I just sent it to their email, I didn't really feel like flying all the way over to them to deliver it. I needed to check on Eri one last time before going to inform Nizu about her choice. She should sleep in the infirmary for tonight. But, I don't really want her to feel lonely, I guess I'll figure something out. When I came into the room I could see the bag still near her bed. She was dressed in a pair of pajamas I bought for her. She was already sleeping, it has been a tiring day for her. It was a tiring day for me too, not physically of course. Well, Nizu can wait. I go to a random bed inside the infirmary and sleep my worries off. Meanwhile, the police were announcing the state of the raid and the way it was handled to the press. Authors note, okay, so I decided to start a pat.rayon. Nothing will change here, I will still post a chap a day with the added bonus when I feel like it. For now, it doesn't have much. I will post a chap there later today. Here's the link, www.pat.rayon.com slash veganmaster2 When I woke up I couldn't help but feel overcome with the desire to stay in bed for another day or two. Mainly because today I need to speak to Rumi about Aerie's situation. Getting up, I could see that Aerie was still sleeping. I quietly floated my way to the door, to avoid waking her up. Opening the door quietly was hard, but all I had to do was crack it open and send a little beam of light through. I managed to do so without making a single sound. Walking down the hallway I could see the sun hadn't risen yet. I was very early today, I usually got to sleep really late, so that might explain why. The first thing I did was to go to my room and check the web. I wanted to know how famous I got after my latest stunt. When checking my social media I could see that I had garnered a following, now I even had a fan-made subreddit. My recent spike in popularity managed to raise me to number 8. I was quickly rising in popularity too, so I can expect my ranking to rise in the next few weeks. I already pushed Rumi back to 10 right after she managed to win over Ryukyu and get to 9 thankfully she didn't care much for the billboard. Even though she recently became the highest ranking female hero in Japan. While I was browsing the web I managed to find an article shit talking me. Saying how someone as young as I am shouldn't get in the way of the police. It was obviously attempting to garner negative attention. And it worked like a charm, the number of bad comments was astounding, the fanbase having just enlarged Ned by a substantial number. They were more than willing to defend me. I wasn't going to comment on it, it would just give the article more attention. Ignoring things is my forte after all. After spending a while browsing the web I could still find some people thinking that I was a bit too brutal to the villains during the raid, some were concerned that I might become as violent as Endeavor. I wasn't really going to address these issues. Mostly because I didn't have any online presence of my own. I should create a hero tube account or something. I certainly don't plan on hiring a marketing team, don't need one. By the time I was done with my online surfing the sun was already up. I got up and dressed in something a bit more stylish than my tracksuit. Basically a pair of jeans and a white shirt. I wanted to at least look presentable to her. I went to Rumi as quickly as possible. She should be up by now, probably making herself some breakfast or something. I still don't know how to break this to her exactly, but I will figure something out. I am a really great speaker under pressure, lie, as I got to her doorstep I cleared my throat and knocked on the door. I could feel her checking who it was, sighing and opening the door. Rumi. Great to see you. I said with a smile on my face. Yeah, really great. What's the deal, you're not really dressed for training or patrol. Great, she already saw through me. For some reason, she had an expectant look on her face. 
Well, I need your help with something dash, as soon as I said that I could hear the door crack, the wood being crushed by her fingers, her face remaining unchanged. Gulping a bit I said. I actually wanted to take you out on a date first, but then this issue came up. Her grip on the door lessened as she started smiling a bit. And what might that be? She asks, somewhat annoyed but still happy by my desire to go on a date with her. My next question was going to be a deciding factor, I need to be careful about it. But feeling her gaze on me made me feel a bit anxious. Maybe because I don't have much experience with women. W will you adopt a child with me? That came out wrong. I could see her face turning red and her face looking surprised, she thankfully gave me a bit to explain myself before beating me into the ground. After a few minutes of me bumbling my way through explaining Aries' life story and her current situation she said. And you want me to adopt her? She looked at me like an idiot. Well, I figured we can take care of her together. I know this is a bit much, our relationship hasn't even started properly yet. I could barely look her in the eyes at this point. After a short pause, with her looking at me with a confused face. She said, all right. But that date better be good. The confusion on her face replaced by a smile. Sure thing. I'll get Nizu to sort out most of the paperwork, all you need to do is to sign it. I said, both relieved and happy. The date will be something I have to worry at some point. But I don't want it to be on my mind now. Rumi, however, looked very pleased with herself, almost as if she won a battle. I did say I would wait for her to make a decision, I guess this situation just hurried it a bit. After hugging Rumi goodbye, an action that managed to get her face a noticeable shade of red, I quickly went to Nizu to inform him of this development. I think he already has most of the paperwork done anyway. I need to check with Majima for a weighted training suit for women. I hope he does it by the end of the year. But, since I and Rumi are becoming a thing I should also get her something nice, unrelated to training. Oh well, I hope Rumi likes lasagna, because I will be begging lunch rush to cook for us regardless of what we'll be doing. Nizu was as busy as ever, making his fur even shinier and smoother and talking to Tashinori about some stuff. When I came in and informed him about my choice he didn't even seem surprised. Tashinori just mumbled something about, young love, a look from me quickly shut him up. My interactions with Rumi were not a secret to anyone from UA, Aizawa was really pleased that I was spending less time here too. Regardless, he handed me the papers that were already made in Rumi's name. And he told to get them to her for a signature. He really doesn't waste any time. With that quick process, the adoption was over. Time skipped two months it's already been two months since we've sorted out the issue of Aries' adoption. After finishing the whole adoption paperwork thing all I needed to do was to furnish one of the rooms in Rumi's house for Eri to live in. I was going to do it by myself, but Rumi quickly took the initiative and told me off. There is no way I'd let you decorate a little girl's room. Or so she says. She also decided to help with the expenses, apparently, this was going to be a double effort from our side. Not only on the financial front, as Rumi decided to help raise Eri and actually act as her parents. Right now we still haven't had an official date. But we started going out to different places outside of work and training, this made Rumi very happy. I guess one could call most of our outings dates, however, I think they weren't enough. The most we did was hold hands during those. I have already planned out an actual romantic date, hopefully, it will work well. More on that later. At the end of the day, neither of us has much experience so she doesn't mind waiting a bit. Some people have been looking weirdly at us, maybe because of the age gap. But no one actually made any complaints. The legal age here is 13, even if our relationship is uncommon it's still acceptable. The teachers also didn't care much, except for Midnight, who was excited and started giving me tips on how to pleasure a woman, usually one of the teachers just shuts her up and drags her out of the room. Lately, I've had my hands full with training, hero work isn't exactly a priority, I only do it on occasion and I stop doing it alone mostly. Nowadays I just use it as an excuse to spend even more time with Rumi. Eri started training her quirk at UA with the help of Aizawa, he wasn't exactly jumping in excitement to help, but he also couldn't refuse something like this. The big three are also doing alright, at least I hope so, I heard that they concentrated too much on training, leading them to fail a few classes. Now they have to retake some tests during this summer break. 
Talking about summer break, I think the entrance exams are coming up. Which means I'll probably also have to start studying in the general course the next year. Thankfully I was a college graduate in my past life. Most of the concepts are similar, even when under different names. Making everything somewhat easier, I still have to remember the stuff I learned. I have been the one taking Aerie to and from UA, mainly because Rumi can't be bothered to drive her car, and I can fly. Aerie already got accustomed to her new place of living, she also doesn't get scared when flying anymore. In the beginning, she would get a bit scared, tell Rumi about it, and the latter would begin to hit me with whatever she had at hand. Ah, good times. It really feels like you guys are already a married couple, is something Snipe pointed out when he saw the bruises on my face. Oh well, can't really call it abuse if you're having fun. Wait that came out wrong. Anyway, there are a few things on my mind right now. Since the entrance exam is just a month away, I hope that I can pass this time uneventfully. The League of Villains didn't show itself at all. Right now I think I am free. I just let Eri off at school, Rumi is currently off to some hero stuff. It has been a while since I've had time for myself. Not that it's a bad thing, spending all my time with Rumi and Eri is very nice. But it's been a while since I've taken some time to myself, I still haven't decided whether to publish one piece or not. I guess I will post it online and see what happens. Although the art can only be described as flimsy. Right now, I've only reached the Arlong Park arc. I hope it will get popular so that an actual studio gets interested in it. I've yet to try and send the Ross to a studio, I will do it tomorrow. Right now, I'm going to my dorm room at UA, it has been a while since I slept in it, nowadays I mostly sleep on Rumi's couch or in a guest room. Going in I could already see that the room was absolutely clean, apparently, the staff made sure to keep it that way, lucky me I guess. Opening my laptop I went on the web, my ranking on the hero billboard chart went all the way up to number 4, pushing best genus to NR, Rumi also managed to climb NR, she still doesn't care much about it, but it's a nice ranking to have. I started a few social media accounts, I don't really use a lot, but I have them just in case. People have calmed down to some extent, their worries were not unfounded, I didn't show much mercy to the villains during the Shai Hasaikai. But after the raid, I refrained from seriously maiming any villains. That seemed to somewhat calm down the masses. The police were not exactly pleased with my actions either, as expected they gave me a fine. It wasn't even that much, but they still didn't hold it against me. Raids are usually stressful situations, mistakes can happen. I quickly got bored and closed my laptop, opening the television instead. Breaking news, massive prison breakout happening right now at Tartarus. We will dash, okay, that's new. POV narration, Tartaros was located on an island, surrounded by giant walls. The only access to the prison is a long bridge connected to a city. It was a normal day at Tartaros, another dangerous convict was brought in by a hero, his quirk had something to do with redirecting waves. Oh well. He was just another villain to the trained guards. For now, he was locked up in a cell with a high amount of defenses. Sensors are put on all of the inmates here alerting the guards when someone activates their quirks, the prisoners are monitored in a room with several screens displaying the inside of cells. Everything was running fine, but the second the guards left the new prisoner in the cell. All of the cameras went down. The person in the monitor room tried raising the alert, but something was jamming all contacts inside the building. Then pandemonium started, when noticing the problems in electricity and the confusion if the guards the less highly restrained prisoners quickly took that chance to escape their confinement. Killing all of the guards in their vicinity. Then they proceeded to free more and more prisoners, to the point where most incarcerated individuals were already out of their cells. The guards were quickly overrun as the emergency defensive system was malfunctioning. One guard near the entrance managed to run away far enough to escape the effect of the presumed jammer quirk. Doing so he called the police force. After they were informed they contacted all nearby heroes. Quickly forming a blockade on the bridge. And so, more and more heroes gathered, along with them came the press. Which gave more coverage to the situation. Something that prompted even more heroes to start making their way there. POVMC, it was foolish of me to think that I would get some free time. From what I could see the situation at Tartarus is extremely dire. The villains are now stuck at the gates basically. 
almost about to force their way back into our society. I could see heroes blocking the bridge, probably hoping that someone like All Might would show up, but since he's always on a timer such a big fight might be disadvantageous for him. Suddenly I could see a pillar of flame. Yep, it's Endeavor, at least there's someone to suppress the villains for a while. There is also Hawks, he seems to not be in hero gear, mostly using his quirk to evacuate all the civilians in the immediate vicinity of the bridge. I still don't know how the breakout started, it might be because there has been a surplus of convicted felons in the last few years, someone with a special quirk might have slipped by unnoticed. I don't have much time to ponder on the situation. I think I can make it there in a few minutes at my fastest speed. I quickly got changed and headed there. I don't have time to bother calling my dispatcher. The guy already knows me anyway, he can guess where I am headed. Thinking on it, this might actually be my chance to get to know the NR, hero, who will also be the future NR, hero, since I am 100% going to become NR before him. I can only think this encounter will be great, maybe even refreshing. Wasn't he one of the greyest characters in MHA? He had a redemption arc and all. Oh well, I think he won't mind the help. There are somewhere around 500 villains attempting to escape imprisonment. I think All Might is also heading in that direction. Even with his timer he still wouldn't let something like this happen without even attempting to interfere. At the end of the day, Tartaros housed the most dangerous villains. Right now the heroes were still holding, their small strategical advantage is what kept them alive for so long, but the difference in numbers was starting to show. By the time I got there, the situation wasn't looking too good. A lot of the heroes were injured, and Endeavor was the worst. He probably burned quite a lot of villains to a crisp, but now he was barely standing up, both injuries and fatigue catching up to him. Hawks was shot down from the sky, a few dozen heroes managed to hold off 500 bloodthirsty villains for about 5 minutes. It was a feat to be remembered. Now, I flew above the bridge, the villains were advancing, pushing the blockade further and further towards the city. Raising my palms, I started raining down light rays in the villain-filled bridge, all notion of holding back was lost I saw the state of the heroes. Every ray of light that hit the ground exploded, making the bridge tremble slightly. I landed in front of the barricade. Cape facing the cameras. A tired endeavor came near me. Finally some backup. He said in a gruff tone. You should take a break, you've done enough already. Even with all of his family life, just his feet today made it enough for me to respect him. I can still go. Do you think you can take them on by yourself? He sneered a bit. I'll just keep them occupied while you guys rest. These weren't thugs, these were all dangerous villains, a lot were stronger than Overhaul. I wasn't in any danger, but I wasn't going to let all any of them escape this place. Endeavor just nodded reluctantly, he took a lot of damage, even if he wanted to help he was quite done at this point. Like all the heroes present, he needed rest. Then we both heard a loud crash, the bridge shaking again. Have no fear, I am here. It was obviously All Might. Things were heating up. When Endeavor saw All Might he seemed to magically recover. All of his fatigue replaced by determination. It seems we have even more backup. I said lazily while Endeavor nodded solemnly. Standing there, I could see some of the villains cowering at the sight of All Might. There isn't much to say about his influence on villains, he's still the NR, hero after all. Both me and Endeavor walked to his sides. Neither one of us willing to just look at his back during this fight. Endeavor wasn't in good shape, but he could provide cover fire for All Might. Glad to see you drop by All Might. I said, with the same lazy smile on my face. Most of the villains and heroes that heard me looked at me weirdly. My attitude didn't match the situation at all. The villains took it personally, thinking that I wasn't taking them seriously at all. While All Might just had a wry smile on his face. With a sigh, he said. You should really be more serious young Alan. I just shrugged at his comment, while Endeavor scoffed a bit. Neither of you seems concerned, but this fight needs to end quickly. Yep, even if he didn't say that, All Might doesn't have all day. While I could take care of this myself it would be very annoying. Who knows what type of quirks can be found in an army of highly dangerous villains. Endeavor, you should provide cover fire for now. Endeavor looked displeased at my suggestion, but he already knew that he wouldn't be much help in his current state. All Might. 
I caught his attention for a second. Are fatalities acceptable? He didn't like the notion, but he still nodded. This wasn't the time to hold back, even one of those guys can cause a lot of trouble if they escaped. After seeing All Might's response I looked at the villains. Most of them came to a standstill after the hulking symbol of peace appeared. I think I will thin this crowd a bit. Saying that I quickly put my hands on the ground, digging a network of lights underneath the villains at light speed. As quickly as that, countless spikes made out of solid light rose from the ground, many villains were impaled. A lot of them took injuries, I had basically covered that entire part of the bridge with spikes. It was an attack that covered a vast range. Therefore it took a bit of stamina to pull off. I think it managed to take out at least half of the villains, the weaker half. Unfortunately, the stronger people either dodged or braved through losing a limb. Looking back I could see a stunned group of heroes, with All Might gaining a surprised look. Well, what are we waiting for? My words took them out of their stupor, most people already knew of my strength. This display shouldn't have come off as a surprise. But my attitude made people unconsciously look down on me. I liked doing that, looking at the look on their faces when I eventually get serious. Among the people that escaped were a few familiar faces. Overhaul and some of his lackeys were attempting to escape as well. Overhaul now had two hands, I can only guess that he took one from a guard and fused it with himself. Just as he was about to put his hands on the ground. I shot a beam of light through his head. Fighting him on a bridge would be annoying for most heroes, I didn't want to give him the chance to take out anyone. His lackeys just trembled a bit, there wasn't anything they could have done. There was also Muscular, an old friend. Right in front of me. Muscular, old pal. How come you aren't happy to see me? I said, completely losing any semblance of my previous serious visage. He just gritted his teeth and started enlarging his muscles. He was so tunnel-visioned on me that he failed to see the symbol of peace moving in. Completely smashing his way into the remaining hordes of villains. Right behind him was Endeavor, disregarding his injuries and burning through every villain in front of him. Completely disregarding safety regulations. The metal chores holding up the bridge were looking a bit melted. But they were still holding up, Endeavor was also regulating his heat to not melt them completely. Looking at them made me smirk. To think I'd get a chance to fight side by side with the strongest heroes of the older generations. Smiling widely, I covered my hands and feet in my poor man's armament and joined in on the fun. Can't let you old timers hog all the fun. Using my greatest speed, every hit of mine created shockwaves through the villains unfortunate enough to get targeted by me. Endeavor grinned at my words and said. Watch your mouth kid. It seems I have made a decent first impression on him. All Might just shook his head, his smile turning a bit weird again, while the shockwaves from his fists sent villains flying backwards. I could see a few of the villains trying to jump above us and across the bridge, with Hawks out of the fight they probably thought this was the perfect opportunity. And just as I was about to shoot them down a rain of red feathers swooped in and pierced through most of them. Looking back, I could see Hawks and a few of the heroes managed to recover. Hawks taking back into the air and giving us support. As I was looking back a villain with the ability to turn his fingers into sharp steel wires took that chance to slice in my direction. I didn't even bother blocking, as a stream of fire toasted both him and his quirk. I just smirked, shooting a laser through the villain about to hit him as payback. The laser went through the villain's chest and into a crowd behind him, exploding them and throwing them away. The bridge was rattling a lot. All three of us needed to hold back as to not wreck the bridge. Even injured, Endeavor proved to still be a great threat to all of the villains present. So they had an idea, concentrate on him and quickly take him down. Then they can attempt to escape. Looking at the villains charging him, he only scoffed. As I and All Might rushed in and protected his back and sides, while he blasted everything that moved in front of him. He was almost passing out at this point. His fight had gone on longer than ours after all. But it was almost over at this point. Their desperate attack on Endeavor left them weak and undefended, a flaw that neither me nor All Might are planning to ignore. My fists coated in light crushing down into the torso of one of the last villains, while All Might punched out one of the more resilient ones. Looking around, it was a scene of carnage. But it was also one where the heroes won. After finishing the last of the villains, we started looking around, making sure all of them were dealt with. 
Endeavor finally took a break and sat on the ground. He had cauterized his own wounds so that the bleeding wouldn't trouble him. All Might also took a break, sitting on the ground a bit. He needed to go soon, his timer thankfully wasn't done yet. They were both somewhat tired, to lighten the mood I said. Well, I think I got the most dash, not even managing to finish the sentence, I got interrupted. No way a kid managed to take down more villains than me. Endeavor said, his energy restored magically. All Might didn't even bother humoring me. I just shrugged. All Might looked around a bit. The cameras were focused on us. All three of us stood up, I supported Endeavor since he was barely moving at this point. He didn't really thank me or anything, just snorted a bit. He didn't have any strength left to push me away though. We started walking back towards the barricade previously formed by the heroes and the police. We could hear the cheers in the distance. A crowd of onlookers gathered at the city end of the bridge. Coming in our direction. Since the situation was already diffused, we figured there shouldn't be any problem letting them near the barricade. I think they arrived at the same time as All Might. I let him handle the press, he is the biggest star here. Although a few reporters tried to stop me and Endeavor for an interview. To which the latter just growled and scared them away. Geez, these people really don't want you to reach an ambulance. He just looked at me. I just put the injured Endeavor on my shoulder and jumped over the crowd and in front of an ambulance. The paramedics quickly taking out a stretcher. I could hear him cursing in my general direction as the ambulance rolled away. With that done, I turned to the civilians, a lot were still concentrated on All Might. A few of them had turned and taken photos of me and of the NR, hero. Jumping back onto the bridge, my perception managed to catch some movement, one of the villains was just pretending to be knocked out. I don't recognize this villain, I think he was taken out of the fight when I first arrived. I could see him now, standing up and looking around himself with fear on his visage. All Might quickly turned around, even if he was already reaching his limits taking down one villain wouldn't be that hard. The villain faced the left side of the bridge and rose his hands. In the distance, I could see a huge wave forming, the villain in question bleeding from all orifices. A giant tsunami was moving toward us, the bridge and the people on it were just looking on, terrified. It was at least 700 meters tall, and it covered the whole bridge and the entirety of Tartaros. All Might didn't have any energy left to deal with something this big. He looked on, in shock. He wasn't letting the fear show on his face. But I'm not really planning on sitting and doing nothing. Thankfully the wave wasn't directed at the city, otherwise, this would have been even worse. A wave this big can't really be blown away easily, the best choice I have right now is to form a shield around the bridge. Everyone, stay near the barricade. My voice was definitely heard, but the people were panicking a lot, not everyone did as asked. I quickly rose tentacles out of the ground and dragged everyone near the makeshift barricade. I made sure to catch everyone. I, however, didn't have time to worry about the villains. The tsunami was fast approaching. As soon as I gathered everyone around me I quickly created a multi-layered sphere of light that surrounded everybody. It also went underneath the bridge. I am positive the bridge won't hold at all in this situation. All Might was also inside. Looking at me with a serious expression, his smile all but gone. Young Alan, will it hold? I didn't have much time to reply. I created chains of light that rooted themselves on the surfaces around us. Including the bottom of the sea underneath us. I also suspended us in the air using deeply rooted pillars of light. And just like that, looking around myself, I shouted, brace for impact dash, the second I said those words the wave engulfed the barrier. The people inside could hear loud crashing sounds. All Might could hear the first layers of the barrier cracking under the weight of the tsunami. But he wasn't able to do anything, limited by both his injuries and tiredness. He just clenched his fists and hoped for the best. At the end of the day, both All Might and I could have escaped this easily. We just needed to run into the city. But we weren't going to just leave all the injured heroes and civilians here. I could see a lot of the civilians trembling as the crack started showing on the barrier. The bridge underneath us was already destroyed. All that was holding us up was the numerous pillars of light from before. When I felt the wave pass I quickly let the barrier down. It was too tiring to hold on to. All of my energy was already expended. 
I was grasping as I held up the suspended part of the bridge in the air. All Might finally showed a relieved smile, as soon as I took the barrier down both he and Hawk started quickly carrying everyone off the platform. In a few minutes, they managed to transport everyone to the city. After seeing everyone off, I quickly took off flying in their direction. The platform behind me falling into the water, as the light pillars holding it up dispersed. This was a stupidly exhausting move if I had awakened my fruit the situation would have been so much easier. As I landed near the city. I was greeted by deafening cheers. And the symbol of peace coming near me. Great job, young Alan. Can you still move? He said in a concerned tone. Yeah, I'm fine. Just exhausted. After that, the smile returned to his face. As I took a few deep breaths and regained my lazy demeanor. I don't know the state of most of the villains that were on that bridge. But most of them were likely dead. But, I did my job as a hero. Protected the people that I needed to. Hope you enjoyed it, too we'll be trying to make more advanced chapters on Patreon in the next few days. Here's the plug, https, slash www.patra.en.com slash veganmaster there wasn't much to say besides that we weren't expecting that. Thankfully most of the seriously injured heroes were carried off before the tsunami ever appeared. It couldn't really be counted as a mistake on the hero's side, in a fight of this size, it's impossible to keep track of everything and everyone. But, it might be my fault, with my speed I could easily reach him the moment he so much as twitched. But I wanted to see what he was going to do. As for the person responsible for the tsunami, they were likely dead. After a few days, bodies will likely start washing ashore. Scaring some people and probably traumatized a few. But there will definitely be bodies belonging to the villains we fought today. Usually drowning is one of the most excruciating ways to die, filling your lungs fill with water and being unable to do anything about it. For most of them, it was painless. Most of the people were already unconscious at the time of death. It's unknown just what led to this mass breakout. Indeed, the once impenetrable prison was lately stacked with villains, but its defenses were top-notch. Right now, there is no survivor left from the guards working at Tartaros, even if they survived the villain rampage they couldn't have survived the tsunami. The prison itself wasn't destroyed by the overgrown wave. But the insides were flooded. It would take a while before the maximum security prison would be operational again. And after this incident, there will be many reforms to that prison. The people at the top didn't take lightly to this loss of life. They may not care much about the villains, but the guards were all productive members of society. And if we didn't manage to stop the villains from getting into the city they would have no doubt gone back to ruining everything our society holds dear. The quirk that affected the defenses so heavily is speculated to belong to the last inmates sent into the prison. On paper, their quirk allowed them to manipulate a certain frequency that they also emit. But apparently, there was a lot more to that quirk than meets the eye. He managed to affect everything in the prison at once. It just shows, that in a world of quirks, there is bound to be one that can render the defenses of Tartarus useless. It's what motivates us to improve our systems. For me, this situation was an eye-opener. It reminded me just how unpredictable quirks can be. And it also reminded me that I need to grow stronger. I may have lied a bit when All Might asked me if I was doing okay. At that time I could barely stay on my feet. But I didn't want to look weak in front of the people I had saved. Right now, I am standing on the edge of the broken bridge, I could feel the things around me, but I had turned off my perception. I could feel even the people behind me, going to their homes. I suddenly felt the urge to pull at the lights around me. I could see them moving as I pulled onto them. The light becoming more and more powerful. I started controlling the light around me. In my excitement, I had forgotten about my exhaustion. All Might was looking at me with an odd expression. All Might was likely able to tell that my last move was extremely taxing, right now he was probably assessing the situation. As the people that were leaving turned around. They looked on, the lights dancing around, almost as if of their own volition. I could only recognize this as a fruit awakening. I had never seen an awakened Logia before. But from what I understand, awakening differs from fruit to fruit. Even when fruits are of the same category, they might have different ways of awakening. In my case, I seem to have gained the ability to feel all of the light around me and control it. This strengthened my perception by a lot. 
In the past, I was stuck to a certain speed mostly due to my perception not being able to keep up with the speed of light. While I could go up to the speed of light, I would not be able to control it whatsoever. Now, my perception was strengthened greatly, it meant that now I could reach even greater speeds, and also control them. In the past, I couldn't even control myself when going at a quarter of the speed of light. Now I think I can even go at half of that without any issue. Young Alan, you should take a break. All Might said, patting me on my back and breaking me out of my stupor. This brought me back to reality. My legs were starting to give. But All Might was holding me up. Making me look perfectly fine in the eyes of the crowd. Yellow Flash, could we get an interview? A reporter asked excitedly. We should get going for now. Crime does not wait. Saying that, All Might jumped, dragging me with him and going at full speed to UA. After a few minutes, we landed at the gates of UA, he started steaming. Thank you All Might, I'll take a cab from here. He just nodded reluctantly, not having time to stand in that form any longer. He quickly dashed off, pretending to go somewhere else. I just entered a taxi and gave the driver Rumi's address. When reaching home, I was already almost falling asleep. My home is Rumi's house of course. Which meant that meeting her here wasn't surprising. What was surprising was the concern she was showing me. And the crushing hug I received upon entering the door. She should know better than to worry for me at this point. But it still warms my heart. Sorry for making you worry. My voice coming out as more of a whisper. Shut up. She said, not letting go of me at all. And in the warmth of her arms, I fell asleep. I had a long day, I just got to writing one chap's ray for the wait, hope you enjoyed today's stuff. The awakening just felt right to put here. Update, forgot about the plug, https, slash www.patcher.ian.com slash veganmaster, POV narration, while the heroes were resting and the public was starting to witness the feats that the heroes managed to pull off that day. Someone was having a different reaction to this whole affair. In a poorly lit warehouse in the Kamino district, laying on a table with various tubes coming in and out of his body, was a person that could only be described as sickly. All for one stood there, after seeing the events that transpired he was quite disappointed. The person he had sent there was the very first successful Nomo prototype. The Nomo's body had miraculously adapted two quirks and managed to retain a bit of consciousness. One quirk could control and release different frequencies and waves, and the other was a simple power amplification quirk. They had somehow resonated with each other. Turning into a power that seemed impressive to the supervillain. While they were in his body they couldn't merge like that, no matter how much he tried. Kyudai Garaki did the experiment on a mass murderer. It had been their first success, mainly because they didn't force any more quirks into him. The prototype had been sent to free someone from Tartaros, a person that had a quirk all for one was interested in. It was the former leader of the Yakuza and the Shai Hasaikai, a person named Kai Chisaki. All for one had only heard about this person after he had been incarcerated. They didn't even get to make themselves known properly in the underworld. In the eyes of many, they were an incompetent group. But to all for one, that person's quirk was interesting, capable of manipulating matter. He had big plans for such a powerful quirk. Healing himself was one such plan. If he could go back to his peak then he wouldn't have anything to fear. He also wouldn't have to worry about rushing his successor into the public eye. There was also the matter of that young new hero. Being titled the world's youngest hero, he was also one of the strongest in Japan. He had his doubts about the reports he received on the yellow flash. But after having his most trusted subordinate watch all of the footage he couldn't help but be impressed. Such a person might become a problem later, it is better that he found a way to deal with that light quirk of his. Another thing he didn't expect was that quirk he gave to the Nomu would be amplified to that extent. Although it had likely killed the Nomu. If it were used in tandem with a super regeneration quirk, it would have made for a great subordinate. Unfortunately, that attack couldn't take out the heroes, as the yellow flash proved the extensive mastery he had over his own quirk. But in the end, the yellow flash's strength would just become another quirk in all for one's body. Or so the villain thought. Now, the villain saw a great opportunity in the way the situation was handled. It was a chance for him to undermine the presence of the heroes present. 
he started calling his associates, preparing something scandalous. And while the villain was contemplating, the media was complaining. A few reporters and news stations weren't at all pleased by how the situation was handled. And with a slight push from an unknown source, they started releasing articles that showed the heroes in a bad light, hee <laughs> hee. Articles like, Heroes Massacre Villains on the Bridge Leading to Tartaros. And, Villains Murdered by the Tsunami While the Heroes Stood and Watched. It was media manipulation at its best, but unfortunately, the loudest voices belonged to the most susceptible people. And they started voicing their opinions online and on the streets. There weren't any protests, just gatherings and sharing this misinformation. This made public opinion split on the matter, as there were a lot of people who hadn't seen the initial report and only read the newer ones. The Tartaros breakout became a subject of indignation for many. And the people defending it grew less and less each day. Even the people that were saved that day had their voices grow lower and lower in volume as they were harassed by the people fully believing in the rights of those bloodthirsty villains. The police force contacted as many people as possible, hoping to repair the quickly descending public opinion. But they had acted a bit too late, people already started to hate the heroes that were present there. Most of the hate centering on two heroes. Endeavor and the yellow flash, as the footage of the fight reached the masses, seeing them burn through villains was horrifying for those villains' right activists. However, the two still had their rankings on the hero billboard chart. With the number of cases they had amassed was it was impossible to erase them, as the yellow flash reached the NR spot on the charts as soon as this event went public. As for the symbol of peace, people didn't show him any hate, as he was too well-liked for that. Anyone attempting to show any hate to him would be scrutinized. Unfortunately for the people, neither Alan or Endeavor cared much for public opinion. Their attacks proved ineffective, as the two just shrugged them off and continued with their lives. The situation turned for the worse just after three days of appearing in the public eye. Usually, if there is such a negative response on a hero operation the government would get involved. But this time was special. The two that received the most hatred held back the most villains on that day. Making the people above reluctant to do anything to them. As things stood now, public opinion wouldn't change back quickly. When opening my eyes, I could see a familiar ceiling. It was dark, there was a faint whitish light coming from the window, it was still night. I didn't get up, I could feel some weight on my body. Looking down I could see little Airy just sleeping on my chest. Rumi was also using my arm as a pillow. This is the first time all three of us sleep together. It's kind of nice honestly. Seeing as how I wouldn't be able to extract myself out of that situation without waking them up I did the next best thing. Closing my eyes I fell right back asleep. After all, how could I stay awake in this situation? The next morning was different, both of them woke up before me. Leaving the room a bit empty for my taste. Going into the kitchen I could see Rumi cooking something up. Hey, what's for breakfast? I said while rubbing the sleep off my face. She turned, looked at me scornfully and said. You've been out for four days and that's the first thing you say. I had already assumed I had been sleeping for a while, awakening my fruit and using it while in that state might not have been a really good idea. Well, sorry for worrying you. How come you didn't take me to a hospital or something? I was genuinely curious. I was expecting to wake up in a ward or something, although I only needed rest my condition was a bit odd. I just assumed you'd wake up sometime this week. If you didn't I would have called an ambulance or something. She probably assumed that with my strength getting injured would be difficult. Therefore she just let me rest for a while. That's nice, how about breakfast? She just looked at me like I was an idiot. Steamed rice and miso soup. She then gestured for me to sit down. Since Ari isn't where she should be at school already. Without me bringing her Aizawa should have been tasked to be her chauffeur, even more work for him. By the way, public opinion on you is going down the shitter. I just snapped my head at her. She just smirked and looked at my reaction. What? I had just helped suppress the biggest prison breakout in Japan and saved countless lives. What do you mean? She then brought my laptop and put it on the table. On it, I could see countless threads of people advocating for villain rights. Oh, so they're just idiots. Nothing to worry about. Even if they call for my impeachment the government still needs strong heroes. 
it seems both endeavor and I got the short end of the stick. Oh well, can't please them all. Next time a supervillain tries to destroy the city I might just let him. As much as that thought put a smile on my face, there were still people that fully supported both me and Endeavor. Public opinion was as split as it can be. The government clearly supports us anyway. I could see in an email that I had to go to the police force and receive a medal. They also transferred a massive sum of money into the accounts of all the heroes present that day. With me, All Might and Endeavor getting the biggest share. You can clearly see that they appreciated our actions that day. No matter how drastic they might have been. Rumi just looked on at me as I scrolled through the comments. Quite a stupid argument right? She seemed amused by my problem. The only reason she isn't concerned is that she knows how little public opinion matters to me at this point. Oh well, looks like I'm the new big baddie of the week. She just laughed at my sarcastic comment. I could also see some messages from All Might, apologizing for the situation, even though it wasn't his fault, he probably felt guilty because he's the only one that didn't get any flack. Seems All Might is doing mighty fine. She looked at me, eyes filled with scorn, again. Why are you making dad jokes? You're sixteen year old. That hit home. But two can play at that game. Well, since we've adopted Aerie I obviously became a father. Slipping in the fact that we're basically married at this point seemed to embarrass her a bit. She quickly changed the subject. By the way, I called Nizu and told him about your condition. Figured as much, he'll probably make me work overtime for a while. Even though we were in the summer break, the school staff still had work to do, including me. Summer break at hero schools is usually used for training camps anyway. And I've already missed the start of the first year training camp. That sounds like a, you problem. Right back to giving me sass huh? She didn't give me much time to respond as she pushed me out the door. Alright, you've been lazing around the house for long enough. As she pushed me out the door. Go to work. She said right before slamming the door in my face. I stood there for a minute, the lazy smile on my face still present. I could feel her looking into the peephole. After staying like that for a while she gave in. Opening the door and giving me a peck on the cheek. Alright, I'm off. Were my next words, as I took off flying to UA. POV Rumi, one this was a stressful four days for me. Having to watch him sleep and question how long it would take him to wake up. Seeing him up and about made me smile a bit. Even with all the fatigue that had accumulated the past few days. The way things developed in the past few days was infuriating for me. Nizu was just as mad as I was. I've been talking to Alan's boss since day one. Keeping him posted on his condition. I could tell that he was growing more and more annoyed by the way some of the public was responding to the hero's actions. Things could have been worse. At least the government wouldn't throw them under the bus. Having to kiss Alan on the cheek was a bit embarrassing. It made my ears flop down a bit. Now that I think about it. Didn't that bastard owe me a date? As soon as I started flying I reached the gates of UA. Thinking back on the reaction Rumi had when seeing me awake was nice. There's also the fact that we had slept together. I think that if I don't ask her on a proper date in the next few days she will crush my head into the front door. As I enter the gates I could sense some gazes peering into my back. There were a few people taking photos with their phones and whispering to each other. Even with all of my time spent as a famous hero. It still felt off to be recognized on the streets and talked about in hushed voices. Oh well, I had to talk to the principal now. Staying here and pondering won't help me with anything. Walking through the empty hallways at UA felt weird. I was so used to this place being packed full of students that I had forgotten how large the corridors actually are. In a classroom, I could feel a few unfortunate souls studying for their summer exams. Three of the people there were really familiar to me. It must be the unfortunate big three. Looking through the window and watching them study with tears in their eyes was a bit satisfying. The fact that Mirio noticed me and the mocking grin on my face only made things funnier. Tamaki was just slumped on his chair, looking on as Mirio dug his fingers into his table a bit and gritted his teeth. This also caught Nijire's attention, she had a huge smile on her face as she waved her hand excitedly in my direction. At this point, even Present Mike noticed that someone was disrupting his class. 
looking at the door he just said. Alan, please stop laughing at them. That was my cue to leave. Mike and the others realized that I was a big part of the reason why their students flunked a few classes. They couldn't really punish me either, not like I was being paid at UA. A month back I had officially become a combat instructor. Having my own classes without the need of supervision from other staff, besides medical. The title gave me some leeway in how I handled students. As I reached the end of the hallway I could feel that the teachers were in a meeting. Nizu was probably explaining something to them. The room seemed a bit gloomy, I put on my game face and prepared for action. But I was never one to take these meetings seriously, loudly opening the door and saying in a rapid voice. Hello everybody, did you miss me? The teachers just stared at me, with Snipe clearing his throat and Aizawa just staring at me with his dead eyes. Midnight seemed the only person excited to see me, while she was always excited, not in a good way usually. Nizu was the first to respond. Alan. So nice of you to drop by your place of work from time to time. Straight to taking jabs at my four days of sleep huh? I wish you didn't come back. Aizawa grumbled in a low voice. Nice to see you too sleep bag. I wasn't one to ignore such disrespect, at least not from him. Lunch Rush also said. I wondered why you stopped dropping by. I looked at him with stars in my eyes. No joke, I made my eyes shine. I also missed your food, teacher. This seemed to annoy Lunch Rush a bit. He was the only person besides Nizu that I used an honorific with. I claimed he was my teacher because I spent a lot of time at the canteen. At some point, I wanted to learn how to cook. He never agreed to teach me anything, all he did was smash my head with a pan every time I got too close to his kitchen. Guys we were talking about something important. Toshinori said, somewhat exasperated at how quick I turned the gloomy atmosphere in the room into a confusing one. Toshi seemed a bit guilty when seeing me. Seriously, how did this guy ever manage to hide his identity from anyone? After looking for a while at the room filled with chatter Nizu decided to interrupt us. I'm sure you are somewhat aware of what transpired during your sleep. I just nodded, the situation was weird, I could see some of the teachers looking down a bit. No one was pleased with the recent events. On one hand, I had gained a lot of fans. On the other, I now was one of the most hated heroes. We think the outburst might not have been natural. Some tabloids show signs of tampering, a few studios even received donations before publishing negative articles about you and Endeavor. Figured as much, the media wouldn't brazenly choose to paint heroes badly in that situation. Even when we killed a few villains on the bridge it wouldn't have been so bad. What made things worse was me not bothering to save the villains from their certain demise. People just assume I had energy to spare for some reason. I guess trying to appear strong in front of the masses afterwards wasn't such a great idea after all. Do we know who made these donations? This was no longer about my public opinion, someone was trying to undermine heroes in general. Unfortunately for him the dirt only stuck to me and the NR hero. But even that was enough to make people question other heroes. I might have a hunch as to who was responsible for this. All of them were anonymous. We are currently trying to find out who might have had ulterior motives. After a few more questions the meeting was over. Nizu turned to me and said. You should go to the police to get your tracking device removed. It's part of your reward for protecting the people on that bridge. That news put a smile on my face. They didn't need to worry about me becoming a villain anymore. I was the NR, hero now. I managed to push Hawks into the fourth place, I'm sure he was disappointed about that. But I also took his title of youngest hero to reach top 10. Heck, I might be the youngest pro hero in the entire world. Don't fact check me on that though. For now, I have more important things to do. Like planning my date with Rumi. Hey, I haven't died yet. Unfortunately, hope you enjoyed today's chap. I have to study now. If I manage to find the motivation, which is unlikely, plug, https slash www.patra.ian.com slash vegan master as the people were starting to leave the meeting room I quickly said. Wait dash everyone looked at me in wonder. I believe they hadn't seen me this serious before. Even present Mike looked surprised. He had just returned from his checkup on the summer class. What happened? 
Even Nizu was intrigued. I urged everyone to take a seat. They did so curiously. I have an important request to make of you. Even Aizawa's back straightened out, he didn't enjoy my company. But he valued me as a colleague. I never asked for anything, this made them feel something serious was coming up. Looking around the room, my tone set a severe atmosphere. They looked on expectantly. Snipe could be seen waiting and tapping his finger on the table, while Cementos gave me a weird look. Majima didn't give much of a reaction, I had asked him for things in the past after all. But to everyone else, this was new. I plan on borrowing the canteen for a romantic date with Rumi, Nizu smirked a bit. In the room, I could hear a bang. As soon as I said that Tashinori banged his head on the table. Midnight released a squeal that I can only describe as sensual. Lunch Rush just shrugged, he likely found this situation entertaining enough to remain seated. Since it also concerned his part of the building it was also important that he remained. Snipe took out his gun and shoot me in the head with a rubber bullet. I quickly hardened some light around my forehead as the bullet touched it. It looked like it bounced off my forehead, not even phasing me. But it hit Cementos, who got up and just left the room, followed by Aizawa who didn't even bother to gaze in my general direction anymore. Majima just started mumbling something about couples. Huh? What's wrong? I said scratching my head. Toshi just sighed and shook his head. Nizu seemed like he was having fun. Only he and Midnight seemed to enjoy this topic. As Toshi just slumped in his chair. Snipe huffed and sat back down. He was still a nice person, always willing to help out a colleague. So, what's your plan exactly? It's the first time I've heard this type of request from an employee. Nizu's smile was still present, but his sentence had a weird undertone at the end. Did he forget I'm basically doing charity work here? I plan on having dinner there. I'll clean up the tables and stack them elsewhere dash, midnight was the one to interrupt me with a toothy grin. I can arrange some decor, I'll make sure to make it tasteful. Her smile was creeping me out. Thankfully Snipe came in and saved the day. I'll help keep her in check. He was a true hero. Ectoplasm also offered to help put up the decor, since he can just use his clones for the handy work. Recovery Girl also chimed in, I'll just take care of Aerie while you guys are having fun. She probably just wanted to spend more time with Aerie. Still, my smile got wider. I also hope on somehow closing the blinds on those huge windows. I hope Majima could help here. I said looking at the man, he silently looked back. Mike quickly came behind the unwilling participant and patted him on the back. Of course we will, right, Majima? At this point, he was just being peer pressured to help. So he just nodded at me with a hateful expression under his face mask. Great, thank you, guys dash, I simply said. The smile on my face was getting almost as big as All Might's. My last request. Teacher. Please cook for me on my date. I took a perfect bow at a 90 degree angle. This was another skill I had picked up as a corporate rat. Lunch Rush just said. What? Did you expect me to leave my kitchen in your hands? His tone was one of mock anger. Smiling I thanked him politely. The others looked flabbergasted, the only thought in their mind is, why didn't he also ask us nicely? Toshinori was also an observer in this date debacle. I suddenly look at him, I just remember, there was never any Mrs. Might in the show. Thinking on it, the guy was likely too engrossed in his job or something. But that didn't stop me from saying. You should also try to go on a date from time to time Toshi. It looked like I teleported to his side and put my hand around his shoulder. You should put your chiseled jawline to work and score something too. I could barely hold a straight face as these words came out of my mouth. He was agape, most of the room sweat dropped while Midnight laughed out loud. The others just looked at their skinny colleague in pity. Nizu looked on as if he was witnessing a show. He had just been watching this from the beginning, probably curious about what my brain could excrete on the planning board. But he was still my boss and the principal of the school. I plan on having the date tomorrow. What do you think, boss? I only ever used the honorific with him when I was sucking up to him. This was similar in nature. Sure, you can use the canteen. But you will be responsible for putting everything back in place. I just nodded. 
It's normal for one to clean up after himself. And just like that, we got to work, devising the best date venue we could. Thirteen also ended up doing something, she helped Snipe hold Midnight's weirdness in check. She also added a bit of class to the room. By the end, the walls were decorated nicely. A small table for two was in the middle. It looked almost regal, it also cost me a lot. I obviously paid for everything in here. The table and chairs were gold-plated for fuck's sake. From the entrance to the table, there was a dark red carpet. Again it was really fluffy and nice. The glasses were gold-tinted, again. I'm sure I gave them a budget, they seem not to care much about it, unfortunately. It's not like I lacked the money, just my last payout for the bridge situation could cover all of this and more. I was still reluctant about seeing the price of the stuff they purchased. The only thing I didn't pay for was labor. That will never happen. After a long day of work, the canteen was ready. Now all I needed to do was bring Airy home and extend the invitation for tomorrow. As I was about to leave the canteen snipe stopped me. You do realize that when you're back to work you're going to owe each of us a favor right? I just rolled my eyes. These guys obviously had nothing better to do. It was summer break and most villains in the area were too scared to act. If they didn't help me they would just be lazing around, like Aizawa would if he didn't have to be present for Aries training. But, as much as I joked around, I was honestly grateful for all of their help. Ever since I came here they had all been trying to make life a bit easier for me. Every one of them took my situation very seriously. After getting to know me a bit better, they realized that my age wasn't very important. Unlike most teenagers, I wasn't bothered by anything happening around me. That was mostly because I'm not actually a teenager, but they don't know that. To them, I'm a child that matured early due to his circumstances. They decided to treat me as an equal. Therefore, even before this, I would have helped them without owing them a favor. Now I genuinely considered them friends. Even Midnight. Behind all of her weirdness, I know she always means well. Sure, but keep in mind that I'll be a student this year. The only reason I'd be attending the general course is to get a high school diploma. I would try to graduate early, but then I'd have to work more. Snipe nodded, just looked at me scornfully. Majima just shook his head and left. As a student, I can always use the studying excuse when I don't feel like doing something at UA. Heh, that favor will remain untouched for a long time. After that quick exchange, I waved goodbye to my unpaid workers, friends, and continued to one of UA's facilities. Eri was practicing her quirk on fish, just like in the story. Aizawa was in his sleeping bag in a corner just looking in her direction. He couldn't really do much besides giving her pointers and making sure her quirk didn't go haywire. Eri! Are you ready to head home? I completely ignored Aizawa. He also ignored me. Airy looked excited seeing me awake. Running and latched onto my shins, that was as far as she could reach. But I grabbed her and brought her up to my chest. She hugged me a bit and said. I'm glad you're awake big brother. Big sis was really worried about you. Well, at least Airy is more honest than Rumi. Airy wasn't calling us papa and mama. As cute as that would sound it would be a bit weird for Rumi to see Airy call me papa, at least for now. Rumi was also reluctant to be called a mother, she was still young after all. Sure, many people already had children at her age, but she simply wasn't that kind of person. The only reason she accepted Eri was that she was a bit moved by the little girl's cheerful attitude, especially after hearing her story. That and her liking me enough to not eject me out of her house after suggesting it. Sorry, I worried you too a bit, I said with a calming smile. I wasn't worried. I know Big Bro is strong. Her eyes were shining a lot when saying that. I could tell she was being honest. She really trusted me a lot, I could tell she was being honest. People were talking bad about you on the television. Big Sis got really angry. I just patted her head a bit. I hope she didn't hear anything weird from the news. Well, let's start going home. As I started to turn and leave Aerie suddenly perked up. Thank you Mr. Aizawa Dash, he just nodded and responded with a smile. Eri was a lot more polite than me. It was the first time in a while that I had seen the guy happy. Last time he was happy was when present Mike got chastised by Nizu for being too loud in a meeting. 
Oh well, I started walking, with Ari in one hand and the other on my chin. How should I approach this situation? She will likely accept any type of invitation at this point. But I didn't want this to be underwhelming. I also hope she won't try to kill me when she finds out the date will be held at a canteen. I mean, it doesn't sound sweet. But everyone worked hard at the end of the day. I started flying towards our home. Wait. Am I a squatter? I just realized I never paid Rumi any rent for basically living in her house. I'll worry about that later. Forming a protection screen out of light around Airy. I started flying at a manageable speed for her to enjoy the journey. I couldn't really use light speed when I was carrying someone. Usually, when moving at that speed my body turns into light automatically. If an actual human body were to be accelerated at that speed they would die instantly. Anything with mass would be destroyed actually. Reaching the front door still only took a few minutes. Ari thanked me for the ride and excitedly skipped in the house. I just followed her inside, hesitantly. As soon as I entered the atmosphere became strange, the smile on Rumi's lips became a bit strained. POV narration, Ari, took this as a cue to go to her room and play a bit with her toys. She was still happily skipping to her room. As soon as she closed the door, she could hear some screaming and some stuff breaking. She wasn't scared by this in any way. She just thought, big brother and big sister really get along well the smile never leaving her face. This wasn't the first time Alan took a beating for doing something wrong. While Rumi couldn't beat him in an actual spar, he couldn't really fight back when he was in the wrong. Running away would just make it worse in this case. He basically lived with her. So there I was, laying on the ground as Rumi Triangle choked my neck in between her thighs. Quite a few things were going through my mind right now. One of them wondering how an invitation to a romantic date could end up with me in this state. Usually, when she beats me up it's because I do something wrong. But this time I don't even know what got her so worked up. The only thing she said after little Airy went to her room was, you bastard. Then she proceeded to kick me into the wall, I let her blow off some steam. But my inaction only seemed to worsen the situation. As she quickly grabbed my arm and wrapped her legs around my head. She started applying pressure that I pretended to feel. I didn't want to make the situation weird by informing her that I was liking this. Dear, what did I do this time? My tone was slow and asking for forgiveness. My lazy personality only seemed to anger her. Where dot is dot my, date? With every word she applied even more pressure to my head, it was obvious that she was really pissed off. Rightfully so, I had postponed this a lot until today. But since she was only mad about this then I was in the clear. I slowly got up and used my free hand to dust myself a bit. She wasn't very startled by this, she had a pretty good idea of how strong I was. With a smile on my face, I said. Don't worry, I already plan to invite you out tomorrow. She looked surprised, her eyes widening a bit as a smile started forming on her face. This was one of the lamest ways to ask someone out, but the situation was kind of all over the place. It's my fault for postponing it this long. Very well. Where are we going? Saying so she calmed down. Unwrapping her legs from around my head and landing on the ground. Much to my disappointment, I hoped she would stay like that a bit longer. My hand was still grasped in hers. The only difference this time was that she was holding it lovingly, the smile on her face being even wider than usual. Okay, this might be even better. The location is a surprise obviously, I said, with a smug smile, I didn't want to ruin the atmosphere by saying that we're going to a high school canteen. Her smile was unchanged, it seemed that keeping it a surprise was a good idea. The location might not sound nice. But the atmosphere and decorations were better than most restaurants in this city. It was also a hell of a lot more expensive. I'll have to get here there blindfolded. And encase her in a sphere of light, just to not ruin the date by showing her where we were actually going. She was uncharacteristically giddy this whole time. Still refusing to let go of my hand. I'm so happy. I thought you didn't want to go anymore. She was tearing up, I didn't know my inaction would cause this type of reaction from her. It made me feel a bit guilty, especially since it was 100% my fault. Don't worry. I keep my promises. This was the time she let go of my hand. Only doing so because she started hugging me. 
I must say, her excitement and happiness is rubbing off on me. That night we both went to sleep with a smile on our faces. The very next day, I could sense her in her room, picking her dress dress. I quickly stopped sensing her room, I didn't want to spoil my surprise for later tonight. The day seemed to go so slowly. Going through my usual routine as quickly as I could, the only thing that changed was that I told Ari she was going to have a sleepover at Recovery Girl's place. Going to my room and dressing appropriately. Part of the date preparation yesterday was 13 chastising me for not having a proper tuxedo for the date. She proceeded to take my measurements and buy one for me. The color she chose was white. She said it went well with my hair or something. Looking at myself in the mirror I couldn't help but smirk. I was really lucky I had landed something with Rumi. I think I look really average compared to her. This tuxedo was really nice, it made me feel more classy. After getting changed it was already evening. The time had come, flying my way to her house was instant. I knocked on the door, mainly because it was customary for me to do so. At least by thirteenth words. When she opened the door all of my ability to think was gone. I had never seen her in a dress before. She was wearing a medium-length white dress. In her hand, she had a golden handheld purse that she clutched nervously. She was wearing heels, the first time I've seen her wear heels. She was also eyeing me up, looking surprised to see me dressed up so well. I was the first to speak, extending my hand in her direction. You look stunning tonight. The smile on my face was never more genuine. She blushed a bit. Thanking me and taking my hand. I flew us slowly, encasing us in a ball of light, I controlled the light to not be bright for her eyes. Why did she look so dreamy in this glow? We were silently holding hands the whole way over. When I reached the door I opened it using the light around it. I wasn't planning on telling her the location myself, she will notice anyway. As soon as we reached the carpet I uncovered us. She looked around excitedly, her eyes shining with joy. This place looks amazing. Where are we? I just smiled. Telling her at this point won't do much. She's already seen how this place looks. I might have asked Mizu to allow me to repurpose the canteen for tonight. My colleagues helped me decorate. Surprisingly, she was not at all disappointed when she heard where we were. You went this far for our date. Saying that her face was filled with what I can only describe as elation. It was cute, I think it's better for her not to know how little effort I was initially willing to put in this. We just got really caught up when decorating this place. Majima even made the blinds a deep red. Lining the carpet were countless roses. Yep, this room was where most of my reward for the Tartaro's breakout went. For dinner we had a menu created by Lunch Rush, all the dishes were themed on couples and would be prepared just for tonight. The date was going extremely well. Our efforts to make this place were not going noticed at all. At least I hope she is enjoying the experience, I hope. I've never actually been in a genuinely serious relationship before. A few flings were all I had. I think that was because I'm a bit afraid of opening up to people. But with Rumi it's different. It just comes naturally. And I think it's the same for her. POV Rumi, a lot of things happened in the last few weeks. I honestly forgot about the promise date. It feels embarrassing that I forgot something like that. I also felt really angry when thinking that he probably also forgot. At least I hoped he did. If he remembered and just didn't want to it would have been a lot worse. When he came home yesterday evening I might have overreacted with those thoughts in mind. Since I was uncharacteristically emotional I also got delighted when he actually extended the invitation. When he said we would go on a date I was expecting something more basic. He probably kept the location a secret as to not disappoint me. After all, if I heard that our first actual romantic date was being held in a high school canteen, I would have flipped. That might be why he waited for me to get here for the reveal. The room was beautiful, everything seemed new in this place. Everything, from the carpet to the feeling lights that gave off a faint violet glow. The red curtains and the matching tablecloth. The chairs, tables, eating utensils were all gold-lined around the edges. The pillars were adorned in what looked like red silk. Besides the untouched roses lining the carpet, there were petals scattered all around the room in even patterns. 
The amount of effort he went through to get a canteen turned into this would have been astronomical. He probably spent a lot of money on it. It makes me feel nice. Apparently, even someone as stupid as Alan has his moments. Since we've been taking care of Aerie together we don't have much free time. Because most of our free time away from home is either spent training or doing her work. This means that he took time off from work and training to do this for me. As much as I hate to admit it, it's heartwarming. Something annoying was the fact that my ears kept moving around, refusing to stay still. A lot of people out there don't really like mutation quirks. But I doubt that is an issue for someone as happy-go-lucky as Alan. I didn't even bother to hide my smile. I was happy from the moment he asked me on a date till now. It's quite obvious that neither of us has much experience, at least I don't. I've always concentrated on other things, a relationship simply seemed like a waste of time to me. I was never interested in romance before he showed up. I expected this to be a bit more awkward. But everything just comes naturally at this point. Maybe it's because we already live together. Or it's because we were already affectionate to some extent. The food was good enough to match the decor. It seems that Alan was not exaggerating when praising lunch rush. I think the saddest part about this date, is that it's coming to an end. POV Alan as much as I detested the idea. The date was almost over. We did everything, we talked, held hands, ate delicious food. Pranced around the room and admired the decor. She also seemed disappointed by this. It's almost as if neither of us wanted to leave this place. Lunch rush already left, leaving me with the keys to lock down the place. He obviously warned me not to touch even the smallest knife in his kitchen. We have been holding hands for a while now. Every piece of the decor was studied as the two of us tried to make this date last as long as possible. But, as the clock turned midnight we realized we had spent too much time there. Both of us had work tomorrow. If we spent more time here then we wouldn't be able to get much rest. Reluctantly, we started heading home. This time I made the barrier of light transparent. Slowly flying us over the city. The city lights weren't a new thing for a hero. But tonight everything seemed more beautiful. Rumi seemed to think the same. Her eyes glowed and looked on as her hand squeezed mine tightly. I wasn't one to let go of that chance. While Rumi was distracted I quickly leaned in and kissed her lips. Her eyes widened a bit as her ears perked up, but she soon closed her eyes and enjoyed the moment. Making the sphere around us opaque, and we started making out with fervor. Our hands started exploring each other's bodies. Meanwhile, my tongue made its way in between her lips and tangled her own. Her ears were starting to drop slightly to her sides, as her breathing became ragged. By the time we got home both of us were excited. I don't even remember how we got to her bed that quickly. But I do remember her dress coming off, seeing her beauty in its full splendor. This night was going to be a long one. Both of us got terribly excited by our date. It made us completely forget about any worries we might have had. Everything from age difference to how people would look at us. We let go of our inhibitions that night and did what we had been wanting to do for a long time now. But we might have gone a bit overboard. Both of us had strong physiques after all. Maybe we should have stopped when her bed broke down. Or when we ran out of protection. By the end, even with her stamina, Rumi was exhausted. She passed out peacefully. I couldn't really do anything but lay beside her either. As uncomfortable as sleeping on a bent bed should have been, I couldn't help but close my eyes for a second. The second they closed a ray of light hit my face. I could see the sun rising in the distance. It seems neither of us would get much rest in the end. When I woke up it was already 10 a.m. I was hugging Rumi close to me and looking to the alarm clock with hate. It didn't manage to wake us up at all. Upon further inspection it seemed a bit bent, I think one of us woke up and wasn't too pleased about it. Overall, I think I slept for about three or four hours. Now, I had to somehow wake up Rumi, she was latched onto my torso. I don't know what she's dreaming but she has a stupid smile on her face. Poking her cheek didn't seem to affect her. Neither did patting her back. I didn't want to do anything more forceful than that to her. At least not outside of training. I ended up having to slip from her grasp by turning myself into light. That seemed to wake her up, as she fumbled about grabbing at the bed and groggily got up. 
All I could do was smile, this was not the most comfortable place to sleep after last night. We needed to get a new bed for this room. Her eyes widened as she saw the clock, the amount of panic on her face was almost comical. Alan. Why didn't you wake me up? It seems that she regained her energy. She always has energy when it comes to arguing with me. I just woke up too. Also, when you get mad your ears stand up straight. It's cute. She just looked even madder. My attempt at flattery seemed ineffective. The only reaction it got was a slight blush. It's your fault for not getting tired. She said while huffing. It seems that she isn't as mad as she wants me to believe she is. Okay, I'm sorry. Although you didn't really mind it eth dash, a kick quickly came towards my temple. She didn't even let me finish teasing her. With a cheeky smile on my face, I easily dodged her attack. Using that opportunity to lean in and kiss her. She just paused, looking a bit flustered. I quickly left the room to take a shower. Both of us were already late for work. She had to go to her agency and I had to clean up the canteen. After quickly getting dressed I left for the kitchen. Quickly putting together two sandwiches and packing them. In that time Rumi also managed to get dressed. I quickly put one sandwich in a bag and handed it to her. We don't have time for breakfast. This will have to do. She just nodded and thanked me. I'll take you to your hero agency. She perked up at this. Usually, she just drives there. Great, we have time to discuss some boundaries then. Rumi probably wanted to talk more about our relationship. She seemed a bit gloomy for a second. As we got out of the house I grabbed her hand and squeezed it. The smile returning to her face. As I was flying us at a manageable speed she started speaking. Okay, we need to talk about this. She took a short pause. I let her continue. Today you might have left little Airy at a colleague's house. But you can't do that too often. I nodded, she probably wanted to say that we shouldn't do much when Airy is at home. Last night we were a bit loud after all. We didn't want the little girl walking in on us by mistake. Especially since she usually sneaks up and ends up sleeping with one of us every night. We will have to be discreet about things. Her face was red while talking. She avoided saying it directly. To hear a straightforward person like her stutter around embarrassedly was extremely cute. Don't worry. Discretion is my middle name. Hearing me say the most cheesy line possible seemed to not calm her at all. She looked at me with scorn. I sighed. Look, I know when to and when not to act affectionately. I won't just go around town making out with you. Hearing me say it so seriously seemed to please her. The rest of our short journey was mostly quiet. When reaching her agency I reluctantly let go of her hand. She gave me a quick peck on the cheek and left. After looking at her back for a few seconds I quickly flew to UA. I reached there almost instantly. Props to moving at light speed. Even with all of my speed, I am still late. My greatest enemy remains my poor time management skills. As I walked down the familiar hallways I couldn't help but reminisce about how I had reached this point. In the beginning, I thought I chose this world because of its relative safety. At least that was what I was telling myself. In the end, after living my last life as diligently as possible I wanted some action in this one. I didn't want to go to a battle-crazy universe, like One Piece or Dragon Ball. So I chose this world. Becoming a vigilante was just another way to pass time for me. It provided me with some release. I wasn't taking anything seriously. Until I got recorded for the first time. From then on, I started growing. A mistake proved to me that being carefree is never a good idea when doing hero work. That time it was just a camera. But what if someone dangerous ambushed me while I wasn't paying attention? It was these thoughts that woke me up to reality. Now, looking around, I have friends, a daughter, of sorts, and a, sometimes, loving girlfriend. During my pondering, I managed to reach the teacher's lounge. I could sense everyone in a meeting, again. After knocking I entered the room with a smile on my face. Good morning, everyone. They all just looked at me. Judging my very existence. You're late. To the first day after your short vacation. Nizu said, somewhat irritated. To be fair, 
I didn't get much sleep dash, I didn't get to finish. I could hear a loud squeal coming from midnight. While most people just sighed. I realized that they were all having grave expressions for some weird reason. So, what are we talking about? My lazy tone seemed to tick Aizawa off, again. Well, the meeting just started anyway. Take a seat. Saying that Nizu pressed a button and showed us a screen. On that screen, we could see the file of a person. Nizu started explaining, this was the person that tampered with the defensive systems in Tartaros. A silence took the room, I wasn't too surprised, it was the tsunami guy. The police managed to find his body yesterday apparently. He showed us a picture of it on a table. It was mostly intact, probably didn't get crushed by any debris from the bridge. During the autopsy, doctors managed to find an anomaly. This man had two quirk factors. He also showed signs of experimentation. He then showed us a chart of his DNA and compared it with that of a regular person. I could see Tashinori clenching his fists while the others looked surprised. To me, this wasn't really that surprising, it just meant that all for one wanted something from that prison. And since he didn't take the chance to attack us when we were weak. He's still not recovered enough to fight by himself. Is the only conclusion I can come to. The meeting ended shortly after. Since Nizu wasn't yet going to reveal the existence of the supervillain to everyone. Or maybe he just doesn't want me to know about it. Maybe that's why he was a bit angry when I entered uninvited. Oh well. If all for one gets too brazen then I might have to give up on my plan and just attack him head on, as much as I hate the idea. Right now, I have Eri to take care of. I also need to go and buy a new bed for Rumi. Now that I think about it. It's clear enough that Nizu doesn't want me to know about all for one. Since I was still young he probably thought that I would underestimate him and get my quirk stolen. After all, a villain with a quirk like mine could be the end of hero society as we know it. But not informing me at all is much worse. If I didn't know of his existence then he might ambush me and attempt to steal my quirk. Thankfully, I already know the threat he possesses. I am always on guard for any sneak attacks. I even set up traps around Rumi's home to alert me of intruders. Besides the fact that my perception covers around one kilometer around me subconsciously. The information I receive isn't perfect of course. I need to focus a certain location to actually view it in detail. Especially if it's out of sight. But any movement is felt in this radius. Some people might call me paranoid, but I wasn't afraid for myself. Back when I was alone I didn't care enough to take any precaution. Now that I had Eri and Rumi I want them to be safe. With these thoughts in mind, I reached the hallway leading up to my second favorite place in the world. The cafeteria. The first thing on my list of priorities was cleaning up the cafeteria. When reaching it I was sad to see that I had a lot of work to do. I had hoped Nizu would have Majima send some robots to deal with this. Maybe he just wanted this to be a form of punishment. Oh well, it counts as cleaning after myself, so I can't complain. I decided to take this as an opportunity to train. Quickly using the light around to create a few clones of myself. I tried to control the light to create the clones in my image perfectly. Several invisible strings of light connected me with my clones, making them solid. But I still had a lot of training to go through. Most of the clones had imperfections, some were a bit shorter, others taller, wider, and some were just uglier. I started making them move around the room, taking things slowly as they started picking things up and moving them in garbage bags. All of the roses and petals were quickly gathered and put in various bags. All of them were controlled by me. As I slowly got accustomed to making my constructs adopt human movements. I also repaired a lot of imperfections that existed in their appearance. While I made them carry everything out and bring in the cafeteria tables I also experimented a bit with invisibility. Since I had awakened my fruit I also gained the ability to refract the light around my body. After all, as long as the light doesn't touch me I am invisible to the naked eye. It's also how I kept the strings of solidified light hidden. At first, I made them transparent, but they were still somewhat noticeable. This gave me a few ideas for new abilities I can develop. The awakening of my powers gave me a multitude of new possibilities. Things I was struggling with before now seem just so much easier. For now, I should concentrate on finishing my work and getting airy. Reaching the infirmary I quickly knock on the door and enter the room. 
Inside I could see Aerie sitting on a bed. This was a free day from her training. This next year her training would slow down a bit. As I plan on actually enrolling her in a school. She already has a hang on how to stop her own quirk. Her control was slowly getting better and better. When she saw me coming in her face lit up a bit. Big brother dash, she immediately ran at me and hugged my shins, like usual. I picked her up once again, this time putting her on my shoulders as she squealed happily. I missed you and big sis Rumi. Hearing her say that made me think my paranoia might be a good thing to have. It helped protect Ari after all. Rumi didn't need my protection, she was strong enough to take care of herself. We missed you too. My lazy smile seemed to calm her excitement down a bit. But it didn't make her any less joyous. I hope she didn't cause much trouble, I said looking at recovery girl. She had been nice enough to take care of Ari. Without her, Rumi and I wouldn't really be able to have a date like this. Someone else might have taken Ari if I asked them. But Chio was really a good person to take care of her, they simply got along well. If I choose not to adopt little Ari, Chio would definitely have adopted her. The old lady in question just smiled. How could Ari be any trouble? You on the other hand. Just as she was about to start ranting about me I quickly made my way to the door. Thanks for taking care of Ari Dash Ari also waved goodbye to Chio as I ducked to get in the hallway. Our next stop was going to Hero Mart, yes I just wrote that, and buying a resistant double bed. I think we would sleep together from now on. Ari will most likely join us too. Both Ari and Rumi were important to me now. I swore to protect Ari. And even if Rumi can protect herself, I will always be there for her. When reaching our home we were still early. Now I made an unusual call. I looked up Endeavor's number on his site and found it easily. I called him for a bit, it took him a while to finally respond. What? This better be important. I'm training with my son. He sounded angry for some reason, nothing unusual there. Cool off Endeavor. When he heard my voice I could tell he was a bit surprised. He instantly recognized it, I used the same tone I had during the bridge incident. What do you want, brat? He was a lot calmer now. Although we weren't friends we were still acquaintances, I was no desperate fan or reporter. I was just wondering if your injuries were fine. This comment seemed to tick him off for some reason. Of course they are, as if a few cuts and bruises would put me down. I could tell he probably melted something in this short outburst. Probably his own patience. If that's all I will go back to my training. He seems to want to hurry and train Shoto. Oh well, don't train too hard. He just huffed and hung up the phone. The whole point of that call was to see whether or not he was affected by his decline in public opinion. Not really out of concern, more like curiosity. It felt almost like nothing even happened, the thought put a bit of a smile on my lips. I don't plan on befriending Endeavor, but I won't antagonize him either. At least not on the surface, I still don't see him in a positive light. But keeping up appearances is important. After finishing that call, I turned on my television. I could see an intriguing headline. Government releases an official statement on the bridge incident. It seems I caught something interesting on the news.